on the record outside the hearing of the jury. Uh, Mr. Nelson, you wish to make a record? Uh, yes, I'll have you up there. Uh, yes, Your Honor, just very briefly uh, for purposes of um, it's my understanding that the state is intending to start calling its medical experts this morning. Um, a lot of the, all of the experts ultimately rely on some degree on Dr. Baker's uh, autopsy and his findings and that information. I don't have a problem calling Mr. Baker or Dr. Baker out of order uh, for purposes of foundation. However, uh, I just wanted to make sure that the record reflects that the state does intend to call Dr. Baker. And so in other words, your lack of objection to any foundation is based on the state's representation that they will call Dr. Baker? Correct, Your Honor. Is that correct, Mr. Blackwell? The state is going to call Dr. Baker? Yes, Your Honor. We intend to do so tomorrow. All right. Thank you. All right. Anything else for the record before we bring back the jury? All right. Can we get my computer and we'll, we'll get the jury? Good morning, everybody. Mr. Blackwell. Good morning, Your Honor, Council, morning. ladies and gentlemen. We'll call our first witness this morning, Dr. Martin Tobin. Swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth and nothing but the truth. I do. And doctor, if you, if you wouldn't mind uh, removing your mask for your testimony. Yep. And also to make sure the microphone is properly placed, we're going to have you state your full name spelling each of your names. Martin Tobin, M-A-R-T-I-N-T-O-B-I-N. Mr. Blackwell. Good morning, Dr. Tobin. Good morning, Mr. Blackwell. Would you uh, tell us what's your current employment? I am a physician in pulmonary and critical care medicine. And whereabouts? In Chicago at Heinz VA Hospital and Loyola University Medical School. And is Heinz VA Hospital a large facility? It used to be the largest VA hospital in the country. I think it's now being superseded by one or two others. And you specialize in pulmonology? I specialize in pulmonology and in critical care medicine. Would you tell the jury what pulmonology is? Pulmonology is the study of the lungs. It deals with all diseases that affect the respiratory system. 
So the lungs, the chest wall. So what are the various elements, components of the respiratory system other than the lungs and chest wall? I mean, the respiratory system begins at the nose and the mouth. It goes down through the back of the throat, down through the windpipe, out through the bronchial tubes, and then down at the bottom, down to the alveolar air sacs. These are the small grape-like structures at the bottom where all the gas exchange takes place, where oxygen gets in and carbon dioxide is removed. So this is the system for getting oxygen into the body? Correct. That is the prime purpose for to get oxygen in. Now at Heinz Hospital, do you uh, work in the intensive care unit? Yes, I work in the medical intensive care unit. And that's considered critical care? Same as critical care. The, these words all have the same meaning. Uh, is critical care different from emergency medicine? Yes, it's very different than emergency medicine. Emergency medicine is kind of the front door of the hospital. That is a triage area where you separate out where people need to go, whereas the critical care is where you take the very, very sickest people. What kind of patients do you see in the ICU? In the ICU, probably... More than half of them are patients who are requiring mechanical ventilation, so they're on a respirator to help them with their breathing. Then another substantial number will not be on a respirator, but their primary problems relates to their lungs, so that might make up 70% or so. And then the remaining patients will have drug overdoses, alcohol withdrawal, diabetic coma, sepsis, things like that. Do you only see the patients in need of respiratory care? No. Once they come into the ICU, they're our patients. I, I'm the primary care physician for everybody who comes into the ICU. And how long have you been a physician, sir? I've been a physician for three months short of 46 years, so over 45 years. And where did you go to school? I went to medical school in Dublin, Ireland, and I took my degree there. Not that anybody noticed the accent, but, uh, <laughs> but are you from Dublin? No, I'm not from Dublin. I'm from a small village called Freshford in County Kilkenny in rural Ireland. What uh, degrees do you hold? I'm sorry? What degrees? The degree I hold is the MB degree, which is the Irish equivalent of the American MD. And then subsequently I got an MD through research. Are you currently licensed? Yes, I'm licensed in the state of Illinois. In the past, I was licensed in Ireland and England and a number of U.S. states, but I've let them all lapse because the only place I'm practicing is in Illinois. Are you board certified? Yes, I'm board certified in internal medicine, pulmonary medicine, and critical care medicine. So you still are actively caring for patients? Yes, I was taking care of patients in the ICU last week, and on Monday, I go straight back into the ICU again. How long have you held uh, positions at Loyola University School of Medicine? I've been at Loyola and Heinz for 32 years, almost. B before going to Lo Loyola, uh, were you practicing medicine somewhere else? Yep, I spent seven years at the University of Texas at Houston, did you also set up a sleep clinic in Houston? Yes, I did. Um, that would have been in the early 80s, so I set up one of the very first sleep labs in the United States uh, for evaluating patients with obstructive sleep apnea. So how do sleep disorders fit within your expertise? Because this is related again to breathing and the problems with sleep, particularly people who snore, and the people who snore during the night time, they occlude their upper airway and they can totally stop breathing 500, 600 times a night. And during that time, the level of oxygen in their blood will go very low. And the basic problem in sleep apnea is because 
the soft palate. I mean, if you the roof of your mouth is your ha hard palate, and then just if you look in the mirror, it's that little piece that's hanging down at the back, and that's your soft palate and uvula, and that jams in against the back of your throat, and it gets occluded 500 times a night in somebody who has sleep apnea. And, and, and does that kind of research or science or medicine relate to your work in this case? Yes, it's extremely pertinent to the case of Mr. Floyd because obviously in sleep apnea the problem is at the back of the throat and as we will see in Mr. Floyd the central problem of where the obstruction is occurring is in the hypopharynx which is again at the back of the throat so it's very it has an awful lot of overlap to patients with sleep apnea. We'll come back to the hypopharynx in a little bit. Um, are you also engaged in medical research? I'm sorry? Are you also engaged in medical research? I'm in, yes, I do, I've been doing medical research since the early 80s, since about 1981. Mm -hmm. uh, what kind of research have you been doing? All of my research is related basically to breathing. So it is kind of looking at breathing in patients with lung disease, people who have lung disease who walk in the door to the clinic, and also patients who are in the ICU, and particularly patients who are requiring mechanical ventilation. But then I do a lot of research that has absolutely nothing to do with clinical medicine, just to know how people breathe. Have you authored a textbook on the subject of ventilation? Yes, I've authored a, a large textbook on mechanical ventilation that's called the Principles and Practice of Mechanical Ventilation. So am I showing the cover of your textbook here uh, on the camera? Is this, the, is this the book you're referring to? That is correct. Uh, 1,500 pages? Correct, 1,500 pages, yeah. Are you familiar with the Lancet L-A-N-C-E-T, Medical yeah. Journal? Yes, the Lancet is one of the top medical journals in the world. And uh, does the Lancet Medical Journal refer to this book as the Bible on Mechanical Ventilation? Yes, it has called it that. Uh, have you authored other books also? Yes, I am. Uh, roughly how many? I think I've published eight or nine other books. And uh, all related to respiration or respiratory failure? Correct. They're all on different aspects of the lungs. Uh, have you published articles and abstracts also? Yes, I have. Approximately how many of those? I, I, I lose count, but I think I've published more than 750 probably or something like that. Have you pub published in the New England Journal of Medicine? Yes, I've published several articles in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, the Journal of the American Medical Association? Yes, likewise. Are those two of the most respected medical journals in the world? They are for clinical work, yes. Have you also held editor positions at medical journals? Yes, I was editor-in-chief of the journal called the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine. So that's the premier journal in the world for all lung disease. It's also the premier journal in the world for intensive care medicine and it's the official journal of the American Thoracic Society. Have you taught and uh, lectured outside of Illinois and or Texas? Yes. Um, generally where? I've lectured all, all around the world. I mean, I've lectured in more than 30 different countries around the world, and probably the vast majority of states within the United States. Well, Minnesota is one of the states in the United States. How about Minnesota? I've lectured in Minnesota. I've been in the uh, Mayo Clinic several times as a lecturer. Uh, were you given an award from the Mayo Clinic? Yes, I was given an award called the Balfour Lecture in the Mayo Clinic, and they give it out to one doctor every 10 years. And they, it's only to one doctor. It doesn't matter what specialty. So it could be around neurosurgery, gynecology, whatever. They just pick one person every 10 years. And was it for anything in particular that you were recognized by the Mayo Clinic? No, just for my work in clinical, as a researcher in clinical medicine. 
Have you also uh, published in basic science journals, such as the Journal of Applied Physiology? Yes, I published a, a lot of work on basic science that wouldn't necessarily be directly related to medicine in the Journal of Applied Physiology. The, the jurors may not be familiar with what physiology is as a science. Could you generally explain it? Yep. I mean, physiology is basically how the body works. You want to know the science of how it works. You want a deeper understanding of what are really the mechanisms that make the body does what it does. Uh, within the field of physiology, is there a particular focus or interest you have? I'm primarily interested in breathing in the bigger area. And so with breathing, that would mean how the brain regulates your breathing, how the brain sends signals down to the muscles that control your breathing, your diaphragm, your rib cage, and then how you expand your chest and how you overcome forces within your chest, like resistance within your chest and all the rest of it, to get air moving in and out of your lungs, and then the particular forces that you generate in terms of the pressures within your chest that will enable breathing to occur with the ultimate purpose of getting oxygen in and getting rid of carbon dioxide. And do you consider this a part of the study of medicine? It's not quite as part of the study of medicine. It's really quite separate because it's more the basic physiology. So it's more in the realm of math and physics. But then it's applied over because to be a good doctor, you need to have a good knowledge of science, but the science part is really separate from the medical part, and it's to try and cone down on the science as best as possible. How long have you been working in respiratory physiology? Since 1981, so 40 years. And, and what exactly drew you to the physiology of breathing? I mean, because I was Going into pulmonary, at that stage I knew as already directed, I had spent five years doing lung disease, and I just wanted to really know how you breathe, and I wanted to come up with new knowledge, because everybody thought everybody knew everything of how to breathe, and I thought it would be fun to find a lot of new stuff. So doctor, do you know of uh, others kind of in your field who have been studying uh, respiratory physiology for 46 years? No, I mean, I know an awful lot of them along the way, but uh, I mean, I would know no more than a handful or less of people who are still doing physiology at, at the patient's bedside no. after 46 years. So, Doctor, let's uh, change subject and talk a little bit about your uh, experience of work as uh, serving as an expert. Uh, have you served as an expert witness before? Yes, I have. Uh, what types of cases? Practically all of them have been in medical malpractice, so I've done it for both the plaintiff, for the patient side, and I've done it for the defense, for the physician side. Uh, have you ever been involved in a criminal case before? No, I have never been involved in a criminal case. Have you testified in court before? I've testified in court. I don't keep track of the numbers, but I suspect I've been in court about 50 times. Would you tell the ladies and gentlemen uh, if you're getting paid for your time in this case? No, I am not getting paid. And why is that? Well, when I was asked uh, to do the case, uh, I thought I might have some knowledge that would be helpful to explain how Mr. Floyd died. and. Uh, since I'd never done this type of work in this nature before, I decided I didn't wish to be paid for it. So did you volunteer to the state of Minnesota, or did the state of Minnesota call you? The state of Minnesota contacted me. Uh, what were you asked to do, Dr. Tobin? I was asked uh, to review the medical records related to the case. These were medical records from Henneman County. Then there were a number of interviews of people that were interviewed. I was given a long list of these. And primarily it was related to looking at a large number of different videos. But of course then the big part was that I needed to read on the scientific background of all the various aspects related to it. So let's talk about your uh, opinions uh, with respect to this case. 
have you formed an opinion to a reasonable degree of medical certainty on the cause of Mr. Floyd's death? Yes, I have. Uh, would you please tell the jury what that opinion or opinions are? Yes, yes. Uh, Mr. Floyd died from a low level of oxygen and this caused damage to his brain that we see and it also caused uh, a PEA arrhythmia that caused his heart to stop. And by uh, PEA, you mean pulseless electrical activity? Correct. It's a particular form of an abnormal beat of the heart, or an arrhythmia, and a particular form of it. Is this what uh, some persons might refer to as asphyxia? Yes, it has been called asphyxia. To me, it, it's not terribly helpful. It just what we're really talking about is a low level of oxygen. Other people talk about hypoxia. That again is just a Latin term meaning a low level of oxygen. So all of this is just re really other words for a phenomenon that is a low level of oxygen. Have you formed an opinion to a reasonable degree of medical certainty as to what the cause is uh, or was for the low level of oxygen in Mr. Floyd? Yes, I have. Would you tell us what that is? The cause of the low level of oxygen was shallow breathing, small breaths, small tidal volumes, shallow breaths that weren't able to carry the air through his lungs down to the essential areas of the lungs that get oxygen into the blood and get rid of the carbon dioxide. That's the alveoli at the bottom of the lung. Dr. Tobin, uh, would, uh, using a short video uh, that you prepared to help you explain to the jurors how oxygen gets into the lungs and the body, how we take in oxygen. Yep. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, what's been marked as Exhibit uh, 950. Can, can you describe first uh, what that is? So here we're looking at the lungs inside a body and we see here that you can see the windpipe up at the top, the trachea, and then that splits into the bronchial tubes. And also you can see the diaphragm down at the bottom. And when okay. the diaphragm contracts, it so, will, so there the will be air moving. The, the jurors can't see it yet, so I'm just having just that. Oh, I'm sorry, terribly sorry. <laughs> I apologize. Yeah, I'm gonna offer it, Your Honor. Right. Uh, exhibit 950. 950 is received. Please proceed. We can uh, we'll display it so the jurors can uh, see it. Okay, so now we're looking, and you can see the contraction of the diaphragm. That's the kind of pink area down at the bottom. We see air going down through the windpipe and then proceeding down to the bronchial tubes. And then it was going to continue down the bronchial tubes until it will reach out to the air sacs which will be the alveoli. And now we're seeing that we're moving down here. And these are like the grape-like structures down at the bottom. And this is where all the action occurs. The oxygen goes across those air sacs and also the CO2 goes across them. Then it, it's expelled back out. So that's everything in a very rapid video. So then what, what do you... What happened in the case of Mr. Floyd that relates to the shallow breathing that resulted in his low oxygen? So there are a number of forces that led to that his, the size of his breath became so small. And so there are a series of forces higher up that are leading to that. And the main forces that are going to lead to the shallow breath are going to be that he's turned prone on the street that he has the handcuffs in place combined with the street, and then that he has a knee on his neck, and then that he has a knee on his back and on his side. All of these four forces are ultimately going to result in the low tidal volume, which gives you the shallow breaths that we saw here. And so the air will not be able to reach those air sacs we just saw in the video where the oxygen is exchanged and the carbon dioxide is removed. Uh, doctor, is there a concept uh, that in the respiratory medicine field known as dead space? Yes, there is. Uh, how does that relate to uh, Mr. Floyd? So if, if you think of the video back all the way until you saw those clusters of grapes, 
where you saw the blood vessels surrounding the alveoli. Everything up to there is dead space. So as you're breathing in, you're breathing in through your nose, your mouth goes down through your windpipe, down through the bronchial tubes, radiating out until it reaches the air sacs. Up to you get to the air sacs, it's all dead space because the reason we call it is because no oxygen can get across those bronchial tubes. No carbon dioxide can get across it. The oxygen and the carbon dioxide, the only place that that gets across is those little grape-like structures. So everything in the lungs before that is dead space. So you mentioned uh, several reasons for uh, Mr. Floyd's low oxygen, and I just want to capture those for the jury, and then we'll talk about them. Uh, you mentioned one, handcuffs and the street. Right? Correct. Uh, you mentioned uh, knee on the neck. Yep. Sorry for my writing. You'll know what I didn't get an A in in school. Um, the prone position. Yep. And then the knee on the back, uh, arm inside. Were those the four? Yep, these are the four. Okay. So we want to talk about uh, each of these, but before we do that, uh, might it be helpful uh, for explaining your testimony to the jury for, for them to see the relative positioning of the various officers on Mr. Floyd's body when he was subdued on the ground? Yes, I think that would be very helpful. Did you assist in preparing an illustration to show the relative position of the officers on the ground. Yes, I did. And uh, let me show you uh, what's been marked uh, as Exhibit 949. Could you just tell us, just to right. describe generally for the record right, I mean, what it is? I mean, I watched the videos and certain segments of the videos hundreds of times and it's very difficult to kind of get an overall view of where everybody is positioned because you're seeing different videos from different angles and so the artist has taken all the different videos here and he's combined them into one moment in time and you can see here and also he will remove the police vehicle so you're going to get a better view so you're looking kind of at a bird's eye view of where Mr. Floyd is lying and where the officers are positioned in relationship uh, to Mr. Floyd. Right. So the, the, the purpose of this is, is to show the relative positions of the officers on the Correct. Uh, Your Honor, we would offer Exhibit 949. Any objection? No, Your Honor. 949 is received. So what, uh, what point in time, if you say, told us that this is at a particular point in time? Right, it is a particular point in time. I don't remember the exact minute second at the top of my head, but it is like... Does 821 and 44 seconds? That's exactly <laughs> correct. Right? Yes. Uh, Okay, so let, let's walk through Exhibit 949, uh, Brad, if you could advance. And doctor, tell us what we're seeing. Okay, yep. Now you can see the car is being rotated. You're able to see uh, Officer Chauvin. You're able to see Officer King and then Officer Lane down at his feet. You see underneath Mr. Floyd and now the car has been rotated. Now the car has been removed. And so you're able to see how they're positioned at different points uh, in terms of with Officer Shaven with his left knee on the neck, his right knee on uh, Mr. Floyd's arm and chest. And then you can see here Officer Lane holding his legs and then you can see Officer King with his knee uh, on his torso. 
So this represents a snapshot in time, as you told us. Uh, did the officers' positions uh, change over time as they were there on the ground? Yes, they, the officers' positions changed over time, and also the position of Mr. Floyd himself changed over time, and these become relevant in how we evaluate everything. And, and was it something you factored into your analysis then? Yes. Did you consider where Mr. Chauvin's left knee was during the encounter? Yes, um, for Officer Chauvin's left knee is virtually on the neck for the vast majority of the time. And, uh, and when you say vast majority, are you able to be it, more It's more than 90% of the time in my calculations. There are certain times where it becomes difficult because you don't get a good view of where it is. So for example, I know that an Officer Chauvin's right knee is on his back 57% of the time. The reason I'm not able to say for the 43% is that I don't get a good view. I can other times don't have a good view of exactly where it is. So did you focus on the first five minutes and few seconds? Yes, I focused on the fi first five minutes, three seconds, because that is up to the time uh, that we see evidence of brain injury. So if uh, Mr. Chauvin's right knee was on his back from time to time, uh, at other times it was placed where in your observation? In, it was placed on his arm or and then rammed in to Mr. Floyd's left chest. So really whether you're making a distinction of whether the knee is on the chest per se or whether it's on the left arm and rammed in against the left chest. From the point of view of breathing, the effects are extremely similar. So let's, uh, let's turn to uh, the, the number one on the, the oh yes, I, there, on the dot cam. Um, so I wanted to, to turn back to the notes that the number one here that uh, written down for uh, the reasons you told us for Floyd's low oxygen, Mr. Floyd's low oxygen, handcuffs and the street to talk about the first yep. one. Um, could you first, uh, Dr. Tobin, uh, tell us uh, how these various mechanisms, the, the four that, that you've discussed, handcuffs in the street, knee on the neck, prone position, knee on the neck, back, um, knee on the back, arm and side. How do those mechanisms fall into your work of either respiratory physiology or clinical medicine? They don't have an awful lot to do with clinical medicine, but they are directly related to my work in physiology. So in understanding the forces that the body has to cope with. These become, these are crucial in terms of the various forces that are involved in physiology. So then turning to the, the first one in handcuffs uh, and the street, uh, the very first one, uh, what is the effect of the handcuffs in the context of what happened to Mr. Floyd? The handcuffs are extremely important in Mr. Floyd, but the handcuffs on their own, just handcuffs per se, are not that important, it must be the handcuffs combined with the street. And it's because of the positioning of the handcuffs at the back, then how he's manipulated with the handcuffs by both Officer Chauvin and by Officer King, how they manipulate the handcuffs. And they're pushing the handcuffs into his back and pushing them high. Then on the other side, you have the street. So the street is playing a crucial part because he's against a hard asphalt street. So the way they're pushing down on his handcuffs combined with the street, his left side, and it's particularly the left side we see that, it's like the left side is in a vice. It's totally being pushed in, squeezed in from each side, from the street at the bottom, and then from the, uh, the way that the handcuffs are manipulated. It's not just the handcuffs. It's how the handcuffs are being held, how they're being pushed, where they're being pushed, that uh, totally interfere with 
central features of how we breathe. So uh, Mr. Floyd then is, is pancake between the pavement underneath them and then force on top of them. Precisely. Now, could you help us to explain how this mechanism, uh, the, the handcuffs and the street, how does that explain the shallow breathing that you've described? Yeah. So this gets back to how we breathe. And this is fairly simple. So the way we breathe, we have two big muscles that help us with breathing. We have the diaphragm and we have the ribcage muscles. The diaphragm does about 70% of what we need for breathing and about 30% of it comes from the ribcage. And there's, when the diaphragm contracts or the ribcage contract, they expand the chest. And when you expand the chest, then air flows in from outside and it's coming in. And that's all that happens on inspiration. But to expand the chest, there's two crucial actions that have to happen. And we've referred to th these by the terms pump handle and bucket handle. So if bucket handle is simple. So if you have a regular bucket that you carry water with and you lift up the handle of the bucket, the handle comes up like this. And so when you contract your diaphragm, you are performing a bucket handle movement of your on the rib cage. So you contract your diaphragm like that, and each time as you inspire, you can see it yourself as you inspire each of you there in the jury. You inspire, you see that your rib cage is going outwards like that. That's a bucket handle movement. The second movement that you have is called the pump handle. And this reflects to an old water pump that would be in the yard for uh, pumping out water. And so you have the handle at the top of the pump. And you lift up the handle of the pump each time. And the water comes out the spout at the bottom. So you're filling up, uh, get your container of water. So with that action, you're lifting up here. This refers to the front to back movement of the chest wall. So with the pump handle, your chest goes out with each breath. And so you can do it yourself. As you take a deep breath, you can feel that front to back, you're expanding your chest. The front to back expansion of your chest is with your pump handle. The si at the same time, you're doing both of them at the same time. At the same time you're doing that, your chest is expanding from side to side, and that's with your bucket handle. So both of these are occurring, and these are vital. Without these, you can't breathe. If you don't have the bucket handle working and the pump handle working, there's nothing happening. There's no air going to get in there. So, Doctor, do you have a, a, a photograph uh, that you brought that would help uh, to better understand the pump handle and bucket handle? Yes. Uh, let me show you what's been marked as States Exhibit uh, 951. Uh, do you recognize what this photograph depicts? Yes. Uh, is it an, an accurate portrayal of, of a certain uh, incident, disaster? Yes. yes. Uh, would it help to explain the testimony? Yes. So th this is an event that happened in, in England. Dr. Sorry, Toby, I I, just sorry, one moment. I apologize. I apologize. Yeah, I need to offer sooner, Your Honor. Uh, we, we, we offer Exhibit 951. Any objection? Uh, yeah, I have an objection to this. You're going to come in sidebar. All right. Sidebar.
Projection is sustained. Doctor, in this case, were you able to observe whether Mr. Floyd's breathing was impacted by the handcuffs and the placement on the street? Yes, I was. Uh, what did you observe, Dr. Tobin? What, what I observed is particularly is in terms of the hands of the police and the handcuffs, particularly on the left side. So they were forcing his left wrist up into his chest, forcing it in tight against his chest, forcing it high up. And you have to keep in mind that the opposite side of this is the street. So he was being squashed between the two sides. And so this meant that he couldn't exert his pump handle because, I mean, the street totally blocked his pump handle. There was no way he could do any front to back movement. And again, the way they were pressing in on the back, there was absolutely no way that he could do any front to back movement. Then in addition, because of the knee that was rammed in against the, the left side of his chest, sometimes the knee was down on the arm or in against the chest. So this would have the same effect. So basically, on the left side of his lung, it was almost like a surgical pneumonectomy. It was almost to the effect as if a surgeon had gone in and removed the lung. Not quite, but along those lines. So there was virtually very little opportunity for him to be able to get any air to move into the left side of his chest. Have so he was going to be totally dependent on what he'd be able to do with the right side. Have you selected any uh, footage uh, from the body-worn cameras that you feel depicts Mr. Floyd's struggles to breathe? Yes. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, what's been marked as State's Exhibit 944. And first, would you describe what it is? What, what you're seeing here is the on the... Dr. Tobin, the jurors aren't seeing it yet. It's just describing oh, I'm sorry. It for the record. It's just for foundation on what it is. The, they will not see this. I'm describing what I'm seeing. For now, yes. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Uh, it, what I'm seeing is that his left hand is being grabbed by the police officers. So that's a handcuffed left hand, and it's being pushed into his chest. So he's just not able to expand that. In addition, you'll, what I'm seeing... Only I'm sorry. Was the foundation. Oh, I'm, I oh, apologize. I apologize. Yes, I didn't. So let's let's hold off and uh, turn it okay, back. Okay, I'm sorry. And My misunderstanding. Your Honor, we'll, we'll offer State's Exhibit 944. Any objection? 944 is received. All right. Now, Dr. Tobin, the jurors can see it. Okay. So I, you, I apologize. No, no, it was uh, quite all right. Would you tell us uh, what's yeah. the significance? So, the, I mean, now you're able to see here with the yellow arrow, you're able to see that the officer is holding Mr. Floyd's left hand. He's holding it very firmly. There's a very firm grasp on it. And then Mr. Floyd's left hand is being pushed in against his chest. Also, we're able to see just on the side that Officer Chauvin's uh, knee is coming in and that's compressing in against his side as well. So the ability to expand his left chest uh, left side here is enormously impaired and also you're seeing that the size of the chain between the two the right side and the left side is very short so he his whole left arm is also being pulled over and so it's preventing him also from expanding the right side I've been focusing on the bucket handle and the pump handle on the left but you can also see here that these are impaired, his ability to expand his chest. And of course, the key factor you must keep that isn't kind of, in a sense, seen here in one sense, is the street. The street is what is having a huge effect because he's jammed down against the street. And so the street is playing a major role in preventing him from expanding his chest. Thank you. If you could clear the screen, Your Honor. Dr. Ruse's if you need to use to draw on the screen. Thank you. 
Now, did you select another uh, still image uh, that you observed as Mr. Floyd struggled uh, to breathe? Yes. I'm going to show you what's marked as State's Exhibit 942. And if you could just identify it. I identify it. Just lay down foundation if you wish. Thank you, Your Honor. So do you, you recognize this as the still image that you selected? Yes, I do. Uh, Your Honor, we offer State's Exhibit 942. Any objection? No objection. 942 is received. Could you tell us, uh, Dr. Tobin, what's the, the significance of this image, of what we see here? What you're seeing is slightly different than the two images, but they marry together. If you look on the left side, you see his finger is pushing against his street, the street. You also see the hands here of the officers around his left hand. You can see the left handcuffed arm. As we discussed, you're seeing a more clear view here, how it's been really rammed into the back of his back. There's just no way he's going to be able to expand that. But with this, the left image, you see the finger on the street. Then over on the right image, you see his knuckle against the tire. And to most people, this doesn't look terribly significant. But to a physiologist, this is extraordinarily significant. Because this tells you that he has used up his resources and he is now literally trying to breathe with his fingers and knuckles. Because when you begin to breathe, you begin to breathe with your rib cage and your diaphragm. The next thing you recruit after that is your sternomastoid muscle, which is the big muscle in your neck. And then when those are wasted up, then you're re relying on these types of muscles, like your fingers, to try and stabilize your whole right side, because he's totally dependent on getting air into the right side. So he's using his fingers and his knuckles against the street to try and crank up the right side of his chest. This is his only way to try and get air to get into the right lung. You know, Doctor, showing you uh, what's been marked as State's Exhibit 938, uh, is this a related uh, series of uh, photographs and images? Yes. Your Honor, we offer State's Exhibit 938. Any uh, objection? No. 938 is received. So, Doctor, tell us what we see here in, a, in Exhibit 938. The focus with the, I mean, the top panel is the same as the bottom one. The bottom is just a blow up of what you're seeing on the top. And the focus on the left hand side is his shoulder. And again, as I mentioned, when you have difficulty in breathing, you begin with the diaphragm, the rib cage, you go on to the accessory muscles like the sternomastoid. One of the very last muscles that you will use is your shoulder. You don't really use your shoulder for breathing. But if you look here on the left hand side, the shoulder is extremely prominent. So this would be what like people in a gym would call sculpting of the uh, shoulder muscles. And you're seeing them standing out very prominently. So at this point on the left hand side, he's taking a breath in, using his shoulder to try and get a breath in. And then on the right side, you see between a breath where he's relaxing, he's not, he's breathing out. And it's the two of them are shown, so as you see the, the marked effect on the left. But again, you have to realize that the shoulder is a very ineffective way of breathing. Because at that stage, the chest is all so expanded. So when you contract your shoulder, because the chest underlying it is so expanded, you get very, very little air in. It's a very poor way of breathing, but it's what you have to do when everything else is failing. When you're in extremis, you will call on the use of the shoulder to try and breathe. So Dr. Tobin, have we uh, covered the first item, the that is handcuffs on the street? Yes. So let's talk about uh, number two, uh, the knee on the neck. 
Explain why the knee on the neck is so significant. The knee on the neck is extremely important because it's going to occlude the air getting in through the passageway. So is it possible, doctor, to perhaps even demonstrate with uh, an anatomy lesson um, yes, so that may be relevant? To understand the knee on the neck, you need to examine your own necks, all of you here in the jury, like I'm doing now. And so, I mean, the first thing is, if you put your index and thumb up here at the top of your neck, the first big thing you're going to find is your Adam's apple. And you can find the Adam's apple, and it's a very sturdy structure because it's surrounded by cartilage and it protects the voice box, the larynx, which is essential to, uh, for speech. And so any amount of compression on the Adam's apple is not going to compress it. This is an extremely strong, sturdy st structure. It's not going to be compressed by a knee on the neck. Then you go down from your Adam's apple and you feel the little bumps beneath that. And these are the uh, rings of cartilage of your trachea or your trachea. So this is your windpipe here. And so that's again because of the cartilage there, a knee on the front of that part is not going to cause compression. Okay? But then bring your finger up to the top of your Adam's apple. And up at the top of your Adam's apple, you're now directly over the hypopharynx. And the hypopharynx is the crucial area in Mr. Floyd. So this here is where the hypopharynx is located on your surface anatomy. So why is the hypopharynx uh, important for understanding this case, what happened? The hypopharynx is very important for understanding this case for a number of reasons because it's so vulnerable because it has no cartilage around it. It's going to be an area that is compressed. It's extremely small to breathe through, and it becomes very important for being able to continue to breathe through. Doctor, I want to show you uh, what's been marked as States Exhibit 935 and 937. Could you identify, just for the record, tell us what, what's depicted? Yes, I, I'm looking at 937, which is the hypopharynx. And then 935, there we go. And 935, which I'm looking at 935, which is the hypopharynx with a coin. And uh, do uh, these two uh, images fairly and accurately depict the hypopharynx? They do. Uh, Your Honor, I offer States Exhibit 935 and 937. 935 and 937 are received. Uh, we can show them to the jury. So, Doctor, using uh, Exhibits 937 and 935, uh, could you help us to better understand what the hy hypopharynx is and what it does? Right. So, uh, what you're looking at here, I don't know if this works. Yeah, it does. So here at where I've drawn in red is the top of your tongue. Okay, and that's the tongue there. And then above it is an empty space. And then above that is the top of the hard palate. So that orients you there. And so then the tongue comes down along here. And the critical structure in this case, because the act of speech in Mr. Floyd becomes very important, how he was able to speak and all these different things. So the structure that gives a speech are the vocal cords right here. And they're in the voice box and in the larynx. And then we have a little area here called the epiglottis. It's a little sliver. And that comes back to prevent food going the wrong way when we're swallowing. Because we use the hypopharynx both for swallowing, for eating, and we use the hypopharynx for breathing. So when we're breathing, the air is going to come in through your nose or your mouth, go on down through the hypopharynx, then through the vocal cords and into the windpipe, into the trachea, and go on down into the lungs. Whereas when you're swallowing, that trap door of the epiglottis will, fall back, will prevent the food going into the air passages and will direct it into the uh, food tube at the back, the esophagus. 
the area of the hypopharynx then is exactly from the base of the epiglottis, the first yellow arrow, down to the second yellow arrow, which is the, the larynx. And it's just that little area that is the size of the hypopharynx. Could we see 935, uh, breath? And so this, the, we know that the cross-sectional area of the hypopharynx in adult people I have it here in the millimeters 199 to 303, which are obviously difficult to remember, those type of millimeters. But in fact, right in the middle of this would be the size of a dime. So a dime is basically the size of what the hypopharynx, and it tells you how small and how vulnerable is this area. So if it's going to be decreased in size, it's a very tiny area. And so why is the hypopharynx important in the case of Mr. Floyd? Because the hypopharynx is going to be the area that will be vulnerable to occlusion from the knee on the neck, but in addition the hypopharynx has another aspect and that is the hypopharynx is also controlled by the size of your lungs. As your lungs expand you increase the size of the hypopharynx with every breath. And so there's a regulation of that that's going on. Was Mr. Chauvin applying force or pressure to the hypopharynx of Mr. Floyd that you observed? At different times. It varied from time to time. Now, are you able to tell us uh, if Mr. Chauvin had put his weight um, directly, his full weight on Mr. Floyd's uh, neck, uh, are you able to tell us what impact or effect that would have had on Mr. Floyd? Right. If uh, Mr. Officer uh, Chauvin had placed his knee directly on the hypopharynx, just that area of the dime, and it never varied from there, and it kind of came in like a bullseye on that particular area, then you would expect that this area would become totally occluded. But it did, I mean, he varied the position. Mr. Floyd varied the position of his head, and Officer Chauvin also varied the uh, position of his knee, so it varied over time. And if it had, if it had become totally occluded, then what? If it had become totally occluded, within seconds you were going to drop the level of oxygen to a level that will be uh, produce uh, oxygen deprivation in the body, resulting in either a seizure or a, a heart attack one or the other. Do you have another photograph taken from footage uh, at the scene that would help the jury understand this point? Yes. I'm going to show you what's marked as States Exhibit 941. And this is uh, derived from uh, Exhibit 15 already in evidence. Uh, do you recognize this uh, this photograph in uh, 941? Yes, I do. Uh, your Honor, we offer states as given 941. Any objection? 941 is received. Now, Dr. Tobin, uh, tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury uh, what it is you mean to convey uh, here in Exhibit 941. So if you're looking, say, on the one at the left, and if you look at me first before you look at that, so if you stick your finger in your ear and you draw a line from your the finger of your ear going down through the vertebral bodies in your spinal column. You can get a line going down and you're looking at that axis. And that's what I've drawn in here with the yellow dotted line. And so if you look here on the first slide, you see that Mr. Floyd's nose, his face, is directly face down on the street. It's not at any angle. So the next thing is, again, don't look at, this, at the slide. Feel yourself on your own neck. And now, if you put your hand at the back of your neck, and you, put at the, you feel the bottom of your skull, yeah. uh, and so where the skull, the bone of the skull ends, and then you come down from that, and you'll find, and you put your whole palm of your hand around it. Sorry?
Members of the jury, uh, the witnesses ask you to do certain things. These are not required. Uh, you may do them, and he should phrase it more in terms of if you were to do that. And if you wish to do it, that is your choice. You are not required to do anything that the witness instructs you to do, but feel free to do it if you wish. Mr. Blackwell. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Dr. Tobin, if we could uh, go back to where you're explaining the, the anatomy in the back of the base of the skull. Yep. So as I'm putting my hand here at the back of my neck and I'm feeling the tip of my skull and then I'm bringing down my hand, I'm feeling an extremely thick ligament and that's called the nuchal ligament. And it's almost if you, as I put the full palm of my hand on my nuchal ligament, it's almost like wood. It's a, so strong a ligament. And that ligament is what you're seeing. The knee is being placed over on the left-hand slide. And so with a knee directly over the nuchal ligament, it can cause no obstruction because this is such a dense ligament. And that's what you're seeing. And you're seeing as well with the yellow triangle, or sorry, the yellow diagonal here, that the bulk of Officer Chauvin's knee is above that yellow line. The second thing, separate from this, on this slide, you can see that Mr. Floyd has his face rammed in to the street because he's using his face here to try, as to try and crank up his chest. He's actually using his forehead and his nose and his chin as a way of trying to help him get air into the right side of his chest as another way to crank up his chest. And, and how do you contrast that to what we see uh, in the photograph on the right in Exhibit then, 941? On the right hand side you can see now the orientation of uh, Mr. Floyd has changed and also you can see the position of Officer Chauvin's knee has changed because it's come down below the yellow diagonal and in this position there's going to be far greater compression of the hypopharynx in this re region here compared with what you were seeing on the left side. On the left side there's no compression of the hypopharynx but on the right side and if you watch the videos over time you will see that there is a variation over time as to wh where exactly is the location of Mr. Floyd's uh, head and where is the location of Officer Chauvin's knee. And in the photograph on the, the right, uh, the, the knee is exerting, uh, Dr. Tobin, greater force on the hypopharynx? Correct. Uh, is it possible to calculate the amount of force? Yes, it is. So uh, we, we can calculate the amount of force based on the weight of Officer Chauvin on his body weight taking into account how much gear weight, the gear that he carries and then also you have to remove out the weight of his shin bone and his boot and so subtracting out all of these and then you can calculate the weight. Can you also calculate the changes or narrowing in the uh, space that people uh, have to breathe through? Yes you can separately. Would this be in any way akin to uh, breathing through a small opening like a straw? Yes, it would. So, I mean, when you have to breathe through a narrow passageway, it's like uh, breathing through a drinking straw. But it's much worse than that because breathing through a drinking straw, I mean, is somewhat unpleasant but not that unpleasant. And then it gets much worse than that. So as the space narrows, uh, is it more difficult than to breathe through? Enormously more difficult, and we know that from physics. And, and through physics, then, is that something that can also be calculated? Yes, that can also be calculated. And that type of a calculation, uh, would it be specific, per se, to George Floyd? No, it wouldn't. This would be for anybody. For We know in terms of what happens physiologically when you have this level of narrowing, this is going to happen to everybody. Can, can you please explain to the jury uh, what those calculations would show about the effect of the narrowing uh, on the airway on breathing? Right, yes. I, I believe there's an exhibit that relates to that. Uh, let me then show you what's marked as States Exhibit 940 and 939. Uh, 
Yes, sir. Uh, yes, I do offer those. Any objection? Nine thirty nine and nine forty are received. So let's start with exhibit nine forty. Uh, Dr. Tobin, uh, tell us what's uh, depicted here. Describe this for us. Yep. So this is a physiology experiment and what it's looking at is what is the effort to, to breathe that's what's shown along the y-axis of the plot and then it is with different levels of narrowing and so the very bottom one with the white triangles the lowest curve that's normal there is no narrowing and so we see that as the flow varies and shown in red is what would be the normal flow rate in a 46 year old man and we can see what is the work that is done. If you look at the normal one, and then you look at 60% airway narrowing, and this is much more narrow than breathing through a straw. And you can see there's really no bigger increase in the effort to breathe. It's hardly different from what it, in terms of normal. But then if you get 85% narrowing, now you see that the effort to breathe increases seven and a half times compared with what it was with no narrowing. And so you're seeing a huge increase in the work that is required. It becomes far more difficult to breathe as the narrowing becomes more narrow. And doctors, let's look at exhibit 939. So this is the science behind that plot behind before I showed you. And th this is just the equation in physics that tells you how that works. And the key thing when you look at an equation like this, for me as a physiologist, is I focus on the square sign of the stricture that tells me here when there, I see a square sign on top of it and it is below the level on the equation. It is uh, the denominator. I know with that that you're going to be fine all along for a period of time and then suddenly everything is going to increase enormously. You're going to into what we call an exponential increase. And that's exactly what we see on the experiment that was done where we're seeing there's really nothing happening at 60. It's nothing much. But then at 85% it suddenly takes off. And if you had beyond 85% it would be even more and more. And so based on the formula here, you can tell that as you are narrowing and narrowing, the effort to breathe is going to become extraordinarily high and at some stage unsustainable. You're just not going to be able to do it. So in this case, uh, in the case of Mr. Floyd, the narrowing was of his hypopharynx? It was in the hypopharynx, yes. Uh, did the uh, Mr. Chauvin's knee on the neck then cause the narrowing of the hypopharynx? Yes, it did. So, given the uh, the the changes that you observed uh, in Mr. Chauvin's knee on uh, Mr. Floyd uh, over time, were any of those changes significant uh, from the from the standpoint of placing pressure on the hypopharynx? Yes, they are extremely significant. Uh, let's look. Uh, Brant that exhibit 947. And uh, Your Honor, we'd offer, we'd offer exhibit uh, uh, 947, which is uh, taken from, uh, from exhibit 15. Any sure. objection? No. 947 is received. Now tell us what we see here in, nine, in exhibit 947. What you're seeing is the orientation of Officer Chauvin. His body build is quite erect here. 
but in particular what you're seeing is that the toe of his boot is no longer touching the ground. This means that all of his body weight is being directed down at Mr. Floyd's neck. There, because in many of the calculations I excluded the effect of his leg and his shoe because some of it was touching the ground, but here you can see none of it is touching the ground. So he, we're taking half his body weight plus the weight of his, ha half the gear, and all of that is coming directly down on uh, Mr. Floyd's neck. I want to show you what's marked as Exhibit 943. Did you assist in preparing this exhibit? Yes, I did. Uh, would it help you in explaining your testimony? Yes. Uh, Your Honor, we offer Exhibit 943. Any objection? Where? 943 is received. And Your Honor, if, uh, Your Honor could clear the screen. Thank you, John. So, Dr. Tobin, what do we see here in Exhibit 943? What we're seeing is that half of his body weight plus half his gear weight is coming down, that's 91.5 pounds, is coming down directly on Mr. Floyd's neck. Is that all we see? And uh, uh, the reason we're seeing that is because the, the, the toe is off the ground and there is no body weight sitting back. He's not hunkering back on his heels. So everything is directed down on his knee. The, in this place, uh, his shin and his toe and his boot is playing no contribution. And were there times also when Mr. Chauvin's left knee uh, was on the back of Mr. Floyd's neck? Correct. And when was that? When, when his knee is on the back, that's a separate set of forces. It's the same force, but it's compressing a different area. It's compressing inside his chest. And what about the time when Mr. Floyd would have had his face smashed directly into the pavement? When his face is, is into the pavement, at that time, like one of the ones I showed you, if it's coming down on the nuchal ligament, it's going to be a huge weight for Mr. Floyd to try and breathe, but he won't be compressing the hypopharynx at the time when that's happening. It's, so all of these different forces are they're somewhat complex in terms of how they're interacting but they're all coming to the same point. Now you paid particular attention, you told us, to the first five minutes and three seconds of the subduel on the ground. Yes. Uh, how would you characterize Mr. Floyd's oxygen levels during the first five minutes and three minutes that Mr. Chauvin was on top of him? We know that his oxygen levels were enough to keep his brain alive. And the reason we know that is because he continued to speak uh, over that time. We know that he made various vocal sounds for four minutes, 51 seconds from the time that the knee is placed on the neck. And that's telling us partly that he's speaking, but the big thing is it's telling us because you can't speak without a brain being active. And so we know there's oxygen getting to his brain at, for whenever he is making an attempt to speak. And Mr. Blackwell, just any time within the next 10 minutes, if it's a good breaking point, please let the court know. 
Your Honor, this would probably be a good time. All right, for a break. let's take our 20 minute mid morning break.
Just a reminder, doctor, you're still under oath. Okay. Thank you. And I take up from that. Please. You have a seat, huh? You may have. Doctor, turn your attention back to Exhibit 943 and focusing on the restraint on the ground. Yes. Um, you were focused on the first five minutes and three seconds in particular that Mr. Chauvin was applying his weight to Mr. Floyd's neck. Correct. And, uh, and why was the time period after the first five minutes and three seconds less significant to you? because at, f at that point where he extended his leg that we see happening, at the point we see that happening is at 2421. That is when he has suffered brain injury. We see and we can tell from the movement of his leg that the level of oxygen in his brain has caused what we call a myoclonic seizure type activity. They're just medical terms, but basically it means that he has kicked out his leg in an extension form, that he has straightened out his leg. And that is something we see as clinicians uh, in patients when they suffer uh, brain injury as a result of a low level of oxygen. We'll talk about that more in a, in a moment, uh, Dr. Tobin. Uh, but is it significant to you whether Mr. Chauvin moved his knee off of Mr. Floyd's neck after Mr. Floyd was unconscious? No. It's, I mean, it, it, the, the movement happens around at different times, but obviously the key thing is everything up to the time that we see the hypoxia, the, the brain injury that's occurring. And where Officer Chauvin moved his knee after that really is not going to have a material impact on the case. Would you help the ladies and gentlemen of the jury understand that if Mr. Chauvin is applying pressure on the side of the neck, as we see here in Exhibit 943, how does that translate into narrowing of the hypopharynx? It, again, it's going to depend on what is the orientation of Officer Chauvin's uh, body, what is the orientation of his leg, and then also in particular into what is the orientation of Mr. Floyd. Where exactly is the orientation of Mr. Floyd's uh, head? Because if it's the nuchal ligament is underneath uh, Officer Chauvin's knee, there's going to be very little compression of the hypopharynx in this region. Then if it moves to the side and Officer Chauvin's weight is coming down on the side of uh, Mr. Floyd's neck, then you're going to get huge compression of the hypopharynx. And again, looking at Exhibit 943 and focusing on the first five minutes, uh, was his knee uh, overarchingly on the side or was it on the, the back of the neck? In for the first uh, five minutes, uh, the left knee is on the neck virtually all of the time. The right knee, by my calculation, the right knee is on his back 57% of the time. The reason I can't say that it's on 100% is for the most of that other time, I don't get a good view. The cameras move around, it's the body cameras, and so I can't see it. But for that period of time, the crucial period of time of the five minute and three seconds, I can see uh, Officer uh, Chauvin's knee on his back for over 57% of the time. Let's talk about the third uh, mechanism, uh, the prone uh, position. Would the fact of Mr. Floyd being placed in the prone position also had an impact on the narrowing of the hypopharynx? Yes, the placing him on the prone position has several different effects, but particularly it also causes narrowing of the hypopharynx, among other things that the prone position does. Uh, is there a concept in physiology referred to as lung volumes? Yes, there are. Um, what, what is that? What does that refer to? That's just the way that we lung specialists, we measure how big is the size of the lung in different patients and we quantify out in different 
uh, areas, wh what level of the lung there is, whether it is different segments of the lung behave in different ways. Uh, do you have uh, an illustration you brought to help to help us better understand this concept? Yes, I have. I'm going to show you what is marked as Exhibit 929 and have you first just identify it. Yes, I identify 929. What, what is it? This is a, uh, it shows you lung function and it shows you tidal volume. And uh, is it uh, an, an accurate illustration yes, of uh, lung, lung function and tidal volume? Yes, it is. Uh, Your Honor, I, want, I offer Exhibit 929. Any objection? 929 is received. All right, so if we could start at the beginning of it, Mr. Alphine. So do I go ahead and describe? Yes, would you please? Yep. Hold on. Oh. Also, let's not talk over each other. We're getting into that bad habit. So uh, if you could ask the question again, Mr. Blackwell, I, I forgot. <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, I'm just going to ask you, Dr. Tobin, if you would uh, explain to us what we see in Exhibit 929. Yes. We're looking here at the lung inside the chest. The chest is in gray, and then we see the lung inside it, and arounding it is the pleural space. And we're seeing that as the uh, you were looking at breath going in and out, it generates a tidal volume. The tidal volume is shown as a, as a waveform down at the bottom, and so uh, that's what happens in somebody with, uh, what, with regular breathing. All right, let's see if we can get our tidal volumes to tide. So here you can see that the chest is expanding. Like on the front, you're seeing the pump handle action of the chest. And then with each breath, you can see air going into the lung, and that produces the tidal breath. So this is the tidal volume. And then on exhalation, it's going back out. Uh, Dr. Tobin, is there a standard or normal size of breath? Yes, there is. In virtually all adult people, it's about 400 cc's is the size of a tidal volume. Same so, for men and women? Same for men and women, and it's the same for teenagers and grandparents. So can lung volumes be calculated? Yes, then you can calculate all further additional lung volumes in addition. Did you actually do a calculation for Mr. Floyd's lung volume? Yes, I calculated out his lung volumes precisely based on his age, his sex, and his height. I want to show you what's marked as Exhibit 939 and tell me if this reflects your calculation. Yes. I said 939 is 930, Exhibit 930. <clears throat> so would using this be helpful to explain your testimony? Yes, it would. So, Your Honor, I want to offer Exhibit uh, 930. Any objections? 930 is received. Okay, so these are the lung volumes in Mr. Floyd while he's sitting on the sidewalk. And the key lung volume that we're going to be focusing on is the EELV. That's the end expiratory lung volume. And that becomes crucially important in understanding what happened to Mr. Floyd. And I calculate out his EELV to be 3,840. And that's what it's shown there by the horizontal purple line. Sitting on top of that then is the size of each breath. And then underneath the purple area is the residual volume. The residual volume is when you blow all the air out of your lung and after you're finished blowing, you can't blow any more out. That's the air that's still left inside your chest is the residual volume. And that in Mr. Floyd is two liters and 300 cc's, 2300. That's included in the ELV. The ELV is everything below that uh, horizontal purple line. So the ELV sitting upright is 3840. 
We so, also see so, on this so doctor, slide. If, if I could stop you for just one second. And uh, to help us understand better the end expiratory lung volume, the EELV, uh, would that be uh, commonly referred to as oxygen reserves? That it's also where your main oxygen stores are in the body. They are contained within your EELV. This is where you store your oxygen reserves. So for the ladies and gentlemen of the jury, uh, it's true that not all the air you breathe in is exhaled out. No. Yes. I mean, because the ELV is basically the volume that's in your lung in between each breath. So when you are breathing in and out, at, when you're between the next breath, what's in your lung is your EELV. And the residual volume, the RV, is that also residual oxygen that the body can use? Yes, so the, the oxygen reserves you have are in, included in, in the EELV and obviously a subset of the EELV is the residual volume. So all below the purple horizontal, all below your tidal volume is your oxygen reserves. And so then can you explain your calculations for Mr. Floyd's lungs? So here we, we see, based on his uh, age, his sex, and his height, we're seeing exactly that his ELV sitting upright is 3,840, and we see his residual volume is 2,300. And again, the amount of air he's taking in in tidal volume would be the same as anyone else. Right, and that's the 400 up at the top, the pink piece going up and down. That's the tidal volume. And that's the same as for anybody. And 400 cc's? Correct. Uh, is that cubic centimeters? That's uh, cubic centimeters, correct. Or milliliters or however you want to put it. And the oxygen graph that's on the side? Yes. Uh, what does that depict? So the level of oxygen in anybody varies with age. And this is exactly the level of oxygen you expect in a 46-year-old man. So it's a PO2, that's the level of oxygen measured and pressure of oxygen. If you were to do an arterial blood gas where somebody stuck a needle into your wrist, took out a sample of arterial blood, that is the level of oxygen they'll find, 89 millimeters of mercury is how we, is the units we use when we describe levels of oxygen. Now you told us that uh, Mr. Floyd, uh, being in the prone position, served to narrow the hypopharynx or decrease the volume of oxygen in the lungs. Right. It had multiple effects, it, including those two. Why is that? Because the ELV is very important in terms of, obviously, it's where we store the oxygen, but as well as that, it has an effect on the upper airway. So when you breathe in, you don't notice it, as you're expanding your lungs, you're aware of expanding your lungs, but at the same time, the size of your hypopharynx also widens out because there's attraction forces that are occurring between it. It's just part of normal breathing that you, as you inhale, you expand your lungs, but you also expand that little area that you have, the air has to go down through. And so that is influenced by the size of the ELV. Likewise, when the ELV gets less, then the size of the opening of the hypopharynx will also get less. It's going to collapse down as your ELV goes down. Did you actually calculate the reduction in lung volume for Mr. Floyd due to the prone position? Yes, I did. Uh, Brett, could I show uh, Dr. Tobin Exhibit 927? Doctor, is Exhibit 927 the calculation that I'm referring to? Yes. Uh, Your Honor, I offer Exhibit 927. Any objection? Yes. Twenty-seven is received. So, Dr. Tobin, uh, 
Tell us what we're seeing here in Exhibit 927 as relates to Mr. Floyd in the prone position. You're seeing a drop in his end expiratory lung volume. It's smaller when you're placed face down. And so uh, you're getting a decrease in the end expiratory lung volume, and that's occurring because, in part, you're, as say you're lying flat in the bed with your face into the pillow, if you're lying prone, face down, you're no longer going to be able to use your bucket handle action. So your lungs are going to get smaller. You're also going to have greater difficulty in using your bucket handle action. It's less so than the pump handle. And then as well as that, as you lay face down, your belly is going to rise up into your chest. And so your diaphragm rises. So the lungs get smaller, and that is what we see here. So in anybody who is turn prone, you see that the lung volumes will, on average, go down by about 24% by simply turning them prone. So with that, when you're getting the smaller lung volumes, you're getting less reserves, and you're also going to affect the hypopharynx. So if the uh, lung size goes down 24%, do the oxygen stores also go down 24%? The oxygen stores will go down by 24% as well. Once you have less, less volume inside your lungs, your oxygen reserves are going to go down proportionally. Is it absolutely 24%? No. I mean, again, in physiology, the way we do things is we look at what is the average change that happens when we do experiments. But in biology, there's always a certain amount of biological variation. And so there's always going to be something like a 2 to 4% variation that you're going to see around these numbers. But we, when we speak about something, we speak in terms of the average change that is occurring. So is, the, uh, is a 24% reduction significant in the case of Mr. Floyd? Yes, it's extremely important because, again, because of the factors that we're dealing with, we're seeing here that with the reduction in the ELV from just from the prone, we're decreasing the oxygen reserves. We're also affecting the size of the opening of the hypopharynx because as the ELV goes down, you're getting a proportional reduction in the size of that. And in addition, when you're turn prone like this, your work of breathing goes up because the stiffness of your lungs changes and the stiffness of your chest wall changes. So the person has to do more effort to breathe in that position. So the hypopharynx is linked to the size of the lung, that is the size of the hypopharynx. Yes. So, so, Doctor, maybe you can help us to understand this. Uh, is it uh, true that some persons suffering from COVID are actually treated in the prone position? Absolutely. Why, why is that? It's a, a different scenario, but I mean, in any patients with pneumonia, and particularly with COVID, but we see it in any patients with pneumonia, when you turn them prone, it can help. The problem is if they have pneumonia, they have bad matching between the blood vessels going through the lungs and the air sacs. I, we saw the movie at the beginning where you saw the alveoli and you saw all those blood vessels surrounding the bunch of grapes. In people who have pneumonia, COVID, whatever, that matching is going to be very bad and that's what leads to the worse oxygenation in those patients. If you flip those patients prone, some of them will show no improvement, but a substantial number of them, the matching will get better between the blood vessels and the, bl and, and the air sacs. You can't predict ahead of time until you turn the patient prone. You're not going to know which ones are going to do better, but some of them do. And so this is why prone has been very valuable in patients with COVID, but that is in people with pneumonia. This does not apply to people with normal lungs. You're, it's not happening. So, Dr. Tobin, also a lot of people sleep in the prone position. Yes. Is that dangerous? No, because again, for the average person, you have so much reserves. So, I mean, for a drop of 24% for you, it's not going to have any impact because you have a huge amount of reserve. It's not going to matter. But if you have somebody who drops 
the, the lung volume by 24%, and then that person is going to have to cope with the knee on the neck and is going to have to cope with having the arms pushed up and being unable to move the left lung, then it's a whole different kettle of fish. Thank you, doctor. So have we covered the, uh, the third mechanism, the prone position? Yes. Then let's uh, talk about the, uh, the fourth one, which is the knee on the back, arm, or side. Yes. Now, if we uh, bring to mind Mr. Chauvin's right knee uh, on Mr. Floyd's back or left uh, side, well, let me ask this, forget that question. Does it matter whether the right knee was on Mr. Floyd's back or left arm or his side? No, it's really all amounting to the same because we're talking again back to the bucket handle and the, and the pump handle. So whether it's on the back are rammed in against the side and down on the arm. All of these are just going to markedly impair your ability to be able to move your chest with your bucket handle and your pump handle. You just can't do it. It's all rammed in and what you're also you have to the whole time in this case you have to constantly keep in mind that this is taking place on the street. The street is playing a huge part because it's coming in in the front and totally preventing every action happening on the front. And did that influence then Mr. Floyd's uh, oxygen stores or reserves, the EELV? Right, yes, they're going down. As a result of once the ELV goes down, every proportional decrease you're seeing in the EELV, you're seeing the same proportional decrease in the oxygen stores. And were you able to calculate what that influence was? Yes. I want to show you what's marked as Exhibit 932. And I ask you, Dr. Tobin, does this reflect the calculations that you did? Yes, this does. So now you see the, the, with the effect. One, one or, moment, I'm sorry. One I'm moment. Going off. Uh, Your Honor, I, I want apologize. to. I, I offer Exhibit 932. Any objection? Okay. 932 is received. Now, doctor, please tell us what we see here in 932. So what you're seeing here now is that now it's no longer just prone. Now you have the knee on the back in addition, or the knee on the side. And so it is. this is going to further compress down the ELV. And see, so here you're seeing that the ELV has now been really squashed down. So it's in, by the combination of turning and prone, and also having the knee on the back, you're seeing a 43% reduction in the ELV, which means that there's also a 43% reduction in his oxygen reserves, which means there is also a huge reduction in the size of the hypopharynx, because this is directly linked to the hypopharynx, and you will see how this is linked. And so when you decrease the size of the ELV, that's going to cause it. And then an additional effect is that your work of breathing goes up because when you're term prone and with the knee on the back, now the work that Mr. Floyd has to perform becomes huge because he has to, with each breath, he has to try and fight against the street he has to try and fight with the small volumes that he has. And then he has to try and lift up the officer's knee with each breath. And also remember, he has to try and also lift up the effect of the other officer pumping in his arm with the handcuffed arm. They're pushing it in into his chest. So he has to make all these efforts to try and breathe against that. So, so doctor, when you tell us about a 43% reduction, 24% of that is just being in the prone position. Correct. And the other 19% then is the contribution of the knee on the neck and back. Yeah, exactly. The other 19% is, so 24% from being prone, another 19% coming from the knee on the back. And, and just so we're clear for, for the jury, how does this again translate into uh, difficulty in breathing? So again, I did calculations of this. 
and basically you're looking at more than a threefold increase in the work of breathing in terms of just from the effect of nothing else. That's even leaving out the effect of the knee on the neck, just from looking at what's happening within the chest. So there's a huge increase in the work that Mr. Floyd was performing just to try and cope with what was happening below the neck, leaving aside what is happening above the neck. Doctor, I want to show you uh, exhibits 922 through 926. And after you have a chance to see them, I want you first just to identify just what you're seeing in those before we show it to the jury. Yes, I identify. Um, uh, tell us, please, what it is for the record. It, we're looking at the effect of the lungs on the hypopharynx, beginning with Mr. Floyd sitting on the sidewalk. Your Honor, we offer uh, exhibits 922 through 926. Any objection? Nine twenty two through nine twenty six inclusive are received. So, Doctor, if you will walk us through these to help us to understand the narrowing of the hypopharynx in the case of Mr. Floyd. Right. Before you look at the hypopharynx, just look down at the lungs. And you see that the lungs, as you would expect, are expanding with each breath. You see the diaphragm going down. You can see the pump handle action. The lungs are getting bigger front to back. But then you see that exactly as the lungs are expanding, if you focus up in the yellow boxed area, and then the yellow boxed area is enlarged over on the right side. And you can see that as you inspire, the size of the hypopharynx is also inspired, is enlarging. So you're seeing both of these happening. So it's the effect of the lung volume, how it influences the uh, opening of the hypopharynx and this is sitting on the sidewalk. So looking at exhibit uh, 922, what do we see here now in the prone position? Right, so now we see Mr. Floyd after he's turned prone and now we can see the lungs are smaller than they were because they fall, we know when you turn prone. And then you also see now that the area of the hypopharynx is further narrowed because the lungs, as they get smaller, they have less effect in keeping that open, and so that gets smaller. Okay. And then we have the knee on the back, and now we see with the knee on the back, then the lungs become further reduced, like I showed you for the precise calculations of the volumes, and now you see here is the size of the hypopharynx further is shrunk as a result of it. So the opening through the hypopharynx is impacted by the knee on the back. And if we compare them all together, all three? Right. Exhibit so nine. here you're seeing them all together. So on the left is sitting on the sidewalk, then just the effect of prone, and then the effect of prone with the back compression. And you can see the arrow is pointing out to you on the first one, where is the hypopharynx, right that area, and with the uh, epiglottis directly in front of it. And you can see that it's expanding when he's sitting down. And then when he's prone, and when he is prone with the back compression, you're seeing that the area that of expansion is getting smaller, as exactly as what you would expect to happen. Uh, going back to Mr. Floyd's lung volumes, Dr. Tobin, is there a point in time uh, when you determined that Mr. Floyd did not have enough oxygen in his stores even to remain conscious? Yes, there is. Uh, and when was that? The time in terms of the uh, loss of consciousness was 2453. We can tell it precisely. 
in terms of where the absence of consciousness occurs. And uh, can you tell by facial features or anything? You can't tell, because I mean, this is something I do not as a physiologist, but as an ICU doctor. I mean, we're always looking at facial features to be able to tell how conscious somebody is. And we can tell by how you flick your eyes or how you move the muscles in your face. And that you'll be able to tell, is the person conscious or unconscious? It's a, it's a very important sign in patients as we're taking care of them to be able to monitor that and the primary way we monitor it is by inspecting it. So I would have done this millions of times. And Do you know, Dr. Tobin, what his oxygen level would have been at the time he went unconscious? Yes, we also know that at the time if you have somebody who is in the situation who is at risk of trouble with oxygen, we know that the moment at which you lose consciousness the level of oxygen in your blood will be 36. That's this, the number that's associated based on very hard s scientific data telling us that. And again, the normal level of oxygen was? In, in Mr. Floyd was 89 for him. In a 46-year-old man, you expect that the normal level of oxygen is 89. The level at which you will have an absence of consciousness then will be 36. Doctor, I want to show you Exhibit 928. If we could clear the screen, Your Honor. And first, for the record, before we show this to the jury, can you just identify what is Exhibit 928? We're looking at the effects on Mr. Floyd's oxygen as a result of all the various maneuvers that are being done to him. Your Honor, I offer Exhibit 928. Any objection? 928 is received. So tell us, Dr. Tobin, what do we see here in Exhibit 928? We're look, looking at, I mean, when it began, the level of oxygen, when I saw it, began with a level of oxygen of 89, and then we see that it falls down to 36. The, the slide is looking a bit different than what I saw before. Yep. So here you see that the level of oxygen beforehand it's 89 and then at the point when we notice the lack of consciousness in his face that the level of oxygen will drop down to uh, 36. One more. And so th that tells us there, it tells us the time for the loss of consciousness. And then uh, we know that it continues from there and where he, from the time that he stops breathing, which is 20, 25, 16. And then I calculated out that from there on that you can calculate based on, again, very rigorous science when the level of oxygen will have gone down to zero. But this first one, we're looking at the level, the loss of consciousness at 36. And that's happening at 20, 24, 53. And we're able to tell that by looking at his face. And 2024, 20, 53 is 824 p.m. and 53 seconds. Correct. Uh, was there a point in time when Mr. Floyd no longer had any oxygen left in his body? There is, because again, once he stops breathing at 20, 25, 16, then you can, it, it would take another 25 seconds for the level of oxygen to go down to zero. At that point, he wouldn't have an ounce of oxygen left in his entire body. Doctor, I want to show you Exhibit 931. Okay. And ask you first if you would just tell us what it depicts before we show it to the jury. Yes, that's it, showing exactly. What, what do we see in 931? So what we're seeing in 931 is that his level of oxygen has gone all the way down to zero. All right. So we're going to show this to the jury, but first let me uh, move to admit Exhibit 931. Any objection? 931 is received. Now, Dr. Tobin, would you explain to the jury what we see here in Exhibit 931? Right. 
we're seeing that the level of oxygen has gone down to zero that there is at that point there's not an ounce of oxygen left in his body and again this is totally uh, you can figure this out with very uh, precise science looking at once somebody stops breathing what will be the rate of decline in the level of oxygen how long it will take to reach zero and this is ex so we see here that he reaches a level of zero of oxygen at 20 25 41 and so th at that point there's not an ounce of oxygen left in his body in his entire body at at 20 25 41 so was the knee then lifted off of his neck at the point there was no more oxygen in his body? No, the knee remained on the neck for another three minutes and two seconds after we reached the point where there was not one ounce of oxygen left in the body. Thank you, doctor. Are you aware of studies suggesting that putting someone in the prone position and putting a weight on the back is not dangerous. Yes, I'm aware of these studies. They largely come out from San Diego, from the group of Dr. Chan and Vilke and his co colleagues. Are you uh, able to generally characterize the nature of these studies for the jury? Uh, the, the bottom line is they're highly misleading. Are they relevant to the analysis you've just given to the jury this morning? No, they're not in a, uh, relevant to the analysis we've got, uh, gone through this morning. Help us to understand why. Okay. The problem is in these particular studies, and there's, uh, I mean, I don't know how many in total, but could be close to 10 of them, and where they take people, first of all, they take perfectly healthy volunteers, they bring them into the physiology lab, and they lay them flat, and they put a mat underneath them, which is different than the street. And then... They, measure, they put weights on top of them so that weights could be lead weight in bags or else in many of them they use kind of the, the barbells that you see in a gym like an Olympic wheel that you'd see in a gym for weightlifting and they place those on the back of the subjects and then they measure various lung volumes. So typically they'll measure what we call vital capacity or maximum voluntary ventilation. These are specific types of lung function tests that you don't need to bother with. But they're showing a decrease in lung availability of around 35%. That's a substantial decrease in your lung volumes that you're finding. And then they conclude in virtually all of their studies that that level of decrease in lung volume doesn't matter because there's no change in the level of oxygen and so therefore it's not clinically relevant. The problem is in doing a study like that oxygen is the exact wrong yardstick to be using in a study like this. What they needed to do is continue to measure out the changes in lung volume like the ELV showing what happens to this. Oxygen will only fall at the very end. It's an extremely insensitive measure. It's very important but it's very insensitive to know if stuff is going bad inside the body. It's going to be a very late event. And so for their concluding of this... Let's have sorry. another question. I, I didn't question, hear the please. objection, Your Honor. Should I interpose another question? Please. Right, Your Honor. Um, so, so to help us to better understand Dr. Tobin, um, are these studies measuring the diminution or decrease in the oxygen oxygen reserve, the EELV? No, they're not. I want to show you what's marked as Exhibit 948. And it does uh, not, Exhibit 948 uh, point to one of the studies that you were referring to? Yes, it does. Uh, would it be helpful to use this slide to explain your testimony? Yes, it would. Yana, we would offer uh, Exhibit 948. Any objection? 948 is received. So looking here at this slide, Dr. Dr. Tobin, uh, what does this tell us in terms of, for example, the, the surface area that's involved of the weight on the back? So if you look at the subject's back, you can see here 
that there are four weights out of a gym that are placed on the back of the subject. And the big wheel out of the, the plate, out of a, an Olympic plate, is going to have a diameter of 17 and a half inches. And so you can measure the cross-sectional area of that is going to be 240 square inches. The trouble is that when officers kneel on the back of a suspect, they don't place an Olymp Olympic wheel on their back, they place their knee. And so the cross-sectional area of the knee is 24 square inches, which is one-tenth of the area of the big bell that you're looking at here. And so we know from simple physics that pressure is force over area, so that's 240 divided by 24. That tells you that the uh, pressure being exerted on the back is 10 times more than what the San Diego people are claiming. They're off by a factor of 10. So the pressure then being exerted by a knee uh, is 10 times greater, is what you're saying? Is 10 times greater than the, is going to be affected by the bell here that's shown from out of the gym, the bar that you're living. Do, the any, of these, do any of these studies, doctor, involve a knee on the neck? Nobody has done any studies involving the knee on the neck. I suspect you'd have major trouble getting that through the ethics committee in any medical school. Uh, do any of these studies go on for nine minutes and 29 seconds? No, they're all very brief studies. So doctor, have we now covered the four mechanisms that resulted in Mr. Floyd's shallow breathing and the reduction of the hypopharynx? Yes, we have. Now, Dr. Tobin, were you, were or are you aware that Mr. Floyd had some pre-existing health conditions? Yes, I am. And how are you aware of that? I mean, I read them in the records from Henneman County and obviously saw, also saw them mentioned in the autopsy. Uh, do you have an opinion to a reasonable degree of medical certainty as to whether a person who had none of those pre-existing health conditions, a healthy person, would have died under the same circumstances as Mr. Floyd? Yes, a healthy person subjected to what Mr. Floyd was subjected to would have died as a result of what he was subjected to. Are you also aware that Mr. Floyd was found to have a type of tumor known as a paraganglioma? Yes, I am. And for the ladies and gentlemen of the jury, what is a paraganglioma? A paraganglioma is a type of a tumor that is found in the paraganglions, kind of sometimes in the pelvis. And is uh, the finding of a paraganglioma significant to you as relates to Mr. Floyd and his death? No, because one of the key things about a paraganglioma is that it's called the 10% tumor which means that 10% of people who have a paraganglioma secrete adrenaline, well that could be important, but 90% of them don't secrete adrenaline. So you don't, in 9 out of 10 at the times that you have a paraganglioma, you have no increase in the amount of adrenaline. So if somebody were to die from a tumor, well, from some effect of a paraganglioma, would it be a sudden death? Yes, there's been six reported cases of people who have had paragangliomas who have died suddenly. But that's the total in the literature, six. And those people who died have headaches. And Mr. Floyd complained of a lot of pain in lots of different regions while he's down on the street, but he did not complain of headaches. So in terms of reported cases where people have died from uh, paragangliomas, over the entire world, you know of six reported cases? Yes. And all of those are sudden deaths? Correct. Did Mr. Floyd die a sudden death? No. I want to talk to you about a different uh, subject. The, the jurors may have heard uh, one of the officers say, if you can speak, you can breathe. Yes. Is, is that a true statement? It's a true statement, but it gives you an enormous false sense of security. Certainly, at the moment you're, that you are speaking, you are breathing, but it doesn't tell you that you're going to be breathing five seconds later. So let's uh, talk about kind of why this is significant. Um, so could you tell us about something that may seem obvious, that is, what's required for speaking? Right. So I mean, for speaking, 
you only speak when you're exhaling. You have to blow air out and then you vibrate the vocal cords and that's all there is to speech. So it's air going across the vocal cords, they vibrate and you speak. But to speak there's two things important. One is you cannot blow air out if you didn't take a breath in beforehand. So you must have had an inspiration in to speak. The second thing is you cannot speak if your brain is not alert. Okay, so uh, when you see somebody speaking, you know they have had an inspiration momentarily before they're speaking and that there is oxygen going to the brain at the time that they are speaking. And by inspiration, you mean they had to take in a breath in directly right. from the speaking. Yes. Was the timing of Mr. Floyd's speech during the restraint important to your analysis? Yes, it was. Why, why so? Because it tells us that for the time that he's speaking, and he continues to speak for 4 minutes 51 seconds from the time the knee is placed on his neck, it tells us that there could not have been complete compression, could not have been total occlusion of the neck at that time, for that time, because he's continuing to speak for 4 minutes 51 seconds. Dr. Tobin, is the brain sensitive to oxygen deprivation? The brain is the most sensitive area to needing oxygen. So what percentage is the brain of body weight and how much oxygen does it consume? So the brain is, is relatively small. It's only 2% of our body weight, but it takes in 20% of all the oxygen that we take in. So the brain eats up oxygen at 10 times the normal level. It needs a huge amount of oxygen because it's sending out millions of nerve signals every second. So it needs a very high supply of oxygen then how long can the brain go without oxygen? That's well worked out. If you stop the flow of oxygen to the brain, you lose consciousness in eight seconds. So if you might recall Mr. Floyd's uh, last words, you know, I can't breathe. Right. Uh, are, are, are those words significant to you as a pulmonologist? Yes, I mean obviously they're important different ways. One, he's t complaining to you of difficulty with breathing, but they're also telling me that at that time when he's saying, please I can't breathe, he's, we know at that point he has oxygen in his brain. But And again, it's a perfect example of how it gives you a huge false sense of security because very shortly after that we're going to see that he has a major loss of oxygen in the way that he moves his leg. And so it tells you how dangerous is the concept of if you can breathe or if you can speak, you can breathe. Yes, that is true on the surface, but highly misleading. Very, a very dangerous uh, mantra have out there. So if I'm hearing you correctly, when he says I can't breathe, that shows his brain is alert. Yes. But then immediately thereafter his brain wasn't. Correct. Uh, and did you see or is there anything in the video that you can show the jurors uh, that they can see also that would point to the fact that his brain was no longer alert? Yes. Uh, Let me pull up uh, Exhibit uh, 47, already in, in evidence, at 2024. So I'm going to play a, a clip uh, for you, Dr. Tobin, and then tell the jurors what, what they see afterwards. Yes. So there's a key finding that you're seeing here, and that is when you see his uh, leg going up. And you have to keep in mind he's prone, so he's facing down. So this is his leg coming up backwards. And so that's what we call as clinicians, that's an extension movement of the leg. 
and that is something we see when somebody suffers major brain uh, lack of oxygen and it tells us at that point he's having what are sometimes called a myoclonic seizure sometimes called a, a hypoxic seizure there's different terms that are used but really they all amount to saying that you're seeing here fatal injury to the brain from a lack of oxygen. It's sometimes also called an anoxic seizure. It has all of these different words. There's a lot of different words that are used, but they all come down to the same thing, that it is that at that point, the brain is responding to the drastically low level of oxygen that's present. And does the fact of an anoxic seizure reflect damage to the brain? It indicates severe damage to the brain. Uh, and the, uh, the reflex that we saw with the legs coming up, is that an involuntary reaction? It's, a, it's an involuntary reaction. I mean, there's a lot of different medical terms that we apply to it, but the bottom line is that you're seeing that the, the leg jumps up like that as a result of a fatally low level of oxygen going to the brain. So doctor, we talked about the uh, brain injury. Uh, th we also told us earlier about uh, low levels of oxygen uh, potentially causing pulseless electrical activity. Yes. And is that also then evidence of low oxygen? Right, so I mean, there when you have a low level of oxygen, that's going to show up in the brain and it's also going to show up in the heart. And when it shows up in the heart, it's going to cause the heart to beat abnormally. And the particular way that it happened in Mr. Floyd was he developed a particular arrhythmia called a PEA, which is a pulses electrical activity where we're seeing there's electricity in the heart but it's not resulting in any mechanical force and so that's why it has that name and so it's the low level of oxygen is producing both we don't see the PEA the pulses electrical activity arrhythmia until that's shown up on the EKG in the ambulance so it's much later that we see the evidence of it in terms of display but here we're seeing huge evidence in terms of the leg. The leg is crucial here because this is this is the time that you're the first time you're seeing there is major league oxygen damage. So we reach a point where Mr. Floyd uh, couldn't speak due to low oxygen. Was there any correlation also to a narrowing of the airways that prevented his being able to speak? Yes as well. I want to show you what's marked as exhibits 934, 936, and 933. And just tell us what are these images in general? So we're seeing again the same MRI but at, dif at a different view of it that we looked at before. Yeah, I offer exhibits 934, 936, and 933. <laughs> Nine thirty four, nine thirty six, and nine thirty three are received. Okay. So, Doctor, tell us what we see here, starting with the the first. Uh, right. So, one. this is the same MRI that you saw before, <clears throat> but what's folk, what you're being your attention is drawn to by the yellow arrow is the vocal cords, and the vocal cords is simply how you speak. So, to speak, you must. Inhale, you must take air into your lungs, and then when you let the air out, you're going to vibrate those little vocal cords there, and that's what makes the sound of speech. And so here we see the size of the windpipe, the trachea, and this becomes important in terms of speech because our knowledge about the influence of, this, of the size of the trachea, of the windpipe for speech, is from patients who had had an endotracheal tube in place, and then they developed scarring after that. And so as a result of the scarring, we know what is the point at how much scarring in your windpipe will prevent you from speaking. 
And so these are just the dimensions. So as you know, what is the size of the normal trachea? It's between a quarter and a dime, as you can see here, in terms of the diameters. And then next slide, Brett. And here is when the, those coins have been shrunk to 15%. And even when the trachea has narrowed all the way down to 15%, you are still able to speak even when the hole through your windpipe is just this size, as I've shown here where I've shrunk the size of the coins, you are still able to speak. So it tells you how dangerous it is to think, well, if he can speak, he's, he's doing okay. Because at this point, you will be able to speak. But again, if there is a small increase in the amount of narrowing here, not only will you not be able to speak, you won't be able to breathe, you won't be able to live. And so it's a very dangerous uh, thing to think that because you're able to speak, you're doing okay. And, and so, doctor, you're not able to speak, breathe, or live once the airway narrows to below 15%. Correct. Once you, I mean, it, you go from the 15% 15, 15 you'll still be able to speak, and then as it gets lower from that, Initially, you'll be struggling, and then at some stage, you just won't be able to do anything. Brett, if we could show Exhibit 940, it's already uh, admitted. So again, this is exactly, because this is the same experiment I showed you before. And it just so happens, this is pure coincidence. It's at 85%. You're looking at that top curve, and that's the same number that we sh sh showed you on the, pr on the MRI. This is pure coincidence. But you can see here, once you're up at 85%, that the work of breathing is enormous. It's seven and a half fold increase. And then as that uh, uh, narrowing would get further and further, then the work will become unbearable. So it te again, it just emphasizes at the point where you can't speak and you are in deep trouble. Doctor, I'd like to transition now uh, from talking about the physiology of breathing uh, to talk about uh, your work as a clinician, uh, yeah. taking care of uh, patients with respiratory troubles. Um, does that experience factor into your opinions today also? Yes. Uh, did you do anything to try to understand Mr. Floyd's actual rate of breathing. Yes, I did. Uh, why was that important to do? Because a major part of my work as a lung specialist is, look, is looking at people's breathing. You get an awful lot of information by looking at how they breathe, by looking at how they use their chest wall. All of this is extremely informative. And at the lowest level, one of the simplest things to do that is especially informative is simply to count how many breaths somebody takes in. It's one of the vital signs, like with blood pressure, pulse rate, temperature, is the respiratory rate. It's one of the signs that tells us, and it gives us a lot of clues as to what is happening inside the body. Is this something you've done before? I've done it millions of times. Do you train others in how to and do I've it? I've trained nurses, respiratory therapists, medical students, doctors, in how to do it. And so you're accounting the breaths. Uh, do you observe the muscles and things also? You, separately from counting the breaths, you're going to look at the different muscles they're using, whether they're using their sternomastoid, whether, what type of bucket handle action they have, what type of pump handle. You're looking at all of this in a glance. I mean, with somebody as old as me, I can see all of this very rapidly. So did you take this clinical experience and apply it to your observations of Mr. Floyd's breathing, in this case, on the videos? Yes, I did. Uh, was there video, video evidence from which you could uh, take measurements? Yes, there is. I uh, want to show uh, Exhibit 43 that's already uh, in evidence. So I want to um, play this, doctor, and afterward tell us what we're seeing. So in a moment it will start. 
So if you focus down here on where he is, the handcuff is and where his arm is close to his black shirt is the best place to see. And you can count out his respiratory rate. So you're seeing that he's making a respiratory rate here, then another, and so we, we need to play it back because so I needed to, to tell you first where to focus. If you focus down there, you will see, be able to count out the rates. All right, we will uh, play it uh, once more so that you can count the rates so okay. that you see what you refer yeah, to. Yeah. One, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight. So that was a roughly a 17 second clip. Right. And you counted seven or eight, eight breaths. Set between seven and eight, yeah. And did you use this to calculate a rate of respiration? Yes, because I mean, it's simple. Once you have 19 seconds and you count out the number of breaths you have here, and and if it say you count out seven breaths, that will come out at a respiratory rate of 22. Is that number, uh, the respiratory rate of 22, significant to this case? It's extremely significant. Why is that? Because one of the things in this case is the question of fentanyl. And if fentanyl is having an effect and is causing depression of the respiratory centers, the centers that control breathing, that's going to result in a decrease in the respiratory rate. And it's shown that with fentanyl, you expect a 40% reduction in the respiratory rate. So with fentanyl, his respiratory rate should be down at around 10. Instead of that, it's right in the middle of normal at 22. So you didn't see a depressed rate of respiration or breathing rate in Mr. Floyd? No, it's normal. And, and so what does it tell you, bottom line, with respect to um, fentanyl as relates it, to Mr. Floyd? Exactly. With, in terms of fentanyl, the, the major, one of the major changes you see in fentanyl is a slowing of the respiratory rate. So, and again, we would be expecting a 40% reduction in the respiratory rate with fentanyl. The normal respiratory rate is 17 breaths per minute plus or minus five. So that would mean a normal respiratory rate of between 12 and 22. That's the normal range of respiratory rate. And so if it was with fentanyl, you'd be expecting a respiratory rate of 10. Instead of that, you count it here yourself. And you can see when you count it yourself that the respiratory rate is 22. So basically it tells you there, that isn't, there isn't fentanyl on board. And that is affecting his ris respiratory centers. It's not having an effect on his respiratory centers. So Mr. Floyd's uh, respiratory rate was normal at 22 just before he lost consciousness? Correct. So the jury, jury may have heard some other information in the case uh, about the, the fentanyl related to an elevated carbon dioxide level in Mr. Floyd's body in the emergency room. Was that significant to you? Yes, that's very significant as well. How so? Because he's reported to have a PCO2, sorry, I take it back. He's reported to have a carbon dioxide level in the arterial blood in the emergency room of 89. That's a very high level of carbon dioxide. And so you have to take into account what are the factors that might have led to that. And there's particularly important factors in Mr. Floyd to explain why his carbon dioxide was found at 89 in the emergency room. So doctor, would you first tell us uh, what would normal have been for carbon dioxide levels? The normal carbon dioxide level in you or me is 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury. That's the normal. You don't need the millimeters of mercury stuff, but they're the units that are given in the hospital chart. Mm -hmm. So you, you said that there were significant factors in the case of Mr. Floyd. Would you help the jury understand what those were? Yes, the important factors are that we know that he made his own last spontaneous 
effort to breathe at 20, 25, 16. After that, you can look at the videos and you see he makes no effort to breathe. There's, he makes no breath. The last breath he took was at 20, 25, 16. Then we know after that he stayed on the street for another three minutes or so, then he's placed into the uh, ambulance and we know that in the ambulance they attempted to put in an airway, an eye gel, and you can see that on the Officer Lane's body cam. You can see all of that happening. And then you can see the time at which they actually successfully inserted the airway and when they gave him the first breath. And that is a gap of 9 minutes and 50 seconds from when he last took a breath. And why is that significant? That's very significant because we can calculate what is the rate of increase in the carbon dioxide in somebody who doesn't breathe. If somebody doesn't take a breath, carbon dioxide increases at a predictable rate. And that rate is up to 4.9 millimeters of mercury per minute that it increases. And so he has not taken a breath for 9 minutes and 50 seconds. So you would expect just on that basis that his carbon dioxide level will go up by 49. So you add 49 to the normal values of 35 to 45 and then you add that and you're going to get a value of uh, be between 89 and uh, above and so it comes out ex virtually identical to the value that they found in the emergency room of 89. So, so doctor, what's the punchline with respect to that? What does it tell us? The significance of all of that is it's a second reason why you know fentanyl is not ha causing the depression of his respiration. What you're seeing is that the increase in his carbon dioxide that is found in the emergency room is solely explained by what you expect to happen in somebody who doesn't have any ventilation given to him for 9 minutes and 50 seconds. It's so, completely explained by that. So when a person then is not breathing, then carbon dioxide would naturally continue to build up in the body? Yes. And, and that's, that's what matches what was seen in the OR for Mr. Floyd? Precisely. Now you said that there were other things uh, that were significant that were related to the rate of respiration and we talked about fentanyl. Right. Um, was there anything else? Yes. The other things, there's two other things that are very important to the respiratory rate, because you saw it with your own eyes, exactly his respiratory rate. And the first thing is that if you have somebody who has underlying heart disease, and the heart disease is so severe that it's been said that it's causing shortness of breath, that it's causing you difficulty with breathing, if somebody has heart disease that's causing shortness of breath, virtually all of those patients are going to have very high respiratory rates. They're going to have respiratory rates of 35, 30, over 30, even over 40. When you have heart disease, that'll give you shortness of breath. Instead of that, we find that his respiratory rate is normal at 22. The second thing that's important about the respiratory rate of 22 is if you have somebody where the primary problem in the body is airway narrowing where you have somebody where there is that the airways are being compressed there's narrowing in the neck or there's narrowing like in somebody in the chest what the response the physiological response to airway narrowing is a normal respiratory rate and that is what he has. So it's the expect, what the respiratory rate that you see that's normal is the expected physiological response in somebody who has uh, airway narrowing. Mm -hmm. so, so doctor, we covered the, the uh, mechanisms of uh, how low oxygen occurs. Uh, as a clinician, did you observe the results of low oxygen in the videos showing the last minutes of George Floyd's life? Yes. 
Uh, what did you observe? I mean, in terms of uh, what we're seeing is that the changes in his facial appearance. This becomes crucially important. Again, in seeing the effects of the low oxygen. And have you seen this effect in, in other patients as a clinician? Yes, I mean, uh, because I work in an ICU where 40% of our patients die, so I'm extremely familiar with seeing people who die, unfortunately. And so th when, when you see these changes, you see the changes in the face. It is the key way of noticing something happening is by looking at the effects on the face. Doctor, I'm going to show you Exhibit 15 already admitted, admitted into evidence at uh, 404. And I want to play a, a clip and have you tell us what it shows. At the beginning, you can see he's conscious. You can see slight flickering, and then it disappears. And the, so one, one second he's alive, and one second he's no longer. And could we just once more, in case uh, Brennan went pretty fast, so jurors can see it. Uh, just one second. It is... Uh, 20, 24, 53 in the composite. Yeah, and, and the, the, the speed is uh, slowed down by a third just so we can see it. Is that the flicking yes, you were? You can to? see his eyes, he's conscious, and then you see that he isn't. I mean, that's the moment the life goes out of his body. I want to also show you a, a clip uh, from another body-worn camera, Exhibit uh, 43. And for Mr. Nelson, that's the Kane one. Uh, 20, 22. 22, that's where it starts. And I want to play this for you also, Dr. Tobin, and you could tell the ladies and gentlemen yeah. of the jury what this informs us. Dr. Tobin. Yeah. Dr. Tobin. Uh-huh. Dr. Tobin. Uh-huh. Everything here. So now he's rocking his right side. You can see how he's moving his hip to try and rock the right side of his body to try and get air. You can see him again pushing down on the street to get air in. And these movements of his hip, might, you may miss, but he's having to use all his entire spine to ju just try and get air into that right side of the body. Keep in mind the left side is non-functional from the way they have manipulated him and pushed him into the street. So he's constantly, he's trying cranking up his right side of his body, you can see it right there, to try and get some air into his right side of his chest. He's making repeated struggling movements. He's moving again the hips because he's using his spine to try and get them, those muscles, to move air into the right side of his chest. And he's again trying to use his right arm and he's unable because of the chain, the small chain linking it over to the left side. He's trying to have pushed down on that right arm into the street to try and help him, but he's unable to do it because of the chain on the handcuffs. And at some point, Mr. Floyd stops speaking and what does that tell us about his oxygen supply? That tells us at that point where he's, he's not speaking, it tells us that the airway narrowing in his, in his upper airway is more than 85%, and then it's separate from the, in terms of the oxygen level. That we're seeing by the face, but they're ha all happening together. And so once once seeing how much narrowing there is in the airway, but they're all happening, they're all coming in together. 
and, and then did the restraint stop uh, right. at the, the time of uh, the brain injury and the PEA arrhythmia? Yes. The restraint stopped at that time? No, the restraints continued after that he has the cessation of respiratory efforts. When he la last take a breath, the knee remains on the neck for another 3 minutes and 27 seconds after he takes his last breath. There is the, the knee remains. After there is no pulse, the knee remains on the neck for another 2 minutes and 44 seconds after the officers have found themselves there is no pulse. The knee remains on the neck another 2 minutes 44 seconds. Thank you, Dr. Tobin. No further questions. Okay. Mr. Nelson. Senator? Members of the jury, we're going to take our lunch break at this time. We're going to take until 1.30. Thank you.
Just a reminder, Doctor, you're still under oath. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Nelson. Good afternoon, Dr. Tobin. Hello, Mr. Nelson. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here with us today. We'll take a sip. Cheers. Like they Cheers. do in Ireland, right? Yep. Ah, all right. So I just want to kind of review a few things with you, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think we'll take too long, but um, so you were ultimately approached by the state of Minnesota to assist them uh, in the review of the medical issues in this case, correct? Correct. And uh, you have volunteered to do this work uh, at no cost, correct? Correct. And that's, uh, you're not uh, normally involved in criminal cases of this nature, correct? Correct. And this is the first time you've ever been involved in a criminal case, correct? Correct. And it was that reason that you decided uh, not to charge a fee, correct? Correct. Now, when you are in other cases, what type of fee do you normally charge? I charge per hour, so it's... What's your hourly rate? And my, my hourly rate is 500 an hour for reviewing material. Okay. Um, and But you b agreed to waive your hourly rate for this time, correct? correct? Um, you felt it was an important case, right? Yes. All right. Now, in preparation uh, for your testimony today, you met with the state numerous times, correct? Correct. You have had the opportunity to review uh, all of the medical information that was obtained in this case, correct? Yes. That would include Mr. Floyd's previous medical history, correct? Correct. The autopsy and attending uh, toxicology reports that were prepared in uh, this case? Yes. As well as some investigative materials, police reports, things of that nature, correct? Correct. And just to correct me if I'm wrong, but you are not a pathologist, correct? Correct, I am not a pathologist. Your specialty is in pulmonology, critical care, things of that nature? Correct. And then you also have an interest and, uh, and uh, uh, an impressive resume relevant to applied physiology as well. Correct. And you've been honored um, quite extensively for your work in that regard, right? Correct. Um, you're not a Minneapolis police officer. Correct. It's fair to say that the training that is provided by the Minneapolis Police Department in terms of medical care comes nowhere close to your level of expertise. Correct. You understand that Minneapolis police officers are not even EMTs. Correct. They have a basic life-saving certificate dealing with gunshots, chest seals, tourniquets, and CPR, right? My, yes. Right. So you're, uh, you've also had the opportunity uh, to review a lot of the body camera footage, correct? Yes. You've done, um, I think you testified that you've watched these videos hundreds of times. Correct. And you've watched them all from all different angles, correct? Correct. And you've had the luxury of slowing things down, moving it into slow motion, still framing various times, right? Correct. And <clears throat> so your analysis of this case comes after hundreds, if not thousands of hours of time spent looking at this information. I don't know the total amount of time that I've spent, but it's substantial. Right. So then you uh, ultimately, based on the review of all of that, you prepared a report, correct? Correct. And you provided that to the state of Minnesota in late January of this year, right? January 27th, yeah. Right. And after that, you've had numerous meetings with uh, the prosecution team in this case? And, and by phone or by Zoom, yeah. Right. Um, including January 30th of this year? I, I don't know the dates, but I mean, that sounds correct. Right. So if I were to tell you the dates were January 30th, March 3rd, March 9th, March 17th, March 21st, April 6th, and April 7th, you would not have uh, any reason to dispute me. I have no reason to dispute And you understand that notes are made of those meetings and provided to the defense in this case, correct? I understood that. And then you've also been able to spend a substantial period of time preparing the, the exhibits that the jury was able to see earlier today, right? Correct. And uh, those were all prepared by you or someone within your team, right? To prepare by me, yeah. And uh, you provided those to the prosecution in advance of today's testimony? Correct. And you understand those were provided to me last night? I, I, I have no idea when. But okay. Yep. All right. 
So you've, you've had a lot of time to prepare uh, both yourself as well as the prosecution team in connection with this case. Fair to say? Correct. Now, you talked quite a bit about physics in uh, your direct testimony. Agreed? Yes. And you would agree that <clears throat> physics or the application of physical forces is a constantly changing uh, set of circumstances. I, I didn't catch what you said. Sure. You would agree with me, would you not, that when you look at the concepts of physics, these things are constantly changing, right? Yeah, all science is constant changing. Constant. I mean, yes. in milliseconds and nanoseconds, right? Yes. And so if I put this much weight or this much weight, all of the, the formulas and variations will, will change from second to second, millisecond to millisecond, nanosecond to nanosecond. Agreed? I agree. Similarly, biology sort of works the same way, right? Yes. My heart beats, my lungs breathe, my brain is sending millions of signals to my body at all times. Correct. Again, even, I mean, faster than the speed of light, right? Correct. Millions of signals every nanosecond, right? Yes. And I think in your report, you even kind of discuss that when you're talking about these instances, when you're talking about the physics or the biology, what you're really talking about is a single kind of nanosecond. But all of these processes are working in concert at all times, right? Right. I mean, the way we calculated is the mean value. But I mean, it, it's then into one instant. Right. You've, you've, you've taken this case and you've literally boiled it down into a nanosecond. Oh, I wouldn't say that, no, because it's obviously in my report, as you see, it's sequentially, there's a whole chronology. I begin from the time the knee is placed on the neck, and then all the time until uh, what's happening in Hennepin County ER. Right. And so you, you talk, your report talks about the sequential nature of things, but when we talk about the biology and the physics of this case, these things are working simultaneously, contemporaneously, all together, right? That's correct. In yeah. an incredibly rapid fashion. Yes. And you would agree with me that, that as this incident was occurring, there was nobody measuring the units of force that were placed on any particular position of any particular person at any particular moment, right? I mean, there was nobody there measuring them at the time. I agree with that, but, but they're all calculable. Understood. And that's when you calculate them, what you have to do is you have to boil it down into what you would call the mean or the average, right? Correct. And so in, whenever we look at the concept of an average, there are things that are happening moments before, moments after, right? Yes. And forces will increase or decrease relative to the nanosecond of time. Agreed? Correct, yep. And ultimately, when we talk about kind of the biology of things, a pathologist tries to look at all the intersection of all of the things that occur to a particular, in a particular death investigation, correct? But, I mean, they're not looking at anything to do physiology. Understood. But they're also looking at how other uh, factors may contribute to the death of an individual, right? I mean, they're basically yes looking... No, sir. Sorry? It's a yes or no, sir, so I'm objecting. Well, uh, uh, yes, partly. Okay. Yeah. They're looking at things beyond a nanosecond. Agreed? No, no I, I mean, I think in terms of a pathologist, they're looking at, at a nanosecond. They're looking at the nanosecond of death. Right. But they're taking into consideration things simply that, that extend beyond physiology, right? I mean, they're lo looking primarily at pathology. Right. So what causes the heart to stop? What causes <clears throat> the lungs to cease to function, etc. right? They're making an, an inference based on a pathological time point. Right. Considering a multitude of biological factors that are involved in the death of a person, right? 
I mean, it's the same as an, a, any physician is looking at a multitude of factors. So in terms, again, <clears throat> of your review, um, you would agree that the amount of time that you've spent looking at videos, analyzing these videos from different perspectives and angles is far greater than the length of this incident? Yes. Probably to the times a thousand. I can't. I, I really don't know. But, I mean, but it's, it's substantially longer than the incident. And ultimately, you conclude that Mr. Floyd uh, died as a, uh, what we would call a hypoxic death. He died of a low level of oxygen. Right. That there was a low level of oxygen that caused damage to the brain, which resulted in a pulseless electrical activity, correct? Not quite. How did you phrase it? That's um, he, he had a low level of oxygen that caused damage to the brain. The brain didn't cause the pulseless electrical alternates. The low level of oxygen caused both. The low level of oxygen caused the damage to the brain. The low level of oxygen separately caused the pulse's electrical alternates. So it's an example of how multiple processes are occurring simultaneously. Well, not really. It's just one process. It's a low level of oxygen that's doing both. That's having an effect on multiple, uh, multi the heart and the brain and the lungs, right? Uh, not really. It's just two. Okay. The brain and the heart. The brain and the heart. All right. Now you talked about, I think you called it the, is it the nuchal ligament? Did I yes. Miss, am I saying that correct? Correct. Yeah. Right. That's that space at the back of the neck that's mm -hmm. very, very hard, right? It's, it's not so much a space. I mean, it's a long bit, but it, it's roughly the palm of your hand. You stick the palm of your hand at the back of your neck. Right. And you're right over the nuchal ligament. Right. And that's, a, you said, a very, very hard surface, right? Yeah. Can withstand yeah. a great amount of pressure, right? Correct. And, uh, <clears throat> and so when we talk about the placement of the knee, there would be periods of time where Mr. Chauvin's knee was placed at that nuchal ligament, based on your Correct. observation of the yes. videos. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Sometimes that goes both ways. And you've had an opportunity to review the autopsy, correct? I did, yeah. Right. You understand um, that there was no bruising either atop the skin or under the, the skin surfaces that were noted by Dr. Baker? Yes, I'm aware. And you also are aware, uh, you talked quite a bit about the hypopharynx, right? Yes. And you're aware that the hypopharynx was photographed at autopsy and no injury was noted? I'm aware. Now, I found, I found it very interesting uh, in your testimony and your report when you're kind of talking about this notion of if you can't speak or if you can speak, it doesn't mean you can, or, sorry, I have to say, if you can speak, you can breathe, yeah. right? Um, and you describe this as a very dangerous proposition, right? Yes. yes. You describe this as causing a false sense of security to people, right? That's how Correct. you Correct. Yeah. And in fact, in your report, you actually uh, write a paragraph about how physicians oftentimes uh, have trouble with this, right? Yes. And so people who have, similar to yourself, attended medical school, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. You, sorry, you have to say yes. Yeah. I'm sorry, terribly sorry. No yeah. problem. Yes. Um, so, in, you know, intelligent men and women who've graduated from college, gone on to medical school, and... Uh, are engaged in the practice of medicine sometimes uh, have problems with this notion, right? Yes. They, a patient comes in and says that they're having trouble breathing, and oftentimes a physician will uh, not believe them, essentially. It's, it's important, Mr. Nelson, I, to make sure we're, we're talking about speech or difficulty in breathing, because they're different. Right. Well, you, you, you write in your report that some doctors incorrectly consider patients to be hysterical. Your Honor, may we approach? Uh, let's see this, Charles. Uh, Your Honor, the uh, re reference to the report is hearsay. It's not an evidence. It's not property. Overruled. Overruled. You wrote in your report that some doctors incorrectly consider patients hysterical and the symptoms yes. imaginary in nature, which further aggregates patient distress. Right? Yes. Yes, I recall. 
and you wrote that this view represents a physician's failure to understand the fundamental cause of a clinical disorder. Right, but I'm talking about a different thing there. That's hyperventilation syndrome. So somebody comes in... Which is in, very different than the difficulty with speech. They're, they're really apples and oranges. Okay. But if physicians, right, someone comes in and they're yep. hyperventilating and they articulate to their physician, yes. I can't breathe, yes. right? And it's hyperventilation syndrome, right? Yes. And physicians oftentimes, as you indicate, yes. confuse this issue. Correct. They blame the patient, right? Or I don't know if they blame the patient, but I mean, they, they certainly missed the diagnosis. And it's a <clears throat> kind of a, when we're talking about speaking and breathing simultaneously, yes. which is a different consideration. Um, if uh, a Minneapolis police lieutenant who trains police officers happened to have testified that that's a common statement in the course of treatment or in the course of training of Minneapolis police officers, you might take exception with that statement. I, I, I didn't follow your question. Uh, it's very hard to hear through that plexiglass. And, uh, and I'm losing my voice, I think. Excuse me. If a Minneapolis police officer, yeah. I'll try to talk closer to the mic. Mm -hmm. The Minneapolis police lieutenant who trains Minneapolis police officers testified that it is frequently said and trained to police officers that a person can talk, it means they can breathe. You would have a problem with that. You would yes, I mean, they're able to breathe at that moment in time, but 10 seconds later, they may be dead. Right. And because <clears throat> dealing with any person is a rapidly evolving situation that can change from second to second. Yes. Now, in terms of the calculations that you've made, um, you would agree that your calculations are generally theoretical, correct? No, they're not theoretical. I mean, they're based on direct measurements. They're based on extensive research. But you're making certain assumptions in the application of that science, are you not? Very few assumptions. You're assuming the weight of Mr. Chauvin. Right, I'm aware. So, I mean, obviously I'm aware that there's two different weights that are given. And you're assuming the weight of the uh, equipment that the officer wears. Yes. And you've not actually ever physically measured the weight of the equipment a police officer carries, correct? No. I mean, I, I took the, the measurements that are reported. And you're not actually weighing what Mr. <clears throat> Chauvin weighed on May 25th of 2020. No. And in your measurements, you're all, you, are, you appear to be, at least from my understanding, which is going to be limited, but from my understanding is that your measurements assumed an equal weight distribution between the right and the left legs. It, 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 yes, that, that's correct. All right. And so again, as we know, as things change and evolve and flow, that's, weight is pretty frequently redistributed, right? That is correct. And again, <clears throat> in terms of the uh, EELV. Am I yes. saying that right? The EELV? That's the... Can you and ask? expiratory lung volume. All right. You're also um, basing that, um, those calculations on the presumption that a person is a healthy individual, right? For the ELV, it's not going to change, really. But in terms of the normal respiratory rate, excuse me, some of the other uh, factors that you put into your analysis, it's all premised upon a healthy individual, right? right. It's ba based on a 46-year-old person of a particular height and sex, yes. Right. Uh, who's healthy. Correct. Right. Um, and so you would agree if biology can change rapidly, <laughs> uh, yeah. that the biological, uh, the specific biological conditions of Mr. Chauvin and or Mr. Floyd come into play, right? Correct. And those volumes or those 
figures that you've assessed in connection with this case, <clears throat> they are um, conditioned upon him being a healthy individual. Right. I mean, it, it varies in terms of the lungs. I mean, say, for example, compliance will vary, but end expiratory lung volume is pretty robust. It okay. just isn't going to vary. Okay, so some, of, but other factors, like you said, what was the first sentence? Lung compliance will vary from, from one person to the next person, but it, it varies di different segments within the lung. They're not all monolithic. Okay. Now, and you, you talked about one thing, in terms of, and this is a little bit of an aside, but in terms of your, uh, the prone position and yeah. the pushing of the stomach into the lungs, right? Yes. Um, the size of a person's stomach yes. has some bearing on that, right? It does. A person like myself who has a few extra inches, mm -hmm. if I'm prone, it's going to perhaps push further or harder up into my lungs, right? Yes. A person who is healthy, physical, uh, muscular, it's going to have less of an impact. That is correct. All right. But again, in terms of what we have learned about Mr. Floyd from his autopsy and his medical records, is that we understand that Mr. Floyd had some heart disease, right? That is correct. In fact, I believe uh, that he had uh, in some of his arteries somewhere between a 75 and 90 percent occlusion of his ventricular arteries, right? Correct. And that's going to affect blood flow. In a, in a person, right? It's going to make the body work a little harder to get the blood through the body. Not, no, not really. It's not going to do that. Okay. There's, how does that affect a person's respiratory? The, the coronary artery? Mm -hmm. If the coronary artery is affecting it, and if the coronary artery was contributing to shortness of breath, you would expect that he would be complaining of chest pain, and you would be expect that he would be demonstrating a very rapid respiratory rate. We don't see either. Okay. Um, and we'll come back to the res re res <laughs> respiration. Res I can't say it right. I'm, I'm taken by your accent. Uh, uh -huh. The resp uh -huh. respiratory I rate. I can't compensate for it. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, his, I'll say it like you, his respiratory rate. Okay. There you go. All right. We also, we also understand that Mr. Floyd, based on his medical records, has a history of hypertension or high blood pressure. Right? Yes, that's correct. Now, in terms of, uh, we also understand that Mr. Floyd had previously been diagnosed with COVID-19, right? Correct. And he may not be symptomatic, have been symptomatic on March 25th, but it's fair to say that um, a lot is unknown about the effects of COVID-19 on a person's lungs, long term. I mean, n not as much as it would appear to be the case. I mean, because obviously it's a viral illness. We have a, a huge amount of information about the long term effects of viral illnesses. And those can affect <clears throat> the elasticity of the lungs, right? Not the elasticity. It would be, if it's having any effect, it would be within the sensory receptors within the trachea bronchial tree. So it really wouldn't have anything to do with the elasticity. Okay. Now, but we also learned quite a bit about the toxicology as well. Oh, excuse me. On the COVID-19, you testified that um, treatment of people with COVID-19 includes leaving them in the prone position, right? Correct. And so those people who would be treated for COVID-19 in the prone position, based on your calculations, you would have a 24% decrease in the EELV. Right. I mean, the, this is people with COVID where they're during the time that they have COVID. Right. But right. You, that's yeah. what you'd expect, that same decrease in the EELV. No, it's going to be very different in somebody who has, say, pneumonia. What, what's going to happen in the prone position will be very variable from one person to the other as a result of the, of the pneumonia. It's different than normal lungs. Okay. So, so <clears throat> in essence, every person is different. Oh, for certain. And now, uh, you calculated uh, his respiratory rate to be 22, right? Correct. And you said that that was within the normal respiratory rate? Yep. 
and um, you would not describe him as hyperventilating. No, and the word hyperventilation is open to an awful lot of misinterpretation. That is most certainly not hyperventilation. No. And hyperventilation assists in the removal of carbon dioxide from the, from the body, right? It's confusing. It's not, it's not that simple. In its simplest terms. But in the simplest terms, yes, it does assist. It, it, it gets rid of carbon dioxide. But now, it can be frequently misleading. Okay. Now, in terms of the toxicology of Mr. Uh, Floyd, we did learn that um, there were some controlled substances in his system, right? Yes. Uh, we know that there was, for example, um, nicotine, right? Yes. Mr. Floyd was a smoker. Correct. And smoking changes the lung function, agreed? In some people. Now, we also learned uh, more, and, and I'm not suggesting that people who, all people who smoke have lung problems, right? L less than 10% do. 90% don't have any. Can I use back up a little bit from the microphone? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No problem. So, we, you focused in your direct examination quite a bit in terms of um, fentanyl and the fentanyl's effect on the res respiration rate. Yes. And you would agree generally that fentanyl uh, is a respiratory depressant. It can be. Right. Um, it, it's a it's a used in operating rooms, right? Yes. For yep. And it's also used in the management of chronic pain, right? That is correct. And medically speaking, those are really the only two reasons that fentanyl would be prescribed. Yes, probably. Um, <clears throat> But you understand that fentanyl has become far more prolific in street drugs, right? Yes, I'm aware. And there's a, you would agree generally that there is a significant difference between fentanyl that's manufactured according to the United States, you know, uh, their uh, whatever rules apply, right? The, the, the pharmaceutical companies make it much differently than the street dealers do, right? I, I imagine so. Right. Um, and so when you are, when a person is ingesting illicit street purchased fentanyl, it's, it's a, every time they take a fentanyl dose, it's a different experience for that person. Right, but it, if, if it's affecting the respiratory center, it's going to act through the mu receptors in the medulla oblongata. There's no way around that. Right. It's not, if fentanyl isn't going to have an effect on respiration by some other mechanism. Understood. But the end result of fentanyl can include Respir respiratory depression. Right, through the mu receptors. Right. And we also learned that there was methamphetamine in a low dose in Mr. Uh, Floyd's system, right? Correct. And the fentanyl and the methamphetamine, they can kind of counteract each other, right? Well, I mean, they're upper and downers, but I mean, but in terms of the respiratory centers, there is not going to be. So the methamphetamine would not, it, I mean, the methamphetamine is going to increase the heart rate, right? That's a different thing than the respiratory symptoms. Understood, yeah. but that's going to, methamphetamine will increase a person's heart rate, right? Yes. That's one of the side effects. Yes. And there are a few uh, lawfully, uh, there are a few conditions where a physician can lawfully prescribe methamphetamine, right? Yes. But it's exceedingly rare that it's actually done. I, mean, I can't say, but I mean, it, it's definitely a prescribable agent, kind of. It used to be used commonly for appetite suppressant. And uh, I think um, ADHD, is that yes. it? Yes. Right? Yes. Okay. So, <clears throat> we also know that adrenaline will increase the heart rate, right? Yes. And adrenaline can be put into the body in, <clears throat> in multiple ways, right? I, well, sure. let me let me. There are many things that can cause a surge in adrenaline. Yes. One of those things would be getting into a fight with someone. Yes. Or being afraid. Difficult to know in terms of being afraid, but getting into a fight. And the paraganglia, paraganglionoma, that was found. I understand you call it the 10% tumor, 
but in 10% of the tumor cases that can cause an adrenaline surge. Uh, yes, and in the 90% it won't. Now, <clears throat> in terms of the use of fentanyl in the hospital setting, surgical setting, uh, have you become familiar with a uh, what's called wooden chest syndrome? Yes, I have. And can you explain for the jury what wooden chest in, syndrome is? In some patients with fentanyl, you get an increase in chest wall stiffness. So the lungs become less elastic? Not quite the lungs, the chest wall. Okay. So that would prevent a, a chest wall tight or chest wall rigidity will also uh, decrease the performance of the lungs. It will imp impede the ability of the lungs to impact to expand. Now, <clears throat> in your report, you wrote that you would expect the peak respiratory depression to occur from fentanyl within five minutes of ingestion. Right. right. Yeah. And um, have you come to learn that uh, tablets were found or, or controlled substances were found in the back seat of squad 320? I mean, I've heard reports to that effect. I don't know what the, the status of it is. All right. So you were not, you've not been provided with any additional information since the time you've prepared your report? I, no, I, I'm sure that's wrong, but I, I've been provided with a lot of information. I don't necessarily recall, I keep it all sure. at, the, at the front of my brain. Okay. Well, <clears throat> yesterday we heard um, testimony from state crime lab that there were in the back seat of the squad car two partially consumed pills found in the back of squad 320. Objection, Your Honor, to the characterization of testimony. To the characterization of? I'll overrule the, if it's foundational to your question. It is. <clears throat> you understand that? No, it's a, okay. I kind of, but not fully. Yesterday, a chemist from the state crime lab okay. testified in this case. I'm not going to resist It's a stain. You can state in the form of a hypothetical, however. Uh, I'm sorry, Your Honor. Can we? I can't hear you. The sidebar. Let me ask <clears throat> let me ask you in the form of a hypothetical question. Okay? If partially ingested pills that were determined to contain uh, both fentanyl and methamphetamine were found partially ingested in the back seat of a squad of the squad car and that those pills had been <clears throat> had come had the DNA of the in, of the deceased individual on them, meaning that they took them, mm -hmm. and those pills would have been in his mouth at about two eighteen or twenty eighteen. Right? Mm -hmm. Is it fair to say that you would expect a peak fentanyl respiratory depression within about five minutes? Right. I mean, obviously, it would depend on how much of it was ingested. I mean, it, just finding the pills won't tell you anything about whether any of it was ingested or some of it or anything. But if, what, if there was any amount of it ingested, yes, the peak would be five minutes. Right. And so if it happened at 2018 or thereabouts when the individual was in the back of the car, mm -hmm. you would expect that peak respiratory depression to be around 2013, right? 20, I thought, 2023, I'm sorry. 
2018 to 2023 is You're fine. trying to really confuse me, Mr. Nelson. <laughs> I'm sorry. I think I can actually say it's been a long week now. Uh, so 2018 is the ingestion point. You would expect peak respiratory depression by 2023. Correct. Right? That's the peak, meaning that it could continue afterwards, right? Right. All right. You also described in your direct testimony um, what you have interpreted to, to be an anoxic seizure, right? Yes. At 2024. Correct. 24, 21. 20, 24. 21. 21. And that was in uh, what you uh, saw and what the jury was played was reflected in, in from Officer Lane's body camera, right? Correct. And it was the kick of the legs, right? Yes. And after that point, you can see Officer Lane hold the leg down, right? Yes. And you can see it kick up again, yes. right? Once again, turn on. Talk over each other. Sorry. A tendency to go fast. That's what you recognize based on your 46 years of being a pulmonologist and an intensivist and in your experience, right? right? I mean, obviously there was additional information from the hand, but I mean, but it, the, the leg was the key. Right. And <clears throat> would be reasonable for a police officer to interpret that same behavior as resistance. Objection, Your Honor. Foundation of witness to talk about what's reasonable for a police officer. Is there? Now, you testified that the last breath of Mr. Floyd was at 20, 25, 16, right? Correct. Prior to that point, to all people who were there and monitoring him, he would have appeared to have been breathing, right? I didn't, I, it's just hard for me to hear. Sorry, prior to that point, yeah. it would be uh, reasonable that he would appear to be breathing, right? Yes. And in fact, you showed us a segment where you could were able to count his respiratory rates. Yes. Right? And then you said that at 2035 and 06 seconds is when the first air was pumped back into him. Correct. All right. And you understand that paramedics arrived at 2027 20, and 45 seconds? Yes. And so the time between the, when the paramedics arrived and Mr. Uh, Floyd got his first air was roughly eight minutes, almost nine minutes. Yes. Right. And, and, yeah. and according to timelines, the drive to the hospital is about five minutes. I'm sorry, I didn't catch to that. Were you aware that the, t the drive to the hospital is about five minutes? I wasn't aware, but I have no reason to dispute it. And so between 20, 27, and 45 seconds when the EMTs first arrived and the time they got him to uh, have an air in his lungs, that was a crucial nine minutes. Yes. Uh, Your Honor, I have nothing further. Mr. Blackwell. Dr. Tobin, just a, a few questions, just for clarification's sake. Uh, you would just ask a lot of questions about science and medicine, changing, constantly changing, evolving by the nanosecond, by the millisecond. You heard all of that. Yes, I did. Um, I want to go to the period of time when Mr. Chauvin was on the back and neck of Mr. Floyd. Yes. Did you see uh, him get off of the back of Mr. Floyd by the nanosecond, by the millisecond, by any seconds in the nine minutes and 29 seconds that you saw him on. No, I did not. If you look at the five minutes and three seconds that you focused on, where, if you consider all the nanoseconds and milliseconds in the five minutes and three seconds, where was Mr. Chauvin the vast majority of that time? 
he was on Mr. Floyd's neck and uh, on his back and yeah. arm. Right, not constantly changing. No. Uh, now, you were asked questions about what injuries were noted on autopsy. Yes. And uh, I think a uh, reference was made there was no injury noted to the hypopharynx on autopsy. Correct. Does that make any difference to you whatsoever? None whatsoever. I wouldn't expect there to be anything found there and, and why at not? autopsy. Why not, Dr. Tolan? Because the effects on the hypopharynx are not something that is going to remain at the time of an autopsy. I mean, the type of changes that we see, say, in somebody with sleep apnea, that's not something you're going to see the following morning when you look at somebody. It's just not there. Well, there was also a reference made to the absence of bruising on the neck during autopsy. Yes. Does that make any difference to you whatsoever? No, because obviously I go to, whenever I go to church, I sit on a hard bench. I don't get bruising of my buttocks when I leave. So it, I wouldn't expect anything in terms of that. So if you have somebody, this was a static force. It's not, a, it's not as if somebody is jamming against it. So you wouldn't expect anything in the way of bruising. And scientifically, do you know of any correlation between the presence or absence of bruising on autopsy and the forces necessary to restrict breathing? No, they're totally different because it's in terms of static forces and dynamic. What about low oxygen? If somebody has, uh, suffers or dies from low oxygen, yes. does that show up on autopsy? No, it does not. And the fact that it doesn't, does that mean anything to you whatsoever? has no meaning. And why not? Because low oxygen is a functional thing, just like an arrhythmia is a functional thing. It doesn't, sh it doesn't leave a fingerprint on the autopsy. It's just there. It's something that happened. It's, uh, but it won't r leave any fingerprint afterwards. You don't see it. But does it mean that the person didn't die from low oxygen? No, absolutely not. So if you take a, a, somebody and you suffocate them with a pillow, and it's very clear to you after you suffocated the person and he's dead from the pillow, you're not going to see the effects of the low oxygen. Now, you were uh, asked quite a few questions about Mr. Floyd's pre-existing health conditions. Correct. And remember, he cited a number of those. Yes. Uh, do any of those conditions have anything to do with the cause of Mr. Floyd's death, in your professional opinion, whatsoever? None whatsoever. And uh, again, what was the cause such that those conditions don't matter? The cause of death is a low level of oxygen that caused the brain damage and caused the heart to stop. You were also asked questions about substances in Mr. Floyd's system. I think you were asked questions about nicotine. Remember that? Yes. He didn't die from nicotine, did he? <laughs> no. Uh, you were asked questions about fentanyl and meth. Yes. Uh, any evidence that he died from meth? No, none. Uh, you were asked questions about um, whether he had ingested any fentanyl within five minutes of his time of death. Yes. Now, I, I think you explained to us that if somebody is suffering from a fentanyl overdose, you would see a depression in the respiratory system. Yes. And, and depression means some reduction in the rate of ability to breathe. Correct. Did you see any depression in Mr. Floyd's ability to breathe whatsoever before he went unconscious? No, absolutely not. He was normal respiratory rate. Any evidence then that any fentanyl in his system depressed his breathing in any way whatsoever? No, and that's further borne out in the carbon dioxide. Right. Thank you, Dr. Tolton. No further okay. questions. Anything further? Uh, two very quick questions. In terms of the carbon dioxide level, um, you testified that it was at a 96? Yep. Sorry. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. I didn't catch you. You testified that the carbon dioxide was at a 96? I think it was 89. 89. It was also measured at 102. Do you it, well, that's the Vedas one, but not the arterial is the one you need to look at. All right. And in terms of um, the ingestion of, or, or just generally speaking, Fentanyl can also cause death as a result of low oxygen to the brain, right? But it would have to be low through respiratory depression. Right. The question is, fentanyl can also cause a death as a result of low oxygen. Well, your answer is yes, but only in part. Okay. Fair enough. Thanks.
Just Briefly. One. Just one. Mr. Nelson brought up again fentanyl as a cause of death. Yes. Uh, doctor, you're familiar with the way people die from fentanyl. Yes, very. Do they or do they not go into a coma before they die from a fentanyl overdose? Yes, they will. Was Mr. Floyd ever in a coma? No. Thank you, Dr. Tobin. Okay. Anything else? No. Thank you. Doctor, thank you so much. Thank uh, you. You are excused. Okay, thank you. Let's take a five minute break so we can all get our voices back.
Next witness, please. Swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony about to give be the truth, that nothing but the truth. I do. And if you wouldn't mind removing your mask for testimony, if you feel comfortable doing so. And let's begin by having you state your full name, spelling each of your names. Uh, my name is Daniel, D A N I E L, Eisenschmidt, I S E N S C H M I D. Ms. Aldridge. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Where do you work? I work at NMS Labs, Horsham, in, Pennsylvania. Did you say in Horsham, Pennsylvania? Yeah. How long have you been with NMS Labs? Oh, uh, since 2011. What do you do at NMS Labs? I am a forensic toxicologist at NMS. And did you have any other lab experience before joining NMS? Yes, I did. Uh, prior to joining NMS from 1994 to 2011, I was the chief toxicologist for the Wayne County, Michigan Medical Examiner's Office. And before that, I was at Southgate Medical Lab, so I was uh, the director of the toxicology. And prior to that, from 1982 to uh, 1991, I was at Maryland Medical Labs in Baltimore, Maryland, also during that period working at some time during the uh, I think it was from 86 to, 84 to 86 uh, at the medical examiner's office in uh, Baltimore as well. So rewinding a bit as well to your educational background, could you just describe for the jury what your educational background is? Sure. I have a bachelor's degree in biology from Adelphi University in Garden City, New York, uh, and that was uh, attained in 1982. Uh, then I have a master's degree in uh, forensic pathology with a con actually for pathology with a concentration in forensic toxicology, and that's from University of Maryland at Baltimore. Uh, that was in 1986, uh, uh, and then my PhD was from University of Maryland at Baltimore in forensic toxicology in 1991. Do you have any specialized certifications related to your work? I am board certified as a fellow from the American Board of Forensic Toxicology. And what are the requirements for that? So the requirements for that, uh, they've changed over the years, but for the fellow requirement, uh, you can apply to the board after three years after you have your PhD. Uh, they examine your credentials to see that you're active in the field of forensic toxicology. Um, if you have the right references and you're active in the field, they'll allow you to sit for an examination. And then if you pass the examination, uh, the board votes on your final certification. Um, after that, you have to do continuing education each year uh, and uh, attain a minimum number of continuing education credits. And then every five years, you have to reapply uh, to the board for reaccreditation. And have you gone through all those requirements and satisfied them successfully? Yes, I have. And are you up to date with all of those continuing education requirements as well? I am. I'm going to get back to sort of your role as a forensic toxicologist. Could you describe sort of your day-to-day -day job duties as a forensic toxicologist at NMS Labs? So my primary responsibility at NMS Labs is to do case review. And what that means is um, when toxicology tests are performed at NMS Labs, um, particularly ones that require many different kinds of tests to be done, uh, they wind up being reviewed by a toxicologist or a certifying scientist to look at them in, a, in the context of all the testing that was done. So individual tests are reviewed um, by analysts in the laboratory, uh, and they're secondary reviewed as well. But the final review comes to either a toxicologist or certifying scientist that looks at everything in the context of the entire case. And then in that capacity, is it part of your job duties to author reports and sign off on all that testing? Yes, it is. Approximately how many cases have you reviewed in that capacity as a forensic toxicologist? I review about seven to 8,000 cases per year. 
And in terms of the work that comes into NMS Labs, are there a variety of agencies that submit samples to NMS Labs for testing? Yes, we get samples from medical examiners and coroners. Uh, we get uh, samples from police agencies for DUI cases. And we also get uh, a lot of clinical samples from hospitals and referral laboratories. So in that capacity, does NMS receive both post-mortem or death-related samples as well as samples from living patients? Yes, we do. And NMS as a lab, uh, approximately how many tests or samples does NMS receive for testing each day? We receive about 12 to 1,300 uh, requisitions each day. And when you say requisitions, what uh, is that? It, it, would, it would mean uh, re requests for testing. It could be multiple samples on a requisition. So thousands of tests a year. Thousands of tests a, a day. Yeah. Tens of thousands of tests a year. <laughs> My math yeah. is bad. All right. Is NMS a, a licensed and accredited lab? It is. And does that include national accreditations as well? Uh, national and state accreditations. I'm going to turn to your work in this particular case. Did NMS Labs receive uh, some samples for testing from the Hennepin County Medical Examiner's Office related to George Floyd? We did. And were there a, a number of different samples that were received? Correct. What were the samples that were ultimately tested by NMS Labs? So the, we, we tested the samples that were requested by the Hennepin County Medical Examiner to be tested. So we tested um, samples that were labeled as hospital blood, and we also tested uh, urine that was collected at the autopsy. And in terms of the testing that was performed at NMS Labs, did, were those tests pursuant to standard operating procedures at the lab? Yes, they were. And that process was followed for all of those tests? Yes. Getting to the results from that testing, what were the notable findings from, from that testing? So the most notable findings in the hospital blood was uh, the presence of fentanyl at 11 nanograms per milliliter. And then the, the metabolite of fentanyl, the breakdown product of fentanyl, nor fentanyl, at a concentration of 5.6 nanograms per milliliter. In addition, we found methamphetamine at 19 nanograms per milliliter. So I'm going to talk about each of those substances one by one, and you indicated these were the results from the hospital blood in this case, is that right? That's correct. So let's start with uh, methamphetamine. What is methamphetamine? So methamphetamine is a central nervous system stimulant. Um, it can actually be prescribed, it rarely is, but it, it can be prescribed as, under the brand name Dizoxin, and it is used for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and also obesity. It was also experimentally used for treatment of narcolepsy. And uh, between 2016-2018, uh, there were about 10,000 prescriptions in the U.S. written for Dizoxin uh, that year, each year. So can methamphetamine be both a street-level recreational drug and also a prescription drug? It can. With respect to the results, the 19 nanograms per milliliter that you found of methamphetamine, uh, what, what significance, if any, is there to that amount? Well, that is actually approximately the amount that you would find in the blood in somebody that was given a, a single dose of methamphetamine as a prescribed drug. So when you say uh, you described the prescription drug form in which methamphetamine can, can be available, the results would be consistent with the prescription dose of that. Is that right? Yes, it could be. Um, would that be considered a low level of methamphetamine? Yes, very low. And you also talked about the fentanyl results of 11 nanograms per milliliter. First, what is fentanyl? So fentanyl is, is an a op op opioid an an analgesic. It's used uh, similar to morphine. Uh, it's much more potent than morphine. Um, it can be used to treat pain and also be a, an adjunct use uh, in surgery and uh, for uh, anesthesia. And you talked about opioids. Maybe you could just describe what an opioid is. So it, it's uh, opioids are actually include both natural uh, semi-synthetic and synthetic uh, drugs that are that act on the mu receptor which are where opioids act. Opiates 
are natural products uh, that are found in the poppy plants, such as morphine and codeine. So opi opiates are opioids, but not all opioids are opiates. So what are some examples of opioids? So fentanyl would be an example of an opioid. Would oxycodone also be an opioid? Yes, it would. And then you talked about similarities between opioids and opiates, is that right? Yes. And you mentioned morphine as, as an opiate? Yes. Is that heroin? So heroin is, a, is, a, is actually made from morphine, but uh, when heroin breaks down, it breaks down into a, a metabolite called 6-acetylmorphine, and then eventually to morphine. So heroin would break down into 6-acetylmorphine and morphine, is that right? Yes. Do opioids and opiates have similar effects? Yes. Getting back to the fentanyl level in this case, um, you mentioned it was 11 nanograms per milliliter. Can fentanyl levels vary widely uh, depending on an individual? Yes, they can. And, and why would that be? Uh, because of tolerance. And could you just explain how an individual's drug tolerance might affect uh, the impact a particular drug like an opioid or fentanyl might have on them? So, I mean, if, if a person becomes tolerant to a drug, you need to have more and more of the drug to get the desired effect. So with chronic use, to get the same feeling that you would at a given concentration of fentanyl, you need to take more to get that effect. And so if someone is regularly using opiates or opioids, would that individual then develop a tolerance to an opioid like fentanyl? Yes. All right. Now you also talked about norfentanyl. Could you just describe what norfentanyl is? So when the body gradually eliminates fentanyl, it breaks it down from fentanyl to norfentanyl. Uh, that's a gradual process that occurs over time. And uh, it's one of the ways the body uh, eliminates fentanyl. And you indicated that the amount of norfentanyl found in, this, in the hospital blood in this case was 5.6 nanograms per milliliter, is that right? Yes. And uh, what is significant about that amount of norfentanyl? Well, it shows that some of the fentanyl was metabolized to norfentanyl. It also could mean there was pre-existing norfentanyl with additional fentanyl given on top of that. But it basically shows that uh, when, we see, when we see very recent uh, deaths with fentanyl, we frequently see fentanyl with no norfentanyl whatsoever because after a very acute fentanyl intoxication, uh, the body doesn't have time to break it down. And you described when you see a fentanyl overdose, typically you may not see any norfentanyl or low levels of norfentanyl. Correct. In addition to those findings from the hospital blood, were there some other findings as well that were included in your report? There were. Um, there were some incidental findings. Um, I believe there was codeine, which was from smoking. Uh, there was uh, caffeine. There were there was evidence of prior marijuana use by the uh, presence of cannabinoids. Uh, I would have to look at the report to know. And would that refresh your recollection? Yes. If we could put on the screen just for the witness's uh, recollection, Exhibit 624, please. And then if we could uh, zoom in on the positive findings portion. All right, R referring to your report now, um, could you describe the other findings with respect to this case? Yeah, so the additional finding was uh, a, a compound called 4-ANPP. That is actually a precursor to uh, uh, fentanyl manufacturing, but it is also a metabolite of fentanyl. It's not pharmacologically significant, and that's probably mostly inactive but uh, it was measured as part of some additional testing that was requested by the Hennepin County Medical Examiner. And then in the urine findings, we had presumptive positive findings uh, not confirmed for cannabinoids, amphetamines, and fentanyl. Those were not confirmed because they were present in the blood, so that uh, follows that. And then we also had findings for opiates in the urine, and we were asked to confirm those, and we found a concentration of morphine in the urine of 86 nanograms per milliliter. Apologies. Um, sorry, you were saying that you found morphine in the urine of 86 nanograms per milliliter. Is that right? Correct. And was that morphine found in the blood? No, it was not. 
And can fi a finding of morphine in the urine be indicative of a prior use in advance of a time of death? Yes, I, I can. You can you can see uh, morphine in the urine for several days, uh, depending on the dose and, and prior use pattern. And again, is that because it shows up in, in urine longer than, than blood? Yes. So you have tested both hospital blood as well as the urine. You described the findings in the urine with respect to morphine. Um, you are also discussing the 4A and PP finding in the hospital blood. Um, with respect to the other findings in your report, can you just sort of summarize what they were and whether they were significant at all? So uh, I think I mentioned so there was caffeine, uh, which is present in many of us, and uh, cotinine, which is uh, present as a metabolite of nicotine from uh, smoking, and uh, then, then cannabinoids. There was uh, delta-9 THC at 2.9 nanograms per milliliter, and its breakdown product, 11-hydroxy delta-9 THC at 1.2 nanograms per milliliter, and then the inactive uh, delta-9 carboxy THC at 42 nanograms per milliliter. And when it comes to these THC findings or related uh, THC findings relating to cannabinoids, what if any impact does that have? It, it's very hard to interpret those, um, given the nature of, of the samples and also uh, what happens with, uh, with with cannabinoids because they go into the fat, so they can be released slowly with time. And uh, certainly, you know, anything like CPR or something like that is potentially going to release THC from the fat. So uh, it doesn't really mean a whole lot other than cannabinoids we use at some point in time. So they can be, remain in the system and be detected for an extended period of time. Yes. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Uh, we can take that down. Thank you. Now, as part of your testing process at, at NMS Labs, were there also some metabolites or other substances that were d detected as part of the testing but below your lab's reporting limits? So we, we did find substances that were below the threshold to report, um, and that is why they're not on the report. Uh, but they are in part of the data package that was requested, uh, and uh, you know one, one can see those there. And do you keep those litigation packages or that data as part of your standard operating procedures or the course of business at NMS Labs? So the, all of the data is part of the course of business. The litigation package is actually pulled from that data on request, but yes. So as part of your testing, the lab's testing of the samples in this case, I'd like to ask about the testing process for methamphetamine and whether there were um, findings of amphetamine. Sure. So um, the, when we had a positive, w w the screen was positive for methamphetamine by a, a method called LC time of flight mass spectrometry. And anything that's positive above a certain threshold by that procedure is then confirmed by an alternate procedure. Uh, in this case, methamphetamine was positive on a screen and we ran the confirmation test uh, for amphetamines. Uh, the, metham the amphetamines confirmation test actually consists of 10 compounds, but uh, we're only interested in the target compounds that we are actually confirming in, in this case. So in this case, we did detect uh, methamphetamine, and because it's a metabolite of methamphetamine, there was evidence of amphetamine, but it was below the reporting limit, so it was not reported. And you indicated that amphetamine is a metabolite of methamphetamine, is that right? Correct. And does that mean then that the body breaks down methamphetamine into amphetamine over time? Yes, it does. In addition to um, confirming the presence of amphetamine, was there also an indication on initial testing of buprenorphine? There was an indication on the LC time of flight screen. But because it was below the reporting limit, uh, it was not confirmed, so it's merely an indication. And when you say indication, that just means it didn't go through that second step of the process, Correct. is that right? What is buprenorphine? Uh, buprenorphine is a, a, a drug that's prescribed, uh, it's called Suboxone, um, and it's typically prescribed for opioid agonist therapy for people that are going through uh, opiate treatment. And are the components of Suboxone both buprenorphine but also naloxone? Yes. And is naloxone essentially generic Narcan? Yes. Getting back to the blood that was tested in this case, you indicated that it was uh, hospital blood, is that right? That's correct. What's significant about using hospital blood for testing? Well, hospital blood is, is, 
if it's if it's anti-mortem blood it is more representative of what is actually circulating in the body prior to the time of death um, after death uh, there are changes that occur with drug concentrations particularly in in central blood such as blood collected from the heart uh, and that's a phenomenon is known as post-mortem redistribution, where drugs go from areas of higher concentration to a lesser concentration. That is less of an issue with um, peripheral blood sa samples, such as femoral blood, but it can still occur. So uh, it, it's ideally, you would want to try to get a sample as close to the time of death as possible. And if a blood sample is taken after death or after extensive CPR, uh, on a patient, can there be some postmortem redistribution? I, I think that's possible. Um, there's a lot you don't know, but um, it certainly is possible. And if it does, it tends to increase concentrations. And when you say increase concentrations, does that mean that the level might show higher than it actually was at the time of death? Correct. What about hemolysis? What's hemolysis? Hemolysis is the breakdown of a red blood cell. And does that, or did it have any impact on the testing in this case? No, I mean, that would have an impact on certain clinical chemistry tests, like potassium, which is stored in red blood cells. But uh, when you analyze a, a blood sample for t uh, drugs, you're analyzing the whole sample, so it would have no effect. So you mentioned that NMS Labs uh, receives thousands of samples a day, tens of th thousands of samples a year. Um, did you review and compile some data from the year 2020 with respect to NMS's fentanyl cases and methamphetamine cases? I did. And would those help you to contextualize the results in this case? Sure. And Your Honor, I would offer for demonstrative purposes Exhibit 920. Any objection for demonstrative purposes? <clears throat> I'm sorry, Your Honor. Exhibit number? 920. 920 is received for demonstrative purposes only, which means members of the jury won't go back with you for deliberation, but it'll be received for to illustrate the witness's testimony. And if we could publish. Thank you, Your Honor. All right, Dr. Eisenschmidt, um, I'm going to have you describe uh, what's shown on this screen. So as of right now, we're, we're looking at what happens when uh, fentanyl is metabolized over time to norfentanyl. So gradually, the amount of fentanyl starts to decrease and the norfentanyl starts to increase. And that's what happens as the body metabolizes fentanyl, is that, that right? That is correct. Next slide, please. And could you describe what's shown here, please? So this is data from NMS Labs from uh, year 2000. And we looked at the fentanyl concentrations in postmortem cases, specifically in those, and only those, that were collected in uh, peripheral blood. Uh, again, for the reasons I mentioned before, uh, central blood, like cardiac blood, can have a significant postmortem redistribution. So we wanted to have look at samples that have a minimal amount of that. Uh, I think you indicated the year 2000. Is this data from 2020? Oh, sorry, 2020, my mistake. Okay. Uh, so this is from the year 2020. And we had 19,185 cases that we looked at. And in the peripheral blood in these postmortem cases, the mean uh, fentanyl concentration, average fentanyl concentration was 16.8 uh, nanograms per milliliter. And the median concentration was 10, median being 50% uh, above and 50% below. And with respect to peripheral blood, you indicated that you chose the samples that would have minimal postmortem redistribution. Is that right? Correct. And why is that com in comparison to this case? 
Uh, because because this, the sample that we had of hospital blood is is probably going to have less issues with postmortem redistribution than we would have had had it been postmortem blood. And then these cases that are um, represented <coughs> as postmortem cases are these cases that you would be getting from ME's offices or coroner's offices. Correct. And where the individual would be deceased or dead. Correct. Okay. So we also looked at the norfentanyl concentrations, and those were 6.01 as a mean, and the median down at 2.2 nanograms per milliliter. So just to clarify, with respect to these postmortem cases, the average level of fentanyl was 16.8 nanograms per milliliter, and the average level of norfentanyl was 6.01 nanograms per milliliter. Is that right? Correct. Next slide, please. What's shown here? So this, this slide uh, shows uh, some postmortem cases with no norfentanyl, uh, again, for the year 2020. So out of those 19,185 cases, we had 15,455 that included fentanyl and norfentanyl, but there were 3,724 cases with uh, no norfentanyl. Uh, there were six that were exceptions to that for uh, reasons of testing purposes. But uh, th those are ones that were only fentanyl, but no norfentanyl. So does this slide indicate that there was a significant number, this 3,724 cases, where there was fentanyl found, but no norfentanyl at all? Correct. All right, next slide, please. What's shown here? So this is uh, switching gears. This is, we're looking at uh, the DUI, driving under the influence fentanyl concentrations uh, that we found in 2020. So these are blood samples that are sent to NMS labs uh, for, for people that were suspected of driving uh, under the influence of uh, drugs uh, or p potential other reasons of the uh, way they were driving. And uh, in this case, we um, tested, uh, we had 2,345 cases uh, that were individuals that were alive that had fentanyl on board. Of course, other drugs may also be present, but this was specifically looking at fentanyl. And we had a mean concentration of 9.5 nanograms per milliliter, a median of 5.3, and then for norfentanyl, a mean of 5.42 and a median of 2.2. And again, just to clarify, for these 2,345 cases, those individuals were alive, is that right? Correct. And you indicated the average fentanyl level, I believe, is 9.59 nanograms per milliliter. Is that right? Yes. And the average norfentanyl level for those cases was 5.42 nanograms per milliliter. Is that yes. right? Next slide, please. And what's shown here? So this is just a breakdown of the fentanyl concentrations we found in, in drivers that were alive. So the, the, almost the majority of them were under five nanograms per milliliter of fentanyl. Um, and then we had another 26.3% that were between 5.1 and 10 nanograms per milliliter. And then the next set of data was, uh, we had 216 cases which were uh, between 11 and 15 nanograms per mil. So that would be in the same area of Mr. Floyd's level of 11 nanograms per milliliter. And then we had several, uh, quite a few cases that were even greater than that. Uh, we had uh, 109 that were between 16 and 20, 81 that were between 21 and 26, 133 between 26 and 50, and then we actually had 53 cases uh, in living subjects where the fentanyl was greater than 50 nanograms per milliliter. So comparing Mr. Floyd's level to the driving population where individuals were alive, um, his level was within a quarter of the pie of the DUI cases that, that NMS Labs has received, is that right? Right, he would, he would be right in there with about the uh, 80th percentile. And you indicated that those levels um, for drivers were found in 53 cases higher than 50 nanograms per milliliter, is that right? Correct. So those individuals were alive and essentially driving at that time. Yes, pretty amazing. All right. Next slide, please. And what's shown here? So this uh, is uh, uh, basically the postmortem concentrations uh, or samples that were hospital blood samples that were submitted by Mr. Floyd for Mr. Floyd, and we found fentanyl at a 11 nanograms per milliliter and norfentanyl at 5.6 nanograms per milliliter. Next slide, please.
So this slide shows uh, what the ratio of the parent drug to the metabolite is. So 11 nanograms per mil divided by 5.6, the norfentanil gave Mr. Floyd a ratio of fentanyl norfentanil of 1.96. And essentially, does this slide show just the way in which you would calculate the fentanyl to norfentanil ratio? Yes. Next slide, please. What's shown on this slide? So this uh, slide shows uh, the ratios of fentanyl levels between 9 and 13 nanograms per milliliter. Uh, so that range was chosen because uh, Mr. Floyd's fentanyl concentration was 11 nanograms per milliliter. And when we do uh, driving under the influence work, we actually assign an uncertainty of measurement to that result. So if you, a driver had an 11 nanogram per mil fentanyl uh, present, we would report that as 11 nanograms per mil plus or minus 2 nanograms per milliliter. So I did this to, to see, well, what kind of ratios do we see between postmortem and DUI cases when the fentanyl level is between 9 and 13 nanograms per mil? What kind of ratio do we see? And uh, we can see in the postmortem cases, the mean ratio of fentanyl to norfentanyl was 9.05 with a median of 5.88 versus the DUI population where the mean was 3.2, median 2.24. And then just to clarify, in the bar that shows the postmortem cases, were there 3,088 cases that you looked at between the range of 9 to 13 nanograms per milliliter? Yes, between 9 and 13 nanograms per milliliter. And the ratio in the postmortem cases was 9.05 on average, is that right? Correct. And then with respect to the DUI cases, you were looking at 275 cases between the range of 9 and 13 nanograms per milliliter, is that right? That's correct. And so the average ratio within that group was 3.20, is that correct? Yes. How does Mr. Floyd's ratio compare to that data set? So Mr. Floyd's ratio is, is roughly just a little bit below the median ratio in DUI. So in postmortem cases, we know uh, fentanyl concentrations can be much higher than norfentanyl concentrations uh, because frequently these are, the, uh, these are deaths due to fentanyl. Other drugs may be present, and there could be other reasons for the death. It doesn't say that these are all fentanyl intoxications. But just looking at it as a whole, with a large amount of data, this is what we observed. And we know with the DUI population, they are alive, but other drugs may be present as well. So it's really just to sort of look at how things look differently in the, in the living and the postmortem population. And does this slide also show that Mr. Floyd's ratio was below the average and even below the median for that found in DUI cases? Yes. All right, next slide, please. So th this slide is actually just a sort of a summary of the previous slide, uh, but it basically shows um, the relationship between fentanyl and norfentanyl between the postmortem DUI cases and Mr. Floyd's. And again, does it show how norfentanyl levels essentially increase over time in relation to the fentanyl levels? As, as one lives and me metabolizes fentanyl, yes. Next slide, please. Now, did you also look at data with respect to methamphetamine for 2020 at NMS Labs? We did. And what's shown on this slide that's up right now? So this slide shows uh, the concentration of the methamphetamine found in uh, Mr. Floyd's hospital sample. Uh, it was 19 nanograms per milliliter. And then, uh, as we talked about earlier, um, amphetamine was below the reporting limit, so it was not reported. Not reported, but detected as part of your confirmation process. You can see it, you can see it in the confirmation data, yes. Next slide, please. And what's shown here? So um, this slide shows DUI uh, methamphetamine cases uh, with, with, with amphetamine and without amphetamine as a metabolite. So we had 3,271 cases that um, had methamphetamine in our driving under the influence population. 2,975 of these included amphetamine, and then uh, uh, 296 were just uh, methamphetamine with no amphetamine. And again, when we're talking about the DUI population, these are individuals, this 3,271 uh, number, individuals who are alive, is that right? Correct. Next slide, please. What's shown here? 
So this, this is a further breakdown of um, what we see in our DUI methamphetamine cases. So the mean methamphetamine concentration in all of our DUI cases was 378 nanograms per milliliter of methamphetamine. Uh, the median was 240 nanograms per milliliter. Uh, and in the 5 to 20 nanogram per mil range, with 5 being our lowest limit of quantitation, uh, we had 192 cases between 5 and 20 nanograms per milliliter, which is in that range that Mr. Floyd's methamphetamine was. And does this uh, graphic also show Mr. Floyd's level of 19 nanograms per milliliter? Yes, it does. It it's, uh, shows on the bottom. And again, 94% uh, of the DUI cases that we tested had methamphetamine concentrations in excess of 20 nanograms per milliliter. So in essence, Mr. Floyd's level was within the bottom, 5.9%, is that right? Correct. Next slide, please. And what's shown here? So this is just a further breakdown of what kind of methamphetamine concentrations we have observed in drivers uh, in the last, uh, in 2020. And again, other drugs may be present. Um, but uh, in this case, we had 196 cases between 5 and 20. 306 between 21 and 50, 399 between 50 and 100, 571 between 101 and 200, 1,010 between 201 and 500, 578 between 501 and 1,000, and then an additional 215 cases that methamphetamine was greater than 1,000 nanograms per milliliter. So again, you had 215 cases where the number was greater than 1,000 nanograms per milliliter, is that right? Correct. And the biggest piece of the pie, the 30.9% of the cases were between 201 and 500 nanograms per milliliter. Is that right? Yes. So Mr. Floyd's level of 90 nanograms per milliliter, that was exceptionally low. Is that right? In relationship to the DUI driving population, yes. Nothing further, Your Honor. Yeah. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. <clears throat> All right. Um, it's a little unusual for you to be testifying in a death case, is not? Uh, not terribly. I mean, I do work with medical examiner and coroners a, a lot, um, but they typically are the ones that testify as to cause a manner of death. Um, Usually, if I'm involved in a death case, it's, it's usually uh, drug delivery resulting in death. Okay. And so in the, you, you work in a laboratory that works with medical examiners <clears throat> from around the country, right? Correct. And you perform these services um, in, a, in a variety of different contexts. Agreed? Yes. So you testify that some are you know, clinical in nature, some tests are clinical in nature, some are law enforcement in nature and some are death related, right? Correct. All right. And um, you, at the time you became involved in this case, you were obviously aware of the significance of this case, right? Yes. And um, your laboratory goes through uh, an accreditation process, correct? We do. And part of the accreditation process is to have, to establish standards and reporting thresholds, right? Yes. And so the reason a laboratory will have those thresholds is to be consistent in how toxicology is reported to various individuals, right? Correct. And so um, one of those uh, accreditation standards is actually to have and set this threshold that if a, if a particular chemical component is below that threshold, you would suggest not reported, right? Or you would say it's not reported. So there are instances where our, a medical examiner might ask us if something was present below a threshold. Um, and depending on what the situation is, it could be potentially reported as such. It's not common practice. Uh, in this case, we didn't do that. It's not common practice to, to report 
uh, things that are below or chemical components below the threshold because it's contrary to the accreditation standards. Agreed? So it, it does depend on the situation, but by and large, if you if it's when you there's a reason we have cutoffs, and if we go below those, um, it, it 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 basically is not something we typically would do. Right. Um, and um, so a, a, an analyst who comes in hypothetically and may see certain markers that have an indication that something is present but refuses to acknowledge its presence, that would be because of those accreditation and accreditation standards, right? I'm not quite sure I understand the question. Hypothet hypothetically speaking, if an analyst from, say, the state crime lab comes in and a question is presented to her about the presence of a particular substance, but that substance was below the reporting thresholds. I'm going to object, Your Honor. Testimony outside the scope, characterizing it. It's a hypothetical. Overall. And that analyst refuses to acknowledge uh, refuses to acknowledge the possibility of the presence, right? That would theoretically or hypothetically be because of those uh, threshold rules. So I, I, I really can't speak to what is done in a crime lab because I don't work in that area. So for me, it's, it's really limited to um, toxicology and, and the anal an analysis of you know, biological samples like blood or urine. So, in other words, the the reason we have these thresholds is so that we set the rules, right? So uh, the the reasons these thresholds were actually established it has to do with with the original validation of the method. Uh, we, the the, lab the thresholds are not set because of any standard that says this is what you have to use as a threshold. The laboratory establishes those and then writes SOPs in, in accordance with their validation for the procedure. SOPs being standard operating procedures. Yes. And so um, if the laboratory sets this standard and says here's the standard and then does something in contravention or reports something that is against that standard, that would be a violation of the standard operating practice, right? If, if it were reported without any explanation, yes. Okay. Um, so just a few kind of follow-up questions to your, your testimony. Uh, you've met with uh, or spoken with members of the prosecution team several times, right? Yes. And, including February 26th, March 5th, March 12th, April 5th, and April 6th? That sounds right. I don't know the exact dates. Understood. Uh, you wouldn't disagree with me if I told you those were the dates. I wouldn't. And uh, I was provided with meeting notes and summaries of your conversations, right? Yes. All right. So I just want to make sure that I understand and the jury understands the difference between fentanyl and norfentanyl, okay? Okay. F you would agree that fentanyl is <clears throat> the active ingredient or when you, when you report the fentanyl concentration, it's the active ingredient, right? Yes. Now, when a person ingests any, essentially any substance, controlled substance, doesn't have to be an illegal drug, the body metabolizes that, correct? Yes. And then the body eliminates that, right? Yes. Through the natural processes of the body. Yes. Right? And the elimination of the substance results in what's called a metabolite, agreed? Yes. And so fentanyl being the active ingredient, Norfentanyl is the metabolite or the breakdown, correct? Yes. And included in this particular case, you uh, discovered a fentanyl concentration of 11 nanograms per milliliter, right? Yes. And a norfentanyl uh, level of 5.6? Yes. Um, <clears throat> now, you testified on direct examination that that could be one of two scenarios occurring there, right? Yes. One scenario is that a person took a certain amount of a controlled sub of fentanyl and enough time had passed to eliminate that, correct? Correct. Or to break it down and have that metabolite right. being present. That's one scenario, right? 
The other scenario, as I understand it, is someone took some, that initial dose began to break down, and then the person took more, that, and so the active ingredient is there, but it had not yet broken down, right? Correct. So it's sort of either, and you describe it, I think, as an acute uh, ingestion or a non-acute ingestion? Is so, uh, I, you know, a person, you, when you have fentanyl, fentanyl will break down to norfentanyl, and, but you could still take more fentanyl. So you could still take fentanyl while the first fentanyl was breaking down. Right. Um, so uh, to put it into context of people who may consume alcohol, right? I have a beer. I, my alcohol concentration is going to rise to a certain level, right? Whatever based on the alcohol concentration. Agreed? Yes. And my body will essentially ab immediately begin to decrease and eliminate the alcohol, right? Correct. But if I have a second beer, I'm adding more alcohol, causing my blood alcohol concentration to rise. Correct? Yes. And that's similar with all substances, including fentanyl. In general, yes. I mean, so alcohol is eliminated at a fixed rate over, over time. You can, there's only so much you can eliminate with time. With drugs, some drugs, it's a little different. But Some drugs may be faster, some may right. take longer, right? right? And when you describe the results in this particular case, you're talking about, um, um, I'll strike that, sorry. So there's, from based on a strict interpretation of these test results, there's no way to determine at what point any particular amount of fentanyl was ingested. Agreed? I would agree with that. Now, fentanyl, again, uh, being a toxicologist, is uh, a lawfully manufactured controlled substance in the United States, right? It can be prescribed uh, as a fentanyl patch. It can be a lollipop. It can be used in surgery. So there's different forms right. lawfully prescribed. And the, the fentanyl that is contained in a patch or a lollipop or that an anesthesiologist may administer is in a very controlled and known manner, right? Yes. Now, when we're talking about the illicit uh, street drugs that involve or include fentanyl, you have really no way of knowing what the particular fentanyl concentration is literally from pill to pill, agreed? Correct. And so every single pill you take, it becomes a unique experience for the person, right? That's true. And so regardless of whether you have a tolerance or a non-tolerance, any single incident could cause an adverse reaction. Well, sure. If, if you uh, suddenly had a pill that was 10 times the amount of fentanyl than another one, then yes. And you just you have no idea, right? You, you don't know from pill to pill, true. Right, because they're not manufactured in a controlled environment. Yes. <clears throat> Uh, now, in terms of, you understand that there were some pills found on a floor of the squad car? That's my understanding, yes. And those pills um, were tested and contained the DNA of George Floyd, right? I heard that, yes. And uh, <clears throat> presumably those pills were not in there prior to Mr. Floyd being in the squad car, right? I assume not, yes. And so you understand that as those pills were tested, those pills were at least appeared to be partially ingested or partially dissolved. Okay. And so there would be evidence of an acute ingestion of fentanyl and or methamphetamine at the time Mr. Floyd was in the backseat of the squad car. Let's do one objection. Which one would you like? Speculation is sustained. Sustained. Are you familiar with the uh, term hooping? Hoop. You can answer if you know. I don't. Now, in terms of your slideshow, and I don't have an electronic copy of it. Just, 
some follow-up questions on some of your slides. You reviewed in uh, 2020 a total of 19,185 fatal overdose cases, right? Uh, no, they're not, it's just, they're not necessarily fatal overdoses. They, they were cases that were from medical examiners um, it, it, we found fentanyl in a peripheral blood sample, but they could have been homicides, they could have been other drugs involved, right. so they, they were just basically random fentanyl concentration. Gotcha. So <clears throat> someone may have been shot as a part of the, and, and killed as a result of a gunshot, but as a result of the autopsy process, they collected the blood and analyzed the blood as a part of the normal autopsy process, right? Correct. So the cause or manner of death being, you know, gunshot wound, homicide, but we still look at <clears throat> the um, blood, yes. right? Okay. And it was a total of 19,185, right? Correct, per so, peripheral blood samples. So when the slide says 19,185, fatal overdose cases, you're not suggesting, it's a little somewhat misleading, I think, to me, because you're suggesting it's a fatal overdose case. I didn't think it said that. Well, we can, we can. If it did, I mean, I, that was something I corrected uh, on the other, the other day, and I said that that's not correct. Okay. So just, this is. And I apologize for the writing where it says fatal overdose cases. That's not correct. Here's the jury, we're gonna take our 20 minute uh, recess. We're gonna do a little work in the break, but uh, we'll give you 20 minutes, thanks. Any light to shed on this? What's going on? Yes, sir. Uh, <clears throat> I received a bait stamp 49606, and apparently, I mean, and I printed it, and I started working on my preparation. Apparently, at some point, I received an updated copy of this same presentation, and uh, it's 49623. So it's like, 17 pages later and I'm just trying to verify when I received that because I was using this as preparation this was all last night Fair enough.
Somebody stop it. Somebody stop it. So I understand what Mr. Nelson has was an earlier version. Witnesses and updated them. You show it to the jury during direct the updated version. Who has both? Mr. Nelson. No, I'm asking you, you showed the updated version to the jury. That's correct. All right. When was the updated version sent to Mr. Nelson? I would expect the same day that the original version was, which was my best guess was to April 6th, but I, I would have to confirm. April 6th? So this Tuesday? Correct, Your Honor. It was within the same day that the other slides were sent. They just needed updates. Well, I'll tell you what. Let's uh, take our break and... Uh, Let's nail it down specifically, but I think we can hardly, there's a lot of moving parts. I don't think anybody's at, I think you can just acknowledge that this is what you, without showing it again, that you received an earlier version that's been updated. And, and, and that's fine, Your Honor. I mean, part of the problem that we're experiencing here is I'm getting these things in PD, many of these items in PDF format, right? I, you know, some of them I'm getting electronically from, there's so many moving, there's so many people involved here uh, that I'm getting things in different formats. So if I can have a second to speak with Ms. Voss. Yeah, I guess it just seems like there's a good faith passing in the night of different versions and nobody should be criticized or, again, let's just tell the jury this is the latest one and this is what it is. And that's perfectly fine, Your Honor, and I am happy to provide an extra copy. We are happy to provide and republish the slides that were presented to the jury, but I do want to make sure that we're not showing the jury inaccurate information. April 6th, and I must have looked and just assumed it was a second copy of the same thing. Let's just clean it up when the jury comes back. Tell them that uh, you are relying on an earlier version. The the uh, amended version is the one that the witness uh, showed during direct examination, and leave it at that. And perhaps it would help if I could get a copy of that. <laughs> okay, we're done during until we're done with the break. Let's uh, reconvene at the. Uh, where are we at now? About 2.40 or 3.40? 3.40. Thank you.
the reminder is still on your Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. <coughs> Thank you, Judge. Uh, I apologize. I was working from a previous copy of your uh, presentation. Uh, but nevertheless, I want to show you, uh, ask you a few follow-up questions on this presentation. In terms of the post-mortem fentanyl concentrations that your lab uh, looked at uh, in 2020, you looked at a total of 19,185 cases, correct? We actually looked at a lot more than that, but I specifically chose a subgroup that was peripheral blood because the end cardiac blood inflates things. And I wanted to try to do something that represents most accurately what might be found in a, in a, in a living subject. Okay. So you were looking and focused specifically on the uh, concentrations in the most equivalent uh, type of blood sample that was taken. To the extent that you can do that, yes. Right. But in those 19,185 cases then, not all of them represent a fatal overdose, correct? That is correct. And so of the 19,185 cases, do you know the number of cases that would be attributed to overdose specifically? Unfortunately, we don't because we don't get the history on a lot of the cases or the, what the outcome was or even in context. So you, you can't <clears throat> determine which of these cases included something like a gunshot or included something like a heart attack or something else uh, that would cause the death, right? That's correct. These are simply blood samples, right? Correct. And when you look at these blood samples, you say the mean level of these samples was 16.8 nanograms per milliliter, right? Yes. And when we say the mean level, you're talking the average, yes. right? So if you take up all of the 19,185 cases, add up their uh, levels and divide them by the number of cases, that's the average, right? Correct. And the median being 10 nanograms per milliliter, yes. right? Meaning that's just 50% of the cases have higher fentanyl levels and 50% have lower, right? Yes. And again, we can't differentiate what the actual cause or manner of death was in any one of these cases, right? That's correct. <clears throat> now, in terms of the uh, 19,185 cases, when you're looking at the inclusion of norfentanil versus the exclusion, uh, the vast majority of those cases included norfentanil, right? They did. 15,455 of the 19,185 cases. That is correct. Now, when, when you look at the DUI concentrations, obviously people are, this is a little bit of a different uh, type of a situation, right? People are alive. Yes. They're driving a motor vehicle, right? Yes. Presumably. Or, or sleeping in one. <laughs> right, I suppose. Uh, <clears throat> and here again, there were 2,345 DUI cases, right? Yes. The average uh, level was 9.59. Right? Yes. And the median level was 5.3. So 50% above 5.3, 50% below. Correct. Uh, nevertheless, they were all arrested for DUI, right? Well, again, I, as I mentioned, other drugs may be present. So we, this is just looking at fentanyl. And so what we're really doing is we're trying to isolate and create some form of a comparison of Mr. Floyd's fentanyl levels and his norfentanyl levels to some sample of population, right? Correct. One sample of population we know is alive, right? Because they're driving a car. And the other sample, we have no frame of reference. Did they die from fentanyl overdose or did they die from some other reason? We have no context. That's correct. All we know is they're deceased. <clears throat>
uh, in terms of uh, when we look at the ratio of fentanyl levels between 9 and 13 nanograms, right? Of the 19,185 post-mortem cases, 3,088 of those cases had a, again, a uh, similar fentanyl concentration to Mr. Floyd, right? Yes. Again, of the 3,088 cases within that range, we have no frame of reference or no context as to what percentage of those people died from fentanyl overdose versus some other cause or manner of death. That is true. The only thing we have is a similar concentration. All right. And so <clears throat> statistically, kind of speaking, uh, it's fair to say that some of the 3,088 people in that category died of fentanyl overdose. Yes. And some percentage died of some other cause. Yes. And again, in terms of the um, amphetamine, amphet the methamphetamine and the, and the amphetamine, methamphetamine and fentanyl, would you, do you find that to be an unusual mixture of controlled substances? So I'm not very familiar with what combinations are being seen with, with street drugs. So we see a variety of controlled substances. We tend to see fentanyl more with cocaine or heroin than with methamphetamine, but that's just what I see. Um, but I can't speak to what is it regionally being observed. Have you heard of the phrase goofball or, or speedball? I've heard of speedball, yes. Okay, but not, so speedball usually being in, uh, like a fentanyl and opiate and uh, cocaine, right? Yeah, it used to be heroin and cocaine. Heroin and cocaine, I'm sorry. And, um, but you've never heard the term goofball? No. Okay. Now in, again, this particular case, your lab also tested the pills that were found in the squad car as well as in the Mercedes-Benz, right? Our crime lab did that, yes. And you've reviewed those? I have not. Okay. But <clears throat> similar to fentanyl and norfentanyl, you've got methamphetamines, which is the active ingredient, right? Yes. And amphetamines, which is the metabolite, right? In, 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 a, in a tablet, are you saying? No, in yeah. Mr. Floyd's blood sample. Yes, there was methamphetamine. I'm just, and just generally speaking, methamphetamine is the active drug, and amphetamine is the metabolite of that drug. It's a metabolite, but it's also active. Okay. So, um, meaning it's, what do you mean it's also active? I mean, it's an active metabolite. It, it, it also exerts effects. So, a person would have uh, an effect from both of those substances? Correct. Meaning an intoxicating effect? Not necessarily. But some effect. Some effect. Relevant to the DUI population, uh, Mr. Floyd's uh, amphetamine and methamphetamine ratio was on the low side, right? So we didn't look at the ratio of methamphetamine to uh, meth to amphetamine with Mr. Floyd because it was below the reporting limit. It, it's not on the report. We didn't report it. Okay. So you can't compare the ratio, but his methamphetamine level was on the low side. Compared to the DUI population, yes. And in comparison to the DUI population, as well as the post-mortem cases, uh, again, there may have been other drugs, as you say, on board, right? Yes. I have no further questions for now. Redirect. Dr. Eisenschmidt, you were asked some questions about your lab, NMS, and the testing that was performed in conjunction with accreditation standards. Do you remember those questions? Yes. You were asked by the medical examiner's office to perform the testing in this case, is that right? Correct. 
and NMS performed the testing that was requested, is that yes. right? And did NMS follow all the standard operating procedures when it came to that testing? We did. You didn't report anything in your final report that was below your reporting limit, correct? No. But you maintain that data in connection with your standard procedures, is that right? Yes, and the, the, result, the data shows what we found. And why do you do that? Excuse me? Why do you keep that data? Because we keep that in the normal course of business. And is it important to have a record of the testing you did and the things that you went through to achieve your results? Absolutely. You were also asked some questions about the methamphetamine level that Mr. Floyd had in his system. Um, you indicated that it was a low level, that 19 nanograms per milliliter, correct? Yes. And it was so low, in fact, that you wouldn't expect to feel an intoxicating effect from that level, would you? I would not. And in fact, so low that as part of your lab procedures, you'd want to rule out that it's not just a contaminant. That's how low it was, right? I wouldn't say that. I mean, it's, it's real, um, it's there, uh, and it was confirmed. And it was confirmed, part of that confirmation process was that the amphetamine at least supported that it was not just a contaminant, is that right? That's true. Um, but either way, Mr. Floyd's methamphetamine levels were lower than 94% of the driving under the influence population when it comes to methamphetamine. Is that yes. right? You were also asked some questions about the fentanyl levels in this case. Um, obviously, depending, as you described earlier, depending on an individual's tolerance, a level of 11 nanograms per milliliter could have a different effect on a different person, on different people, depending on their level of tolerance. Is that right? Yes. Um, and your, in your experience with respect to recent or acute method, or I'm sorry, fentanyl use, there are a number of cases where you would expect to see no norfentanyl, is that right? So yes, we do observe that in, in cases where we know something's acute, let's say with somebody that dies with a syringe in their arm or something like that. And if somebody dies with a syringe in their arm, you would expect there to be little to no norfentanyl, is that right? Correct. Why is that? Uh, because it's a very acute amount. It doesn't mean you could never find it because there could be previous fentanyl use, but that's just not our general observation in that kind of situation. And in that way, the ratio becomes important, is that right? Correct. And why is the ratio important? Because that basically documents how acute the fentanyl was relative to its being broken down to fentanyl, or fentanyl, excuse me. And so Mr. Floyd's ratio of 1.96, 11 nanograms per milliliter of fentanyl to 5.6 nanograms per milliliter of norfentanyl, supports that there was survival time after the ingestion of Fentanyl, is that right? Who's there? What does that ratio show you? It shows two things, that there was survival time from an earlier dose, or there could be an additional dose on top of previous doses. And again, the ratio is consistent and lower than the average ratio that you see for driving under the influence cases with fentanyl on board, is that right? Who's there? What does that show you compared to the driving population? It just delineates the difference between a population where, a postmortem population where fentanyl is more likely to be acute than in a driving population where it's more likely to be chronic. And in terms of the ratio, was Mr. Floyd's ratio more similar to the driving population where people were alive or more similar to the postmortem population where people were dead? It was more similar to the DUI population. Nothing further. How can you answer that question when we don't know the context of how people actually died? Because we still looked at a large number of data uh, within, within that population. So <clears throat> you have no frame of reference, though, in terms of what, is the, what did the person actually die from? I mean, if, what if... <laughs> What if of the 19,185 post-mortem cases, 19,184 of them were gunshots? I, that's not really a possibility, but I, I have nothing further. All right, thank you. Can you step down? Mr. Dreher, our next witness, uh, we are gonna try and fit in. I appreciate your patience and staying until 5.15 if possible because 
the witness has a flight out tonight, and so we're trying to finish it tonight. Mr. Blackwell. Thank you, Your Honor. The state will call Dr. William Smock. Testimony about to give will be the truth, and nothing about the truth. I do, sir. And if you could remove your mask. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. And let's start off with having you spell, uh, state and spell your full name. Dr. Bill Smock, B-I-L-L-S-M-O-C-K. May I proceed, Your Honor? You may. Good afternoon, Dr. Smock. Good afternoon, sir. Can we start with your telling us what is your area of specialization? I'm an emergency medicine physician with specialized training in forensic medicine. And would you please tell us what is forensic medicine? Yes, forensic medicine is legal medicine, taking medicine usually practiced by the forensic pathologist, but in my case, practiced on living patients and applying that to legal situations. Could you give us a brief overview of your uh, educational background in medicine? Yes, sir. Um, I obtained a master's degree in anatomy from the University of Louisville School of Medicine, entered medical school, graduated in 1990 from the University of Louisville, then completed a three-year residency in emergency medicine at the University of Louisville, then completed a one-year fellowship in clinical forensic medicine with the Kentucky Medical Examiner's Office. Have you uh, ever worked in an emergency uh, room in emergency medicine? Uh, yes, many times, many years. Uh, how many years, doctor? Uh, 21 years at the level one trauma center at the University of Louisville and then moonlighting in smaller ERs. And what is a level one trauma center? The level one trauma center is the American College of Surgeons criteria saying that this is the place you wanna go when you have major trauma gunshot wounds, car wreck, stab wounds, strokes, heart attacks. This is where we have physicians on duty in the ER 24-7 ready to take care of. Um, are there any level one trauma centers in Minnesota that you're aware of? Uh, there is one right here, sir, in yeah. Minneapolis. The Hennepin County Medical Center? It is, sir. Uh, do you also teach in the area of emergency medicine? Yes, sir, I do. Uh, what do you teach and where? I teach emergency medicine residents, medical students, paramedics, police officers, um, not only at the University of Louisville, at the Louisville Metro uh, Police Department Police Academy. I train the paramedics for the uh, Jefferson Town Emergency Medical Service. I also train uh, and teach all over the country in areas relating to strangulation, gunshot wounds, emergency medicine, forensic medicine. I was going to ask whether you had any special background or expertise in either asphyxial deaths or strangulation. In, in both, sir. Asphyxial death and um, so looking at asphyxia, meaning low levels of oxygen in the blood in people that have died as well as people that did not die. So you've, uh, you've published or edited several different books. I've edited uh, four textbooks. We won't read them, but I will show them and call them out. Um, one, domestic violence and non-fatal strangulation assessment. That is one, sir. And is this a teaching uh, book? It is. It's uh, designed to, it's a workbook where you work through case studies looking at the injuries, understanding the injuries, how the injuries occur or don't occur in non-fatal strangulation. Another one called Forensic Emergency Medicine. Uh, that is correct, sir. That is the uh, second edition of that book. And the third larger one, Forensic Medicine, Clinical and Pathological Aspects. That is correct, sir. And what is this text for? Uh, that is a text, again, looking at clinical forensic medicine, which is forensic medicine but applied to the patient that is still alive in most cases. Dr. Smock, have you also, uh, do you also have in your background any work as, uh, as, as 
an assistant medical examiner? Yes, I do. What is that, sir? Um, in Louisville, Kentucky, we started the program through the Kentucky Medical Examiner's Office of providing living forensic medicine consultations. That is providing the same level of evaluation on someone who may have been shot, stabbed, but didn't die in the emergency department in the ICU uh, compared to someone that uh, may have died, given that same level of care. And so that program was started at the Kentucky Medical Examiner's Office uh, back in 1990. And from 1991 through 1997, I was an assistant medical examiner at the Kentucky Medical Examiner's Office providing those sorts of evaluations and consultations. So you have a background also then in clinical forensic medicine? Yes, sir, I do. Would you tell the jury what that is? Yes. Clinical forensics is again, applying the same training that the forensic pathologist gets you know, from autopsies, the science, the medicine, but applying it to the patient that is in front of you that is still alive. And so what is the difference between someone who has sustained a gunshot wound that's dead versus someone who's sustained a gunshot wound that's alive? You know, what did that bullet hit? Did they survive? Did they get to the operating room in time? Uh, but the forensics is the same. How do you determine entrance from exit? How far was the gun away from the body when the person was shot? It's that same science, but applied to the living patient. Dr. Smock, how are you currently employed? I am the police surgeon for the Louisville Metro Police Department, as well as the medical director for the Training Institute for Strangulation Prevention. I'm also the medical director for the Jefferson Town Emergency Medical Service and a clinical professor of emergency medicine at the University of Louisville. Could you give the jury some sense of how large the Louisville Police Department is, maybe in comparison to the Minneapolis Police Department? The Louisville Metro Police Department, we have space for 1,200 sworn officers. We're down to probably a little less than 1,100 officers right now. Um, I think Minneapolis may have seven to 800. I'm not sure. I think we have a little larger department uh, than Minneapolis. So would it be fair to describe you as a police surgeon? Uh, that is my title, sir. That is my role. That's my job. And so what are your duties as a police surgeon? It varies from day to day. They're, they're multiple. It's the doctor that goes with the SWAT team when the team deploys to make sure that somebody gets hurt, suspect, hostage, officer, that there is a doctor there to take care of them. I advise the police chief on health care policy. I do occupational medicine, looking at the officers when they get hurt, uh, fitness for duty, when can, can they go back to work, uh, write some prescriptions, antibiotics, Viagra. Um, and most of the time is spent doing living forensic consultations, which means when a detective calls and says, Doc, we've had a shooting, or internal affairs calls and says we've had an officer-involved shooting, I would then go to the scene, to the hospital, wherever that examination is, needs to be done, and do the assessment head to toe, just like a pathologist would do on someone that is deceased, but doing it on someone that is still alive. Do you actually do police trainings? I do, sir. What, uh, what kind of training? I get uh, each recruit class, I get four hours of training uh, with each recruit that come, class that comes through. Two hours is spent on the forensic evaluation of gunshot wounds. Two hours is spent on strangulation, asphyxia, uh, elder abuse, and child abuse. Uh, have you treated persons with, uh, with cardiac emergencies? Uh, cardiac, oh yes, uh, pre-hospital and in the emergency department. What about dealing with patients who uh, struggle with either uh, methamphetamine or fentanyl addiction? Uh, very frequently, uh, either again, on the scene or in the emergency department. Are, fam are you familiar with the symptoms of um, overdose for either fentanyl or methamphetamine? Uh, very familiar, sir. Can you tell us what uh, Narcan is? Narcan is an, an agonist that will block the effects of an opioid on the receptors in the brain. Um, so if you overdose and you've taken too much narcotic and you are not breathing or you're close to going unconscious, if you give this Narcan, we give it intranasally, uh, then that reverses it, displaces the 
narcotic that's in the brain and you wake up. Um, Have you had to make decisions then about administering uh, Narcan for either a methamphetamine or fentanyl? Uh, you administer uh, Narcan for uh, fentanyl because it's uh, an opiate and that's what it reverses. And yes, I've administered Narcan hundreds of times. So one of the things I'd like to talk with you uh, about with respect to Mr. Floyd is drug tolerance. Uh, is the subject of opioid tolerance something you're familiar with? Uh, very familiar with, sir. Can, can you help us to understand the concept of drug tolerance? Tolerance is um, what does the body, the body repeatedly sees a certain drug. Uh, the most common we think about is, is alcohol. That does somebody build up a tolerance, meaning at one time you're a naive drinker, you take one sip, one bottle, whatever, you feel it. But if you are an alcoholic, you feel nothing because that is tolerance. And the same is true for amphetamines and as well as for opiates, uh, for fentanyl, and whether you're, you're talking about Percocet or other opiates, you build up a tolerance, which means it takes more of that drug for your brain to perceive the feeling, the high, whatever it is uh, that you get when you take that medication or drug. So somebody who doesn't drink might feel the effects of one beer. Absolutely. Whereas an alcoholic, it may take, who knows? Uh, it may take multiple beers. So, uh, doctor, just for the jury, when you talked, uh, when you made reference to a naive drinker, um, would you explain what you mean by that? Because yeah. naive means somebody that, that doesn't drink or doesn't do any sort of, of drug. Naive means you're totally new. So, doctor, you've been retained by uh, the state of Minnesota as an expert in this case. Yes, sir, I am. Are you being compensated for your time? Um, Yes, sir, I am, and uh, I hope so, otherwise my wife will uh, <laughs> be very unhappy with me. Could you uh, tell us then what your hourly rate is? Yes, the government rate is $300 per hour. And so the, uh, the charge for your time is the government rate? That is correct, sir. So as part of your uh, work in the case, were you asked to render an opinion regarding the cause of Mr. Floyd's death? Yes, sir, I was. Uh, before we uh, get into your opinions, would you tell us uh, what, what it is you reviewed uh, to give you a foundation for forming opinions? Oh, I reviewed uh, videotapes, um, body camera videos, bystander videos, uh, police videos, reviewed medical records, uh, pre-hospital records, uh, statements from uh, witnesses, the autopsy report, autopsy photographs, um, thousands of pages of, of documents, sir. Doctor, before we get to the opinion, there was one thing I meant to ask you and, and overlook. Uh, as a police surgeon, are you required to maintain board certification in emergency medicine? Uh, no, sir, I am not. Then are you currently board cert certified? No, I'm currently board eligible. And I've taken boards on two occasions, uh, but since I'm not in the emergency department anymore and it's not required for the police surgeon, I'm no longer board certified. What you have been in the past? Oh, yes, sir, on two occasions. All right. So, doctor, let's talk about uh, your opinions regarding the cause of Mr. Floyd's death. Yes, sir. You, you formulated uh, opinions. Yes, sir, I did. Would you tell us what your opinion or opinions are? Mr. Floyd died from positional asphyxia, which is a fancy way of saying he died because he had no oxygen left in his body. So what we've been referring to is low oxygen. Low oxygen uh, is one way, no oxygen. Uh, when the body is deprived of oxygen, and in this case from his chest, pressure on his chest and back, he gradually succumbed to lower and lower levels of oxygen until it was gone and he died. Did you uh, consider other possibilities as causes that you evaluated and dismissed as unlikely? Absolutely. Was one of those excited delirium? Yes, sir, it was. Would you first tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what excited delirium is? Excited delirium is a physical and psychiatric state where because of an imbalance in the brain, 
a patient will exhibit multiple symptoms. Um, basically, they are hot, their body is revved up, heart rate is up, respiration is up, superhuman strength, they are out of control, their speech is garbled, they, uh, it doesn't make sense, they can't answer questions. That's what they call the delirium, someone who is delirious. So I'm very familiar with uh, not only pre-hospital, but in the hospital, the symptoms of excited delirium. Doctor, let me show you uh, what's marked as Exhibit 921 for identification purposes. So I want to show it to you, and then let me ask you a couple of questions. Is this a, uh, a demonstrative you created showing the 10 signs of excited delirium? Uh, uh, yes, sir, it is. Actually, it's from the American College of Emergency Physicians uh, white paper on excited delirium. And incidentally, before we show this to the jury, or at least I offer it, uh, is excited delirium considered a controversial diagnosis? Uh, yes, sir, it is. Uh, why, why is that? It's because there are varying opinions as to what causes it, what is it. Uh, forensic pathologists or emergency physicians or other physicians, uh, there isn't 100% agreement on what excited delirium is. Um, but I can tell you, at least in my opinion, I think it is, it is real. But are there very reputable medical organizations that do not recognize it? That is correct. The American Medical Association doesn't recognize it. The uh, American Psychiatric Association doesn't recognize it. So, so Your Honor, I offer uh, Exhibit 921 for demonstrative purposes. Any objection? 921 is received for demonstrative purposes only. Members of the jury will not go back with you in deliberation. And, Your Honor, I uh, uh, happened by accident to uh, manage to scratch on the screen. So, <laughs> uh, if Your Honor could, uh, thank you. Uh, so, if we could uh, walk through uh, each of these, we'll go through them one by one. And I'd like for you, with each one, to explain what it is and then uh, explain how it applies to George Floyd. So l let's start with the number one, inappropriate clothing, uh, naked or partially clothed. Um, what is the significance of this one? How does it manifest? When we get a call of a naked man in the street, first thing I'm thinking is excited delirium. Why? Well, why does, would somebody take off their clothes? Well, their body is hot. So in the case of Mr. Floyd, was he appropriately dressed or inappropriately dressed for the weather? And in the case of Mr. Floyd, I think the temperature was in the 70s and he is appropriately dressed. Therefore, this does not apply to Mr. Floyd. So what about the second one? Attraction to glass, destruction of glass, mirrors, lights on vehicles. This is another uh, sign of that someone with excited delirium, they're attracted to glass, to lights, and mirrors. Sometimes they will kick, punch, try to break the glass, break the mirrors, because for some reason their brain says that is a threat to them. When you watch the video of Mr. Floyd in the, uh, the, sh the store, glass all around him. Was he attracted to any glass on the counter in the windows? No. So in Mr. Floyd's case, it doesn't apply either. So you eliminated the second one? Yes, sir, I did. What about the failure to respond to police presence? What does that mean? That means when an officer gives you a command to do something, you don't even hear it. You're going on. When we watch the video, of the officer asking Mr. Floyd to go to the uh, sidewalk, sit down. Does he comply? Absolutely, he complies. Does not apply to Mr. Floyd. Because you saw him being responsive to the police. He was responsive, answering appropriate questions, giving appropriate answers. Number four, constant or near constant physical activity. What does that mean? That means these individuals are sped up. 
their body is going 90 miles an hour. And in this case, what do we see um, Mr. Floyd do? He sits down. He's able to sit down. And he's not going 90 miles an hour. His activity level isn't constant. So you can cross that one off the list. You saw no evidence of it. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry, sir. I said you saw no evidence of it. I saw absolutely no evidence of that, sir. Number five, not tiring despite heavy exertion. This again, these people can run a marathon. If you have police officers chasing them, they're out running uh, the police. These people go and go and go. Why? Because they're sped up. Uh, in this case, did we see Mr. Floyd tire? Absolutely, we saw him tire. We saw him tire to the point where he stopped breathing. So does it apply in this case? No, it does not. Number six, unexpected or unusual strength. These people are described as having superhuman strength. They're throwing police officers off right and left. Somebody my size is throwing people off right and left. What do we see in this case? Is Mr. Floyd able to throw those police officers off that have him on the ground? No, he's not. So in this case, it does not apply. Uh, number seven, unaffected by pain. When we listen to the tapes, do we hear Mr. Floyd complain of pain? Absolutely we do. Pain in his neck, pain in his face, pain in his back. Um, he's complaining of pain. So does this apply to Mr. Floyd? Absolutely not. Um, if, if Mr. Floyd did not complain of pain, we could add it into the list. But in this case, he's complaining of pain from the time he gets on the ground. Does not apply. Number eight, very rapid breathing. These individuals will have a breathing rate 30 to 40 times a minute. <sighs> very rapid breathing. When I watched the videotape and counted uh, Mr. Floyd's respirations at different points, uh, it was at one point it was zero, but the other times it's you know, 15 to 20, 22, 23 in that range. By breathing criteria, he does not meet the excited delirium criteria. What about number nine, excessive heat or hot to touch? A couple ways to assess this. And did you see uh, evidence of excessive sweating? What did the emergency, uh, the ER docs describe when Mr. Floyd presented to the ER? He was cool to touch. When these patients come into the ER, their temperature, you touch them, they are hot. They could be 104, 105, 106, even 107 degrees uh, temperature. Mr. Floyd was cool to touch, does not apply. And then the excessive sweating, number 10. Again, because when your body gets hot, when your temperature goes up, what does your body want to do? It wants to sweat to cool you down. So when I watch the video, do I see evidence of sweating on Mr. Floyd? No, it's not there. So again, does not apply. So Dr. Smock, if we have to have a minimum of six of these items, six of 10 for excited delirium, how many did you see? Zip. <laughs> so I want to talk with you about uh, another potential cause for death that you may have considered, I think, eliminated, which is drug overdose. Yes, sir. Uh, are you familiar with the toxicology results in this case? Yes, sir, I am. Uh, just to remind us, what were the levels of uh, fentanyl and methamphetamine uh, in Mr. Floyd's uh, blood? And you can check your report or notes if you need yes, to. Yes, I've got the autopsy report here. The uh, fentanyl level was 11. The metabolite of fentanyl called norfentanyl was 5.6, and the methamphetamine level was 19. Those are all what's called nanograms per milliliter. That's just the measurement that the lab uses. Well, focusing on fentanyl, uh, you, you have lots of experience treating patients uh, suffering from opioid overdoses. Yes, sir, I do. Uh, can you explain what, what fentanyl intoxication looks like and how that might differ from fentanyl overdose. Yes. The fentanyl, uh, let's kind of work backwards. With fentanyl overdose, because it's a narcotic, in excessive amounts, it can kill you. 
because it will cause your respiratory rate to go to nothing. That's how you die with a narcotic overdose. You cease to breathe. With fentanyl toxicity, you're looking at somebody who is high, who is awake, but they're high. So there's a big difference. So how do you differentiate fentanyl intoxication versus fentanyl overdose? What is that patient doing right in front of your eyes? Look at them. Are they awake, alert, talking, breathing normally? Or are they getting sleepy? Their respiration's getting less, or are they not breathing at all? That's how you differentiate, just by looking, even without a lab report. Look at what that patient is doing. So in the, the case of a fentanyl overdose, are there certain uh, telltale signs of a fentanyl overdose? Yes, they are, um, peoples can be constricted and their snoring, their respirations are decreasing or they're not respiring at all. Now bringing this home to uh, George Floyd, uh, when uh, they came to the scene on May 25th, the paramedics, uh, do you recall whether his pupils were constricted or not? I believe they were dilated. Uh, do you know what the concept of air hunger is? Yes, sir, I do. Would you tell us what that is? Air hunger, the um, best application is um, you are wanting to breathe. For some reason, um, one example would be if you are drowning. You're going to do everything you can to get to the surface of the water because you want to breathe. Another application that I frequently deal with is someone who has been strangled. When their airway has been cut off and they can't breathe, their body is telling them to breathe but they can't because of the pressure on their airway, that is hunger. That is the human desire to, to live, to breathe. So when George Floyd is saying, please, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, is that an example of air hunger? That is an absolute example of air hunger. Would you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury whether fentanyl overdose causes air hunger? Uh, no, it does not. Um, the only time it could is if you've overdosed, and, but it's not air hunger because you are going to sleep. You're not hungry at all, you're sleeping. So there is a difference between air hunger, that, that drive to bring in that air versus an overdose. So with, with an overdose, if it's not air hunger that a fentanyl overdose causes, does fentanyl simply diminish the drive to breathe at all? Uh, in, in, by, at therapeutic levels, no. At an overdose level, yes, it can decrease the drive to breathe if you have too much. But you're not starving for air. You're not starving for air. Doctor, in the case of a, a fentanyl overdose, you talked about uh, a person going to sleep or snoring even. Uh, before death ensues from a fentanyl overdose, um, is a coma state reached? Yes, you, someone who uh, is asleep, you could say they look like they're in a coma state. They're not moving. So that's what you would see with an overdose. You, you've watched the, the various uh, videos uh, with uh, George Floyd's encounter with, with the police on May 25th. Multiple times. Can, can you tell the jury from having looked at those videos, can you tell by looking at that alone whether George Floyd was suffering from a fentanyl overdose? He is not. I mean, when you watch those videos and you, we go through them, what is his respiration? He's breathing. He's talking. He's not snoring. He is saying, you know, please, please get off of me. I want to breathe. I can't breathe. That is not a fentanyl overdose. That is somebody begging to breathe. And so if, uh, if a person cert, uh, is suffering from a fentanyl overdose, would you describe that person then as alert? No, sir. They are not going to be alert. They're going to be sleeping. Would you describe them as oriented? Uh, no, they're going to be, their brain is going to be in sleep mode or not breathing mode. And was George Floyd oriented? Oh, he was. He gave appropriate responses, name, date of birth. 
He knew where he was and what was happening. He knew exactly where he was, what he was doing, and responding appropriately to the questions that were asked of him. Uh, have you ever encountered a situation of a fentanyl overdose where a uh, person was in the overdose uh, displaying air hunger and uh, essentially crying out for their life or crying out in pain? No, sir. Uh, now, did you, from your review of the medical records and other data uh, in the case, get some sense of what Mr. Floyd's history uh, was with respect to opioid use? Yes, sir, I did. When you look at the medical record, Mr. Floyd has been a chronic user, uh, meaning what I saw was uh, for years. And, and how would this correlate to the notion of tolerance we talked about at first? The more you use any drug, alcohol, in this case fentanyl, you build up that tolerance. So it takes more drug to give you that high to affect your brain. Um, and in this case, we actually had a, a visit to the emergency department where he took seven or eight uh, narcotic pills. They watched him and let him go. Uh, was there any use of either oxycodone or uh, Percocet uh, that might be relevant to the discussion of tolerance? Yes, there was the, when he presented to the emergency department, he said he may have taken Percocet or uh, oxys, oxycodone. Um, so what does that have to do with tolerance to fentanyl? Uh, they both, both fentanyl and oxycontin, purpose, uh, Percocet, oxycodone, uh, work on the same receptors in the brain, the, what's called the mu receptor. So uh, they both attach to that and stimulate that receptor. So this is what we call cross tolerance. They, if they both work on the same receptor, either one is going to give you uh, an effect, depending on the quantity that the brain sees. In terms of the population of patients you've treated for opioid uh, issues, are you able to generally characterize what the range of the opioid levels um, has been in living patients? Yes, I have, sir. Uh, what can you tell us about that? Uh, uh, what I've come to in clinical practice is you don't rely on the level to tell you how much it's impacted a particular patient. You look at that patient. Because I've seen patients that could have a low level, but I can see patients with fentanyl levels 100, 120, 140, um, and they're walking and talking. So the level says, yes, it's there, but based upon their prior history of use, chronic use, does that particular level affect them or not? So how relevant then was the, the level of the methamphetamine found in Mr. Floyd's uh, blood to your analysis of the cause of death? Uh, methamphetamine or fentanyl? Uh, methamphetamine this methamphetamine. time. Um, with methamphetamine, it's really a, a nothing level. It's a level you expect to see with a recreational use of methamphetamine. And, and clinically, that's an extremely low level. So I want to switch to topics and talk about uh, the cause of death you did find related to asphyxia or low oxygen. Yes, sir. Are you familiar with certain myths uh, that uh, exist around uh, the indicators for death by asphyxia or low oxygen? Yes, sir, I am. Uh, do you, in fact, teach your students regarding some of these myths? Yes, the, because strangulation is a form of asphyxia. Um, this is part of every class I teach. What are the myths associated with strangulation, with asphyxia, what you see, what you don't see, and why you see something or why you don't see something? Uh, for, for example, in your teaching of your students, uh, what do you teach them regarding inferences that can be made by the presence or absence of bruising on the body in autopsy? Uh, mm -hmm. Bruising. You can be fatally strangled, die of asphyxia, and have no bruising. The presence or absence of a bruise on a human body is dependent upon multiple different variables. 
how much pressure is applied, how is that pressure is applied, how frequently is that pressure applied. And the an example that I like to use is you can have someone put your bicep and forearm on either side of your neck and squeeze, render you unconscious, even kill you, and you will never ever see a bruise on the neck. And the reason is you're applying a broad surface area, bicep and forearm, to a broad surface area, which is different if I were to take, say, this lanyard, put it around somebody's neck and pull tight, I'm putting same amount of pressure but in a smaller area. And I would expect to see a ligature mark or something. So it's, there are lots of variables that will dictate whether you have a bruise or you don't. Condition of health, if you have any medications that cause you to bruise easy, aspirin, other medications. So you can be, that's this myth that you can, you have to have bruises to prove strangulation. No, you don't. You can be faith strangled to death and have no bruises. So that's one of the big myths. Uh, Dr. Smart, can you tell us what a petechial hemorrhage is? Ah, yes, petechial hemorrhage. Petechial hemorrhages are ruptured capillaries. A little, when, when you see them on a patient, they're little red dots. And what petechial hemorrhages come from is rupture of the capillary bed. They're popped. And the way I like to think about a petechial hemorrhage is like it's a little water balloon. And what happens when I put too much water into a balloon? It pops. What happens if I put too much blood into a capillary? It pops. So what, uh, what does the presence or absence of petechial hemorrhages tell us about whether a person did or did not die of asphyxia or low oxygen? Uh, it tells us uh, nothing because in order to create that ruptured capillary, there are two physiologic things that have to occur in the human body. One, I have to have the venous return, in, in the case of the neck, the jugular vein blocked. And how does that happen? Well, I'm putting pressure on the neck. The second thing that has to happen is I have to have blood still being pumped into the area of the body, that capillary bed. So if both those two criteria aren't met, blockage of a vein with blood continuing to be pumped in, I will never ever get a petechial hemorrhage. So you, again, you can be fatally strangled and not have petechial hemorrhage because if those two physiologic criteria aren't met, it will never happen. So doctor, I wanna show you uh, a few of the video clips uh, as relates to your uh, conclusion that Mr. Floyd passed away uh, from asphyxia or low oxygen. So I want to play the clip and then tell me how it was significant to your decision making. Uh, so if we could uh, pull up uh, Exhibit 127, already in evidence, Brett, at uh, 2021. Yes, stopping at 2021, I'm sorry, Brett. Starting at the beginning. Right. You got your uh, 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 restraint. Okay, Tobbled. Okay. Okay, please. I'll grab that. Uh, 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 Jesus Christ. Okay, breathe. Okay, breathe. Thank you. Okay, breathe. Uh, Stop moving. Uh, Mama, mama, yeah, mama, 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 one of the front pouches, mama, on my right side bag, mama, mama, ah, 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 so is this the segment, uh, Dr. Smock, that you uh, listened to and observed? Yes, this is one of the segments. Why, why is this relevant to your assessment? 
Well, what's important to the assessment is what's happening over the entire length of the video. Um, in particular, this first section, what we're looking at is listen to Mr. Floyd's voice. He's speaking with full volume. And then I want you, as we go through these different segments, compare what we're hearing now to what we hear later, how his voice changes. So he, go ahead, no, please okay. finish your answer. Uh, I'm sorry. So um, I want you to also look at the positioning of the uh, Mr. Floyd, where is he? Where do we see pressure being applied to his neck, to his upper back, to his lower back? What's also very important is as this progresses, and you know, this, is, is, this is a progression over you know, four and a half, five minutes of Mr. Floyd gradually decreasing his ability to survive. And what you'll see, and, and this is a great, I don't know if I can, does this work, Circle? It, it does. Okay. Um, what I want you to also watch for is what is his right arm doing as this progresses. You will see him pushing against the tire. You'll see his right arm, his elbow, pushing against. What's that doing, Professor? Uh, well, I'd like to know, you circled an area here on, uh, on this exhibit. Ask what is it? Sorry, Joe. Go ahead and ask your question. Yes, I'd like to know what is it showing us? Why is that significant? This is very important because it's showing what Mr. Floyd is doing to try and breathe, to get his right side of his chest up off of the pavement so that he can bring in air. So let's look at another um, segment. Uh, Brett, if we can go to start at 2021. I can't breathe. Please leave my dick. I can't breathe shit. Uh -huh. Bro, get up, get in the car, man. I will. Get up, get in the car. I can't move. I've been the whole ah, get up, get in the car. Mama. Mama. I can't. Get up, get in the car. Is that the. My knee. You can't my neck. Breathe, I'm through. I know you're in the car. I'm through. Uh, I'm fucking moving. My stomach hurts. Uh -huh. My neck hurts. Uh-huh. Everything hurts. Ah, there's water or something. Please. Please. Ah, I can't breathe. Ah, hey, don't ah, talk to him. Kill me. They will kill me, man. Ah, Takes a heck of a lot of oxygen, though. Ah, Come on, man. Look at his nose. Oh. 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 I cannot breathe. I cannot breathe. Ah. 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 Ah, uh, 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 so, Dr. Smock, as you listen to that segment, that was one that you chose um, to uh, play for the jury. What was significant about that? What we're seeing again is, and if you're listening, his voice is now getting gradually weaker as we're going through this. He is telling the officers, I'm about to die. I am through. Um, he's watching his body move, turning his face actually into the pavement to try and get more oxygen in. This is the progression as we go step by step and deeper into lower levels of oxygen in Mr. Floyd's blood. We also have um, in using his elbow to try and 
leverage his chest up. So, uh, Doctor, in addition to the subdual and the restraint that we see there uh, on the street in the, the video, uh, was there other evidence, uh, including physical evidence, that supported your conclusion that Mr. Floyd uh, died of low oxygen or asphyxia? Um, yes, as I think it'll probably be in the next section as we go through, you will hear his voice get weaker and weaker. You will see his lose facial expression. Uh, you will hear him make uh, sounds of trying to breathe as we get closer. He then goes unconscious. You will then see in the next section he has what's called an anoxic seizure. That's a fancy word for his brain is going without oxygen very low, his legs shake, but you're also, you will actually see and you can hear the handcuff shake and you'll see the body camera shake uh, when he has an anoxic seizure uh, further on down the line. Were there uh, visible injuries uh, to him as well that you could see, Dr. Smock? Yes. the. His left shoulder was ground into the pavement from the pressure from behind. The left side of his face had deep abrasions from his face being pushed into the pavement. So in the uh, interest of time this afternoon, I won't show the additional video, uh, Dr. Smock, and, and I want to ask you about a different subject, and uh, that relates to uh, CPR. Uh, could you tell us uh, about uh, the importance of timing with respect to performing CPR. The sooner we start compressions and ventilations, uh, the higher, the more successful our resuscitation rates will be. At what point should CPR have been commenced with respect to Mr. Floyd? Way before it was, as soon as Mr. Floyd is unconscious, he should have been rolled over. Uh, we have documentation on the video that the officer says, I can't find a pulse. Why, well, that's clearly, but when you look at the video, it should have been started way before. Should have been rolled over, checked his respirations. But clearly when they can't find a pulse, CPR should have been started. Thank you, Dr. Smock. No further questions. Mr. Nelson. Good afternoon, Dr. Smock. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you for being here with us <clears throat> this evening. Uh, fair to say you're not a pathologist, correct? That is correct, sir. You are uh, not trained in anatomic pathology? Uh, no, it is part of my forensic training, but I'm not and don't consider myself an anatomic pathologist. And you're not trained in forensic pathology, correct? Uh, I was trained by forensic pathologist because that is part of my training. So yes, I am trained in forensic pathology as it applies to the living patient. And you're not board certified in forensic pathology? That is correct. You practice emergency medicine, right? That is correct, sir. And uh, that has, you have some experience and again, as you described, forensics for the living, right? That is correct, sir. Um, do you, in addition to your practice, stay abreast of the medical literature in terms of uh, forensic pathology? Uh, I do get uh, the Journal of Forensic Medicine, sir. Okay. And um, how many autopsies have you performed? Um, physically performed as what's called the Diener, I don't know, 100. Um, how many autopsies have I attended? Thousands. Okay. Um, you would agree that methamphetamine and fentanyl 
uh, when combined, it, it produces a different result. Uh, they may, depending upon the level and the individual. So there are variables, but essentially methamphetamine and fentanyl combined uh, is different than a reaction to fentanyl. That is correct, sir. All right. And um, you would agree that in emergency rooms uh, in, of late, the number of deaths related to the methamphetamine and fentanyl combination have increased? Um, I can't speak of at late, but it wouldn't surprise me, sir. All right. And um, that type of a death, methamphetamine and fentanyl, is a much different type of a death than a simple fentanyl, or not, not a simple fentanyl, but a fentanyl exclusive death. Uh, again, depending upon the level, yes, sir. The level and the individual person, right? That is correct, sir. There is no safe level of methamphetamine, right? Uh, no. Um, or there is a safe level of amphetamine, um, people with ADD. But in terms of street level, street purchased methamphetamine, there would be no uh, valid medical basis to have that in your system. Um, that is correct for methamphetamine. Now you talked a little bit about the coma state in fentanyl overdoses that you would expect. What's the duration you would expect to see of a fentanyl? A coma state in a fentanyl overdose? Uh, that's all going to depend upon how much fentanyl uh, is in that individual system. How quickly do we get um, Narcan uh, on board? Um, so multiple variables, sir. Lots of variables. Um, you talk about positional asphyxia and you've reviewed the autopsy. Did you see any medical autopsy or physical, excuse me, any physical evidence from the autopsy that can point to Mr. Floyd's airway being obstructed? Uh, no, sir, not in the autopsy. And um, while Mr. Floyd initially was on the ground, he was uh, talking, right? As he, he was, described. sir. And he, at points, raised his head, agreed? Uh, yes, sir. And he, for some period of time, was alert, correct? Yes, sir, he was. He was coherent, as you he described? Was, sir. And he was making sense? Yes, sir. What is the evidence found at autopsy of significant force that was used to keep him in the prone position? The evidence was not at autopsy. It is on the videotape, sir. Okay. You were talking about how Mr. Floyd maintained uh, or stated that he could not breathe while uh, in the prone position? That is correct, sir. He stated that before uh, ever being in the prone position as well, correct? That is correct, sir. Several times, correct? That is correct, sir. At that point, when he stated that he can't breathe and he's in the back seat of the car, there was no one on his back, right? That, that is correct, sir. And do you know whether at that point there's any evidence to suggest that there was a respiratory depressant such as fentanyl on, on board in his system? Uh, no, sir. Um, have you been advised, I mean, I know you prepared a report, but have you been advised uh, that um, partially ingested pills were located in the back seat of Squad 320 and they contained Mr. Floyd's DNA. Yes, sir, it was. And you were advised that uh, those pills were a methamphetamine and fentanyl combination. That is correct, sir. People who have their respiration suppressed as a result of fentanyl don't necessarily all the time die, right? That is correct, sir. We hopefully they don't die. Treating uh, people in the ER, you have treated people with cardiac diseases? Yes, sir, I have. And in terms of uh, your 
treatment of people with cardiac diseases, have you encountered people who have a combination of methamphetamine and fentanyl? Yes, sir, I am. And obviously every single person is unique, correct? Yes, sir. And you've experienced people who have cardiac disease, fentanyl, and methamphetamine who pass away? Um, yes, sir. Not necessarily from those, but maybe from something else. And, but sometimes it could just be from those, right? Um, would depend upon the case. Right. Uh, you treat people with COVID at the ER? Um, I don't, but I've treated police officers with COVID, sir. Okay. Um, you, are you aware that people who are uh, in the ICU with COVID are oftentimes held in the prone position? Yes, sir. And that actually assists them in their oxygenation, correct? That is correct, sir. And they don't necessarily suffer sudden death, right? That is correct, sir. Those people may not be moving around very much. If they're in the ICU, they are probably not moving around very much. Methamphetamine, um, certainly has an effect on the heart, right? Uh, it can, sir. I mean, one of this, you're aware that methamphetamine can be prescribed, correct? Um, amphetamine can be prescribed. Amphetamine can be prescribed. And one of the side effects of the prescription amphetamine is sudden heart arrhythmias, right? Uh, depending upon the level, that is certainly a, it's a rare side effect, but it's certainly possible, sir. You talked about um, the, the pressure that somebody may, uh, the, the lack of bruising, right, is explained by kind of the surface area of the pressure that's applied, right? That is one of the variables, sir. Right. That is correct. And a knee has a relatively small surface area compared to, say, the entirety of the arm, right? Right, you described? Um, uh, no, actually, if you think about the size of a knee on a neck, that's comparable, sir. Okay, and you uh, you would agree that um, in this particular case, when you met with or you met with prosecutors several times, right? Uh, yes, I have, sir. And um, you would agree that generally speaking, Mr. Chauvin did not block both carotid arteries, right? That is correct, sir. And he may not have even blocked one of the carotid arteries, right? Um, that's hard to know. Okay. Um, but it's, he could have blocked one of the, the arteries. And even if he had, there would be what's called collateral flow, correct? That is correct. So, and so the, the uh, person, it would be very difficult to render someone unconscious by blocking one of the carotid arteries. That is correct, sir. As long as they have that collateral flow, meaning blood will go up one of the other arteries in the neck. And, and generally speaking, um, in order to render someone unconscious uh, by blocking the carotid artery, you need to block both carotid arteries, right? That is correct, sir. And then when that happens, that happens very quickly, right? That is correct, sir. Less than 10 seconds. That is correct. You've reviewed the videos uh, many times. I have, sir. Uh, spent a lot of time kind of studying and analyzing the videos. Yes, sir. Um, how many hours would you estimate that you had uh, <clears throat> spent analyzing the videos? Uh, 10. Okay. And you were able to see uh, this incident from multiple different camera perspectives, right? That is correct, sir. If Mr. Chauvin's knee was uh, placed at the posterior base of the neck, right, that wouldn't have much effect on his diaphragm, would it? Uh, no, sir. You work with police officers quite regularly? Every day, sir. And you've, uh, I'm assuming you said you've gone to uh, SWAT, SWAT uh, tactical kind of places right? or, or to arrests? 
right? Yes, sir. And I assume that you have observed police officers use a prone handcuffing technique. Yes, sir. And I assume that you've observed police officers use a prone control okay, technique. Your Honor. Beyond the scope of uh, the witness's expertise, I think it's within its uh, scope of expertise, but it is beyond the scope of direct. So if you could ask non leading questions. Sure. So part of your uh, expertise and training with police officers. Uh, you train them in terms of how to properly you train people in terms of positional asphyxia? Yes, sir, I do. And how to avoid positional asphyxia from occurring? Yes, it's really not how to cause positional, but how does a police officer avoid causing positional asphyxia? And so based on your experience in training police officers and your experience accompanying police officers to various arrest locations, you have observed police officers use a prone handcuffing technique. Yes, I have for short periods of time, sir. And you've observed them place their knee in the posterior, the base of the neck, right? Uh, yes, again, for short periods of time, sir. And it obviously depends on every circumstance and situation, right? I don't understand your question, sir. I'll withdraw. Was there bruising on Mr. Floyd's back that you were aware of? And no, sir, there was not. Bruising in his neck? No, sir. Either uh, above the skin or below the skin? No, sir, there was not. There's unquestionable evidence that Mr. Floyd had cardiovascular disease, correct? That is correct, sir. You'd agree that uh, the pathologist who performed the autopsy found a 90% blockage of the right coronary artery? Yes, sir. In your uh, experience as an emergency room physician, you could refer someone to have a, a procedure to open that up, right? If they are exhibiting signs of a heart attack or cardiac ischemia, meaning they're not getting oxygen to that part of the heart. And that's called a stent? That is correct, sir. The purpose of that is, is to actually increase or improve the blood flow through the arteries, right? That is correct, sir. Because when you have a blocked vessel, uh, that can lead to a heart attack, right? If it is blocked, that is correct, sir. Right. Completely lead to, blocked. Uh, lead to a cardiac event, right? If it's completely blocked, that is correct, sir. And when it's not completely blocked, it forces the heart to work harder. Um, yes, sir. Oftentimes, people go through substantial risks of heart surgery to have that fixed, right? To have the, the a partial blockage fixed. That is correct, sir. You've reviewed all of his uh, previous medical records that were made available to you, Mr. Floyd's, that is? Yes, sir, I have. And um, high blood pressure from these hospital admissions was noted, correct? That, that is correct, sir. There's uh, no dispute that methamphetamine was in his system at the time of this incident? Uh, the time was at, yes, he had a very low level, sir. Methamphetamine increases the heart rate? Uh, it can, sir. So again, it increases the demand on the heart, right? Absolutely, can, sir. If you had, uh, well, I'll strike that. You were aware that Mr. Floyd had engaged in a struggle with police before he was placed in the prone position, right? Yes, sir, we did. That uh, type of physical exertion also puts a certain demand on the heart, right? Uh, it can, sir. You, when you observe that struggle, you could observe his vein pulsing? No, sir, I did not. Kind of that kind of physical exertion of struggling with a couple of police officers, would you say that that's similar to something like what's called a stress test, sort of putting the heart through that physical exertion? Uh, no, sir, that would not be comparable to a stress test. What is a stress test? A stress test is when you're put on a treadmill and you're hooked up to uh, monitors, and then the 
you go faster and faster and then the level of the treadmill can go up and up and up and up. So similarly, when you're struggling with uh, police officers, your heart rate's gonna go up and up and up and up, right? Uh, your heart rate, but again, that is not a stress test, sir. Understood. Okay. People have had uh, cardiac arrhythmias during struggles with police before? Yes, sir. What's the physiological mechanism of a person suffering a brain injury from hypoxia? When the brain levels of oxygen start going down, certain things will happen. Their level of consciousness will begin to decrease. When they get to the point where their oxygen level is very low, then they will have that anoxic seizure, as we saw with the shaking of the leg and the shaking of the um, the wrists and then as time goes by more brain cells die for every second the brain goes without oxygen low levels millions of neurons and cells will die so what happens when you get to that state you have brain damage and then if it's not uh, alleviate whatever the cause is then you die so again, brain damage can occur from low oxygen. That is correct, sir. When Mr. Floyd was speaking to the police officers, right, as he was in the prone position, do you see any evidence that his brain was injured at that point? Um, which part? Because he speaks in full sentences or full voice early but later on his speech is weaker and weaker until there's no speech. So which window are we talking about? At any point when he's speaking with uh, police officers, would there be brain damage at that point? Not while he's speaking, sir. Can people suffer brain injuries while they're conscious? Um, depending upon the mechanism, stroke, would be an example. Hit in the head would be another example. One question I wanted to ask you, you talked a little bit about um, tolerance, right, and how people can build a tolerance, particularly to opiates, relatively quick, quickly, right? No, I didn't say quickly. Okay. Well, people build a tolerance, right? Yes, sir. And you've defined, and you're not a toxicologist, correct? No, sir, I'm not. Okay. But you have some general familiarity based on your experience as an emergency room doctor, people who are tolerant to particular substances, right? That is correct. And when someone stops using a controlled substance for a period of time, that tolerance dissipates, agreed? And that is correct, sir. And with certain types of controlled substances, tolerance dissipates very quickly. Um, Specifically fat. Uh, I'm not familiar how quickly it decreases or, or increases. So <clears throat> a person's uh, tolerance is situational. Right? Based no. on, let me rephrase. Somebody who has is tolerant, that tolerance could be built up over an extended period of time. Agreed? That is correct, sir. Tolerance, once that stop, once a person stops using that controlled substance, their tolerance dissipates. That is correct. And over, over some period of some time. Some period of time, that is correct, sir. Could be days, could be weeks, could be months. Um, in my experience, it's going to be weeks to months, not days, sir. So if someone's not using a controlled substance for several months, or let's say two to three months, and then they, they're going to lose that tolerance, agreed? Uh, some part of it, they may, depending upon the substance, sir. And then if they start using again, right, they're going to start to build that tolerance up to some degree. 
That is correct, sir. And if they had a chronic use for a long period of time, they've decreased their tolerance to some degree. Once they start using again, they're not going to just instantly jump back up to the same tolerance level. Your Honor, I object to this question was made. Overruled on that ground. Yes, as the human, the tolerance is occurring in the brain. As you see different levels, that tolerance will change over time. Did you see any evidence in terms of his autopsy or medical records that he had any history of lung disease, Mr. Floyd, that is? Uh, I believe he had history of COVID. Okay. Um, other than COVID, any other, essentially he would have had healthy lungs by all. Yeah, I don't recall specifically any lung disease. But there was evidence of heart disease, right? That is correct, sir. When someone is experiencing, again, based in your experience, experiencing an arrhythmia, um, they would also experience that sensation of a shortness of breath? Uh, it depends on the nature of the arrhythmia. When someone is experiencing a heart attack, right, because their vessels are blocked and the stress on their heart is increased, would they describe that shortness of breath? You have an objection to that, relevance to George Floyd. Patients can complain of shortness of breath while they're having a heart attack. That is correct, sir. You heard the officers ask him if he were on controlled substances? Uh, I believe it was, are you on something? person at a greater risk for cardiorespiratory effects if they're under the influence of methamphetamine? Uh, it would depend upon the level, sir. How about a combination of methamphetamine and fentanyl? Again, it's going to depend upon the level, sir. Cardiac disease have any relation to methamphetamine use? chronic methamphetamine use? Uh, yes, sir. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Ms. Marco? Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Smock, you were asked quite a few questions about uh, heart disease and high blood pressure. Uh, I want to bring this home to Mr. Floyd, uh, and that is whether we're talking about blockage of the artery, high blood pressure, any of it. Um, was there any evidence that you saw that George Floyd had a heart attack? There was absolutely no evidence at autopsy anything that suggested that Mr. Floyd had a heart attack. And that's whether he had a clogged artery did he have a heart attack? That is correct. There's no evidence of a blood clot in any of the arteries. There's no evidence of hemorrhage from a uh, ruptured plaque. There's no evidence that Mr. Floyd had a heart attack. What about on the autopsy report? Was there any evidence that George Floyd had a heart attack? No, sir, there was not. You were asked questions about whether there was a lethal or fatal arrhythmia. Remember those? I remember those, sir. Uh, if somebody has a fatal arrhythmia that they die from, is that a sudden death? It is, sir. As in, I have the arrhythmia, and that's it? You have the arrhythmia, and then you're unconscious. Uh, did George Floyd have a sudden death that looked like an arrhythmia? No, sir. He had a gradual decreased levels of oxygen over the course of minutes. It wasn't sudden. It was gradual because of the pressure being applied to his back and neck. You, you were asked questions about uh, Mr. Floyd saying, I can't breathe when he was in the back of Squad 320. Remember that? Yes, sir. Did you hear, or, or in any of the videos you saw, Mr. Floyd saying, I'm getting choked? No, sir. 
Uh, did you see anything that suggested that in the, in the struggle in the back of the car that anybody had their hands on his neck or throat? Uh, not in the car. Mr. Chauvin did put his hands around his neck as he was getting him out of the car, but not in the car, sir. Right. Obviously, if, if there is someone getting choked, that's the reason they couldn't breathe. Yes, sir. Um, you were uh, asked questions about whether or not the subdual and restraint uh, Mr. Floyd on the ground was a stress test. Uh, can, can you think of from any stretch of the imagination, you could refer to being subdued and restrained on the ground for nine minutes and 29 seconds until your pulse, until the pulse was gone as a stress test. That uh, objection is argumentative is sustained. Next question. So was the subdual and the restraint on the ground a stress test? No, sir, it was not. Uh, you were asked about uh, whether or not uh, there was any evidence of airway obstruction on autopsy. Uh, was there any evidence of low oxygen on autopsy? Um, only his death, sir. Do you recall Mr. Nelson uh, asking you the question relating to when Mr. Floyd was on the ground, um, was he alert and making sense when he was on the ground? Remember that? Yes, sir, I do. If somebody is alert and making sense, how could they also be intoxicated? Um, that's a good question, sir. You can't. And finally, you were asked questions about uh, the combination of meth and fentanyl, and so whether they make somehow a different kind of a dangerous combination. Just to be clear with the jurors, did you see any evidence that Mr. Floyd died of a meth overdose? No, sir, he did not. Did you see any evidence that he died of a fentanyl overdose? No, sir, he did not. Did you see any evidence putting them together that he died from that kind of an overdose? No, sir, he did not. Thank you. No further questions. Mr. Mills, anything further? Did you observe any evidence that Mr. Floyd was choked from the front of his neck? No, sir. You would agree that fighting or struggling with police officers puts stress on the heart? Yes, sir, good. There was no other evidence of airway obstruction, correct? Um, other than the asphyxia event? Correct. Other than not being able to breathe, that was the airway obstruction. In terms of, you were asked on re redirect uh, about how could someone who is alert and making sense uh, be intoxicated, do you recall that? Yes, sir. Uh, people who are tolerant of a particular controlled substance show fewer signs, correct? Uh, of intoxication? That is correct, sir. So the more you, someone is used to taking a particular drug, the fewer signs of impairment they may exhibit. Agreed? That is correct, sir. And someone who gets arrested for a, a chronic alcoholic, hypothetically, who gets obstruct or gets arrested for driving under the influence, they may not exhibit the same physical symptoms or speech difficulties that a naive drinker may exhibit. Agreed? Given the same level of alcohol, that is correct, sir. I have no further questions. No further questions, John. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, you are excused. Have a good flight back. Thank you. Members of the jury, thank you for your patience and sticking this out. Uh, we'll start around 9.15 tomorrow if we can. Thank you. We're adjourned.